Your Honor and Kristen, whenever you're ready to go. Okay, I'll leave it to Kristen. Okay, just trying to start my video, <laughs> which it's not letting me do. I'm not sure why my video is not working. Okay, um, on the bottom screen where it says start video. It just has a red bar through it and won't. No, click, you it. click the arrow. Click the arrow up. Uh huh. And it should say. I just have the one camera. And it's clicked. Yep. Well, go ahead with your beautiful photo, Kristen. All right. Well, hello um, and welcome to the staff workshop for the petition for reconsideration we received on the water quality certification for the Yuba River Development Project. My name is Kristen Gangel, and I'm a senior environmental scientist specialist in the Division of Water Rights at the State Water Resources Control Board or State Water Board. With me today from the Division of Water Rights are Aaron Ragazzi, Anne Marie Orr, Parker Thaler, and Philip Meyer. Um, additionally, we have Stephanie Postal and Mariana Owie from the State Water Board's Office of Chief Counsel. Next slide. Today's presentation will begin with an overview of the main participants in the workshop and a brief discussion of the purpose of this workshop. Then I'll go over a few ground rules that we've established for participants and an overview of the agenda for today. Following this, I'll provide a brief overview of each condition we will be discussing here today. At the end of my presentation, each petitioner will have five minutes to introduce their group and then we will move into the petitioner presentations and discussions of the highlighted conditions. Next slide. We are joined today by several representatives from the State Water Board, as well as representatives from each of the three petitioners, which are the Yuba County Water Agency, or YCWA, also known as Yuba Water Agency, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, or CDFW, and a group of non-governmental organizations, including California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance, the South Yuba River Citizens League, Friends of the River, Trout Unlimited, and the Sierra Club Motherload Chapter, which I'll refer to as CISFA et al., or the NGOs. This workshop is being recorded and will be available on the California Environmental Protection Agency's website. We also have a court reporter present today and the transcript will be available for purchase via Kate Barr at California Reporting. Although we do have some breaks scheduled, we may be taking additional breaks as requested by the court reporter throughout the day. As stated in our August 13th, 2021 notice of this workshop, there may be a quorum of the board present today. However, no decision is being made. If you are a speaker and you find that you are having connectivity issues, please contact the email address listed in the public notice for this workshop which is wr401program at waterboards.ca.gov. Next slide, please. The purpose of today's workshop is to discuss key technical items raised in the petitions for reconsideration submitted by the petitioners in order to provide state water board staff with a greater understanding of each petitioner's concerns and views of specific specific conditions in the water quality certification or certification issued for the Yuba River Development Project or project on July 17, 2020. Prior to issuance of this certification, the entities here today and many others spent a significant amount of time coordinating and developing proposals to try to achieve consensus in many areas of the project's Federal Energy Regulatory Commission or FERC relicensing process. And that work is reflected in some of the conditions of the certification. On August 14, 2020, YCWA submitted a petition for reconsideration to the State Water Board, 
which it supplemented in January 2021. Additional petitions for reconsideration were received from CDFW and the NGOs on January 14, 2021. We note that there is ongoing litigation regarding the FERC decision regarding waiver of the project certification, but that will not be discussed here today. This is not a hearing. It is a staff level workshop that provides an opportunity to clarify petitions and exchange information to inform staff's understanding of the petitions given the prohibition on ex parte communications. Next slide. Now I'm gonna go over some ground rules for the workshop to ensure it runs smoothly. First, please be respectful of other presenters' view, points of view. Please also recognize and adhere to established timeframes as we have a very full schedule and want to ensure we have time to cover all of the topics on today's agenda. To that end, please note that the discussion time following presentations is for engaging in discussion, not to extend presentation time. As this is a virtual meeting, please ensure you are muted when you're not speaking to reduce, to reduce background noises. As we have a court reporter present today, prior to asking a question, please state your first and last name and organization. And along those lines, when asking a question, please identify to whom the question is directed. Please also be sure to speak slowly and clearly. Next slide, please. We will begin with a staff presentation with a high level overview of the conditions that will be discussed today, but not specific concerns raised in petitions. Following this staff presentation, the petitioners will shortly introduce themselves. Then we will discuss each topic listed in the agenda condition by condition. Each petitioner who has chosen to discuss the topic will give a presentation and following these presentations, we have allotted time for petitioners and state water board staff to discuss the topic. There will be a short public comment period near the end of the day. If you wish to make a comment, please fill out the form linked on the notice for today's workshop now in order to receive the details for making a comment. Please note, we will work hard to stay on schedule, but all listed times are approximate. Next slide, please. Since 2008, flows in the project area have been governed by the Yuba Accord and revised water right decision 1644 and corrected water right order number 2008-0014. The Yuba Accord is a set of agreements designed to address the interests of various entities relying on water in the Yuba River. Condition 1A of the certification stipulates flows in the project area by reach. The flows required in condition 1A are almost YCW, almost entirely YCWA's agreed to flows, with the exception of modifications requiring consistency with YCWA's water rights, as described in revised decision 1644, and correct a water right order number 2008-0014, and FERC staff recommendations for flows below New Bullard Spar Reservoir from June through September, and also in the Lower Yuba River from June through August. During relicensing, YCWA and most relicensing participants reached agreement on minimum in-stream flows for the Middle Yuba River below Our House Diversion Dam and Oregon Creek below Log Cabin Diversion Dam. Next slide. Condition 1D is written to provide for the voluntary agreement process as part of the Sacramento Delta update to the Bay Delta plan. If a voluntary agreement is not entered into, Condition 1D also requires consultation after 10 years of implementing the flows of Condition 1A to address any operational changes that may be necessary. This term permits YCWA to move forward with its flow, proposed flow regime as modified by the FERC staff recommendation and to gather data to determine whether the flows will adequately comply with water quality requirements over the long term, and to work on voluntary agreements that support the Sacramento Delta to the Bay Delta plan. Next slide, please. Condition six prescribes closures at Loman Ridge Tunnel at certain times of the year to minimize the potential for fish entrainment into this tunnel. YCWA proposed some tunnel closures during specific water year types. However, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service 
and CDFW recommended additional tunnel closures for important periods of rainbow trout migration and to reduce the potential for fish to be entrained. Condition six requires the recommendations of the US Fish and Wildlife Service and CDFW. Next slide, please. Currently, YCWA does not use the upper intake at New Colgate Power Tunnel, owing to a 1993 recommendation from CDFW to only use the coldest water in New Bullard's Bar Reservoir, which is accessed via the lower intake. However, since then, both the US Fish and Wildlife Service and CDFW have recommended that YCWA operate both the upper and lower intakes to provide the best foreseeable temperature regime below New Bullard's Bar Reservoir. To this end, condition seven requires the use of the upper intake at New Colgate Powerhouse in the spring for water temperature management. This condition is designed to help manage water temperatures. Condition seven requires the recommendations of the US Fish and Wildlife Service and CDF CDFW. Next slide. Conditions eight and nine require management of large woody material or LWM and sediment at certain project locations to improve, to help improve the water, the quality and complexity of salmon rearing habitat in those areas. These conditions largely incorporate YCWA proposed measures to manage large woody material or sediment. Large woody material contributes to productive aquatic ecosystems and is an important component of stream channel maintenance and the formation of complex aquatic habitat. Presently, large woody material is impounded in the project's reservoirs. For this reason, large woody material is largely absent downstream of the project reservoirs. Sediment is critical to the function of river ecosystems as it provides habitat for spawning fish, benthic macroinvertebrate production, and frog reproduction. Sediment deposition during gradual flow reductions can form side channel bars that provide habitat that's necessary for fish, amphibians, and benthic macroinvertebrates. Sediment is also managed through a separate water quality certification for the project, which was issued in April 2020. Finally, YCWA's proposed measure for large woody material includes the potential to burn large woody material on a barge in New Bullard's Bar Reservoir. If YCWA plans to do this, Condition 9 also requires that YCWA first submit proposed modifications to protect water quality for Deputy Director review and approval. Next slide, please. Condition 12 requires YCWA to develop a restoration plan for the Lower Yuba River. Part of this requirement is to develop performance metrics to assess the restoration and enhancement actions YCWA will implement. The intention of this condition is to have YCWA consult with staff from CDFW, US Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Marine Fisheries Service, or NIMPS, and state water board staff to develop appropriate restoration proposals to enhance juvenile salmon habitat in the lower Yuba River. Restoration activities such as lowering floodplains, planting riparian vegetation, large woody material management, and or gravel augmentation have the potential to improve the quantity, quality, and complexity of salmon rearing habitat in the lower Yuba River. Riparian vegetation constitute an important resource that can provide cover for juvenile salmon and support invertebrate prey for salmon. Along with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, NIMPS, and CDFW, FERC staff also recommended YCWA develop and implement restoration actions. Next slide. Englebright Dam is the upstream limit of salmon migration on the Yuba River. Though Englebright Dam is owned by the United States Army Corps of Engineers, YCWA's project operations rely on Englebright to support hydropower production and base flow operations at project facilities. Project operations directly alter the operation of Englebright Dam by reducing the duration and magnitude of spills from Englebright Dam and by controlling flows in the lower Yuba River. As such, under current conditions, 
the project directly lists impacts listed salmon through its historic and proposed future operations. Condition 20 requires YCWA to develop a report that includes a proposal regarding fish introduction to reduce YCW, YCWA project related effects to listed salmon. Condition 20 also requires YCWA to consult with NIMS, the United States Forest Service, CDFW, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and State Water Board staff regarding fish passage above Englebright Dam and or around New Bullard Spar Reservoir. Although a lot of work has already happened regarding fish passage and alternatives have been explored, Condition 20 seeks to ensure that YCWA is a part of the conversation and continues to assess feasible fish passage alternatives. Next slide, please. So next up, each petitioner will have five minutes to introduce their presenters here today, and then we will begin presentations from each petitioner on each condition. Following these presentations, we have allotted some time for petitioners and state water board staff to discuss and ask questions about the information presented today. At the end of the day, after we have discussed each condition, there's a short allotment of time for members of the public to make comments. After this workshop, State Water Board staff will consider the record, including what is discussed here today, evaluate the petitions for reconsideration, and bring any recommendations before the board. We thank the petitioners for their time and willingness to provide information on and clarifications of, spe of specific items raised in their petitions. We look forward to today's information sharing. So now I'm going to turn it over to YCWA to introduce themselves. Willie, you're muted still. Are you going to take the lead on introducing folks? Um, I gave co host rights to Steven since he's first on the presentation. I think Willie, Willie Willowson should be the, the general okay. manager for Washington. I Enjoy. will Can go you ahead and thank you. Not a problem. Okay, Willie, I've given you permission. Excellent. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Well, good morning. I'm Willie Whittlesey, General Manager of Yuba Water Agency. Yuba Water is participating in today's workshop to provide technical input on various elements of the petitions to the 401 certification issued by State Board staff in July of 2020. And before we get into technical details, I want to explain to you just how important the issues presented by the certification are to the future of Yuba County its people, and the disadvantaged communities in which the majority of our people live. First, if implemented, this certification could have significant and direct impacts on those communities. It could have severe impacts on agricultural water supplies, undermining a significant driver of economic activity in the small, predominantly rural and disadvantaged communities we serve. The certification could shift demands to a historically overdrafted groundwater basin that our communities rely on as their primary source of drinking water. This would compromise Yuba Water Agency's work over the last several decades to ensure sustainable conditions in the basin, work that continues in our role as Yuba County's groundwater sustainability agency. By shifting water releases to the spring, the certification would significantly reduce Yuba Water's ability to generate peaking power during high demand summer months. That would cause multiple issues. It would severely limit Yuba Water's ability to dispatch zero carbon energy during California's heat emergencies to support the reliability of the state's grid. It would severely limit the availability of our energy capacity to integrate variable wind and solar energy resources into the grid and support California's response to climate change. And it would have severe impacts on the value of Yuba Water's hydroelectric generation reducing by millions of dollars per year, a primary source of revenue that is used to fund much needed flood risk reduction and resiliency measures, as well as other projects consistent with Yuba Water's mission and responsibilities. 
Finally, the certification could reduce Yuba Water's capacity to plan for and respond to drought conditions. The bottom line is the certification could have very real and very direct impacts on Yuba County and the communities we serve. Second, we have significant concerns about the certification and reconsideration process. State board staff issued the certification as final without a pending application from Yuba Water. Yuba Water was not contacted to discuss the development of the certification's provisions. Its development was not transparent and there was no opportunity to work together to identify the issues and develop appropriate mitigation measures. The reconsideration process exists so that state board members themselves can reconsider the staff certification, but we're told that we can't talk to the state board members. Also, this workshop was announced by state board staff in May. Along with other petitioners, we asked for clarity on the workshop process and an agenda soon after it was announced. Given the importance and highly technical subjects, we and our experts have spent significant time preparing with limited guidance. On August 27th, three weeks before the workshop, we, re we received three pages of detailed questions from state board staff to address in our presentations today. Some of those questions were legal and not technical in nature. And on September 7th, we received the final workshop agenda. We have just a few minutes to discuss issues that could change Yuba County's future for the next several decades. The lack of transparency in issuing the certification and lack of clarity surrounding this workshop's format and purpose have real costs. Yuba Water has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars in response to the certification and other parties are also incurring significant costs. These decisions are too important for Yuba County's future for the process to be vague and not transparent. Moving forward, we believe the board should withdraw the 2020 certification. We respect the board's right to appeal FERC's order finding waiver of the board's certification authority. And if the court determines that Yuba Water needs a certification, then we'll file an application. In the meantime, withdrawal of the certification would not compromise the board's litigation position regarding the waiver determination but it would allow Yuba Water to dismiss its federal and state lawsuits challenging the certification. At Yuba Water Agency, we recognize our place in the Yuba River watershed and the need for the river to serve many competing uses. In other set settings and through other processes, Yuba Water has demonstrated our interest and willingness to engage in the development and implementation of constructive, collaborative efforts to protect the Yuba River watershed and its ecosystems. We're proud of our agency's record as both a leader and collaborative partner across a wide variety of water and resource management issues, including the Yuba River Accord, groundwater management, forest restoration, fish habitat enhancement, and our work to generate flexible, carbon-free energy supplies to support the state's needs. These are all- Well, you're at five minutes, just so you know. So we gotta move on to the next ones quickly. I got five more lines. Okay. These are all critical issues facing our state today. Transparency, inclusiveness, and collaboration have been key to making forward progress on each of them. And unfortunately, the certification undermines our ability to continue that work, as well as Yuba Water's overall mission to benefit the people of Yuba County. As previously mentioned, three weeks ago, we received three pages of detailed written questions from staff. We submitted written responses to each of those questions, and today our technical team is prepared to address each question. I thank you for the opportunity to offer these remarks and we look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Willie. I think next up we have CDFW, five minutes. And whoever's gonna speak for CDFW, you can please raise your hand. I agree. Janine, I'll let you know when you're unmuted.
Hey, Bri, I see that Janine's trying to speak, so she might be she might have unmuted you. Can you check to see if you're unmuted? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Yep. Excellent, thank you. Um, good morning, board members and board staff. My name is Brianna CP, and I'm Water Program Supervisor for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife's North Central Region. We're here because in January, we petitioned the board for modifications to the Yuba River Development Project Water Quality Certification. Our petition was consistent with our agency mission to manage fish and wildlife and the habitats on which they depend, and it was consistent with our FERC 10J recommendations designed to balance project operations with improved protections for fish and wildlife beneficial uses. We stand by these recommendations and hope to answer board staff questions with our presentation today. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, and then I'll just run through the names of staff who will be presenting so that they're familiar when they pop up. So besides myself, we have Beth Lawson, our senior hydraulic engineer presenting, as well as Sean Hubler, um, our fisheries environmental scientist. And we have two external presenters contributing today um, John McMillan, the Science Director um, and Wild Steelhead Initiative for Trout Unlimited, and Stephanie Millsap, oh, the Watershed Planning Division Manager for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So thank you again for the opportunity, and that's it from us. Thank you very much. And who's okay. going to be presenting from the NGOs? If you could raise your hand. Good morning. I'm Chris Schutz with the California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance. Our understanding of these introductions was not to review or repeat our legal or talking legal arguments or talking points, but simply to introduce the participants in today's workshop. I will now introduce the presenters from the CSPA at all petitioners. Aaron Zettler Mann is the Watershed Sciences Director at the Yuba River, South Yuba River Citizens League or CIRCLE. He has a PhD in geography from the University of Oregon with an emphasis in fluvial geomorphology. He is also uh, a longtime rafting guide in the Sierras and he has been with CIRCLE since 19, uh, 2020, excuse me. Dr. Zettler Mann will present today on Water Quality Certification 12, Habitat Restoration. Melinda Booth is the Executive Director of CIRCLE. She has held that position since 2017 prior to which she spent six years as director of Circles Wild and Scenic Film Festival. She has an MS in environmental science from the University of Montana. Ms. Booth will be one of the co-presenters today on water quality certification condition 20 fish passage. Ashley Overhouse is the Resilient Rivers Director at Friends of the River. Ms. Overhouse has a JD from UC Hastings College of the Law and an LLM in environmental law from the University of London. Ms. Overhouse has been with Friends of the River since 20, uh, May of 2021. Prior to joining FOR, she was the, uh, the policy director at Circle for just under three years. Ms. Overhouse was recently chosen as the California chair of the Hydropower Reform Coalition. Ms. Overhouse will be the second presenter of today on water quality certification condition 20. Finally, I'm Chris Schutz, Bird Projects Director and Water Rights Advocate for the California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance, or CSPA, or CSPA. I've held that position for the last 15 years. I have a BA in German from the University of California at Berkeley. I gained my experience with hydrologic modeling and its uses in 20 years of hands-on work in 15 FERC licensing proceedings, associated water quality certification proceedings, and state board proceedings such as the update of the Bay Delta Plan and the California Water Fix. I have a granular working knowledge of the natural and developed hydrology of most Central Valley rivers from Merced to McLeod, including Delta operations. 
I will be presenting today on water quality condition certification condition one flows. I am the only person on the CSPA at all team presenting today who has been involved in the YRDP project relicensing since its beginning in late 2010. I'd briefly like to acknowledge some of the other members of the Foothills Water Network Coalition of non-governmental organizations who contributed to the technical record that NGOs developed in this proceeding and which in part are reflected in the exhibits we submitted with our petition. These include biologist Gary Reedy, former Circle Science Director, now semi-retired and doing independent consulting. Biologist Rachel Hutchinson, uh, former Circle Science Director, now with the US Forest Service. Bob Center, formerly with uh, American Whitewater and Friends of the River, an engineer, kayaker, and self-taught hydrologist, now retired. Aquatic ecologist, Dr. Natalie Stoffer Olson, staff scientist with Trout Unlimited, currently on maternity leave. An American whitewater advocate and former high school economics teacher, Dave Steinberg. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the Sierra Club's Alan Everhart, who worked for Yuba issues for over 20 years, on Yuba issues for over 20 years, prior to his death last year. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. I think now we can move into our discussion of the presentations of condition one, which will start with YCWA's presentation regarding petition one, or sorry, condition one. Courtney, can you bring up the presentation again, please? Yes, yeah, just taking a minute, one second. And whoever wants to take the lead on this, Steve. It looks like you're unmuted. Are you good to go? Yep, I'm ready to go. Okay. There we go. Well, thank you for the opportunity to present today. My name is Stephen Grinnell. I'm an engineering consultant for Yuba County Water Agency. Uh, the primary presenters for condition one are uh, myself, Paul Bradovich. And Terry Daly. If there are questions, the full list of presenters submitted to the state board are available to answer questions. Next slide, please. So, um, several staff questions focused on what flow requirements were modeled for condition one and specifically condition 1D and the details on how they were modeled. The purpose of projected uh, uh, condition 1D scenario is to show what flows not only might be ordered under the water quality certs delegated authority to the executive director, but what flows YCWA believes would likely be ordered based on the statements in the water quality cert, and then to determine resulting flow and temperatures in the lower Yuba River, as well as other effects from operations to these potentially required flows. Next slide, please. To model condition 1D, we combine three main criteria for flows on the lower Yuba River. The existing Yuba Accord flow requirements that were ordered uh, in 2008 by the State Board, the flows recommended by CDFW and its 10J recommendation to FERC, and which are referenced in the Water Quality Cert rationale, and a Bay Delta plan update unimpaired flow requirement based on the description of the default implementation from the 2018 staff uh, State Board staff framework for the Sacramento River. It's a year round um, uh, model requirement as indicated in the phase two scientific basis report. We selected this combination because the water quality cert states that additional flows such as those proposed in the CDFW and its 10J recommendations may be needed to improve habitat conditions on the Lower Yuba River. And the water quality cert also states the 1D consultation and evaluation will examine whether the required flows meet the requirements of the Bay Delta plan. And condition 31 requires operation of the project consistent with requirements of the Bay Delta plan. The 55% requirement used in the modeling is consistent with the recent direction from state board staff responding to YCWA's request uh, related to FERC's AIR request. So the greater of these three uh, flow requirements govern at any one time, this slide uh, graphic uh, in the um, orange and blue bars 
um, show the total height of the bars, uh, the governing springtime CDFW 10J flow rate, and the orange portion of those bars is the amount of additional flow that those flows would require above a 55% of unimpaired uh, requirement for the years and periods where the 10J flows are greater than the YCWA proposal. In essence, the CDFW 10J uh, uh, additional springtime flows uh, are sometimes quite a bit higher than 55% in the springtime. Next uh, slide, please. Um, Paul Bradovich. Paul will be providing the next uh, couple of slides. Is, is Paul uh, able to be unmuted? He should be okay to speak now. Paul? Okay. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. I'm, I'm Paul Bradovich, fisheries biologist for Yuba Water Agency. And in today's presentation, we answer the state board staff questions regarding habitat. Um, and we also refer that back to the rationale in the water quality certification itself. Steve mentioned that there are indications that uh, the flow proposal by Yuba Water Agency may not adequately pro provide for uh, holding temperatures for spring run Chinook salmon in schedule six years. Juvenile habitat, and we'll get into that, floodplain inundation, and spill reductions. Um, we'll address each of these. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, this slide represents a probability exceedance distribution analyses. We used many uh, probability exceedance analyses in our evaluations. In these analyses, the x-axis represents probability or percent of time uh, that specific values occur represented on the, on the y-axis. In this case, water temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. The blue line represents the FEIS base and the red line represents condition 1B for the June through August over summer adult spring run holding period. Each line represents modeled average daily water temperatures. The June through August holding period is 92 days and over 48 years, each line is comprised of over 4,400 average daily water temperatures ranked from highest to lowest. This cumulative distribution allows a uh, comparison of scenarios over the entire range of the distribution of values. It also allows evaluation of the probability of exceeding biologically meaningful thresholds, such as upper optimal and upper tolerable water temperature values. These values were developed by the Yuba Salmon Farm Technical Working Group and were used to evaluate the thermal suitability for reintroduction of spring run in various reaches of the watershed, including the lower Yuba River. Upper optimal was defined as the upper boundary below which water temperature does not impair physiological or behavioral functions. And upper tolerable was defined as the highest temperature in which fish can survive indefinitely, but growth and reproduction success are below optimal. Uh, that being said, uh, I'd like to review this figure. It can clearly be seen through this exceedance probability distribution analyses that the projected 1D scenario provides much warmer water temperatures than the FDIS base scenario and exceeds the water temperature index values with substantially more often than does the FEIS base. It also demonstrates that the FEIS base does provide adequate holding temperatures for spring run Chinook salmon, which is contrary to the premise in the water quality certification. The only exception to exceeding upper tolerable was the single driest, uh, well, and warmest, year 1977. Next slide, please.
this slide is addressing the, uh, the assertion in the water quality certification, uh, the speculation, I should say, that uh, inadequate salmonid habitat may trigger earlier premature outmigration of juvenile salmonids. Ten years of rotary screw trapping data are available in the lower Yuba River uh, from 1999 through 2008. And the figure on the top right demonstrates the results of the timing, the cumulative distributions of the outmigration of juvenile Chinook from the lower Yuba River. The gray line on the left represents pre-accord years and the black line represents accord years. What this shows us is that rather than triggering early out migration or premature out migration, in fact, implementation of the accord is associated with up to a month later out migration from the lower Yuba River than prior to implementation of the accord. The figure on the bottom right is a comparison of out migration timing with Butte Creek for years of, of the same data. This is one year selected which is demonstrative of the similarity of the relationships. Those sigmoidal shaped curves, again, are the cumulative timing out migration distribution functions. And as can be seen, they're really pretty quite similar. The dots are the size of individuals, the average size of individuals occurring on those specific dates, um, indicating that this is neither premature or early. We chose to show Butte Creek here because the last National Marine Fisheries Service status review was in 2016, in which NIMPS suggested that the Butte Creek population was the independent and viable population and at low extinction risk with all viability metrics tending in a positive direction. If that is the case, then you know, Lower Yuba River uh, compares quite favorably regarding the water quality certification uh, speculation that there may be, be premature or early out migration from the Lower Yuba River. Next slide, please. Well, back to me. Um, uh, for the third water quality cert listed inadequacy, uh, CDFW and the water quality cert point to inadequate floodplain inundation. So first we should utilize some consistent terminology here. Um, as defined by Pasternak's 2012 landform report, which is the reference report in the Fish and Wildlife Service inundation analysis used by CDFW and its recommendation of FERC, the floodplain encompasses areas that are inundated that flows above 5,000 CFS. So therefore, the CDFW 10J high spring flow requirement of 3,500 CFS in Schedule 1 years and 2,500 CFS in Schedule 2 years do not inundate the floodplain. Uh, in fact, these flows drain storage in New Bolts Bar compared to the YCWA proposal, and therefore reduce spills in New Bolts Bar in some years. That results in less inundation of the classic floodplain. Uh, next slide, please. So now we have to kind of shift over here and look at the Fish and Wildlife Service definition for the analysis that was done uh, for uh, floodplain inundation as a support to CDFW's 10J recommendations. Uh, to examine the method used by Fish and Wildlife Service to define habitat and examine inundation from flow scenarios, we're gonna to have to change labels. The Fish and Wildlife Service report used the term ecologically relevant areas. The focus of the Fish and Wildlife Service report that is used to support the 10J recommendations for Lower Yuba River was on a defined area of the, of the Yuba River labeled ecologically relevant areas, which are areas inundated at flows of either, of, above either 800 CFS or 1300 CFS, depending upon the reach of the river. So the figure here shows the exceedance probability of inundation measured as acres of area inundated uh, for an X number of days. So an acre day metric, that's what's used in the um, Fish and Wildlife Service report for the ecologically relevant areas being inundated. The YCWA proposal modeling results are in orange in the line. It's actually labeled AFLA AR3, that's the YCWA flows from the um, from FERC licensing. And uh, the CDFW 10J flow recommendations, and these are 10J flow recommendations without a 55% uh, 
um, requirement, just looking at the, the effects of the 10J flow recommendations, those are in blue. Um, as you can see, overall, these results are similar, even though the, the 10J flow recommendations in Schedule 1 and Schedule, schedule 2 years are much higher in the springtime uh, than the YCWA proposal. These results are further supported by the report itself, the Fish and Wildlife Service report at Table 5, which show in that report, which shows the median inundation in acre days for the targeted flow years that are Schedule 1 and 2, the increase in inundation with the CFW proposed flows is a less than 2% increase in acre days for those year types. Next slide, please. Uh, the last uh, inadequacy of spill reductions, uh, or th the fourth one, um, identified as a potential inad inadequacy and potentially requiring additional modification to the YCW proposal spill reduction. This one is a bit confusing since generally all the parties agreed and, and FERC put in its um, uh, staff alternative, um, pretty much identical flow uh, spill reduction rates. The only exception was the time frame uh, for applying those rates. YCWA proposed April to July 15th, while the relicensing participants proposed April through September and FERC in its wisdom in the FEIS uh, preferred alternative has April to July 15th as a requirement and July 15th to September 30th as targets, essentially satisfying the relicensing participants and including the state board's uh, supported uh, proposal for flow reduction. Next slide, please. Go back to Paul. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Um, on this slide, you can see on the left side that we've already talked about the elevated water temperatures associated with over summer adult holding with implementation of projected 1D scenario. I need to point out that also pertains to juvenile rearing. Spring run Chinook salmon and steelhead over summer in the river, and they are also subject to these same increases in water temperatures and or adequacy of the water temperature regimes provided by the FEIS base. On the right is the representation, again, of an exceedance distribution of water temperatures during the spring run Chinook salmon spawning period, defined as September through mid-October. What can be seen from this uh, figure and these exceedance distributions is that there would be redirected impacts with implementation of condition 1D resulting in elevated water temperatures with substantial increases in the amounts of exceedance of the upper optimal as well as the upper tolerable water temperature conditions in the lower Yuba River. And Steve, I'll turn it back to you. The next slide, please. Um, so impacts to YCW operations. Uh, so very briefly, and, and this is not to minimize, this is one of the uh, largest concerns of the um, the water quality so for Yuba, uh, the, the very large increases that could occur in required flows between the 10J recommendations and a 55% unprepared requirement are large and frequent water supply shortages. Um, in fact, shortages about 40% of the demand in one third driest years. So in the Sacramento Valley, the assumption is that if there are surface water shortages, those are replaced with groundwater pumping. However, the sequence of year over year shortages would mean groundwater pumping would be very problematic for groundwater sustainability for the Uber Basin. Uh, next slide, please. Well, that figure is not doing very well in the, <laughs> in the presentation. So I'll just kind of describe it because it somehow didn't uh, replicate. Um, what the figure actually was supposed to show, um, and there's a line on it that didn't show, didn't come through. Oh, there we go. <laughs> it's a, uh, it's uh, interactive. Um, if you go ahead and maybe it's, it has to click through all of the, uh, there must be some uh, animations in there. There we go. Yeah, I'm not gonna animate it for you here. Thank you. Um, so what the, the graphic shows is that the, this basin, the south basin of the Yuba subbasin was in critical overdraft uh, all the way up until the early 1980s when surface water uh, was delivered uh, to that area. 
So one of the things we did was model the increased demand on groundwater pumping that uh, to replace projected condition 1D water supply shortages. So the red line at the end there shows the groundwater level decline under that scenario. As you can see, the decline is a similar rate to the rate that occurs during the overdraft period of the 50s and 70s, which was um, very, uh, intolerable and, and created uh, water supply short, uh, shortages of uh, well owners as well in that area. The next slide, please. So uh, this slide focuses on something that we really haven't um, uh, had a, a discussion on before, and that is the, uh, the CDFW 10J flow requirements without an unimpaired requirement, um, which was modeled in the relicensing process as the response to uh, part of the response to the CDFW 10J recommendations. So one of the elements that is central to those 10J recommendations is flows, uh, uh, a delta inflow and outflow contribution, which is discussed in uh, the Foot of the Water Network petition for reconsideration, which identifies the 2018 um, State Board Staff Framework for the Bay Delta Plan Phase 2. Also, the water quality sir, identifies compliance with the Bay Delta Plan. So most importantly, the Uber River is identified in the Bay Delta Plan update documentation as a tributary targeted to increase contribution to delta inflow. So it's important to understand the interaction of these proposed flows in a Bay Delta context. So CDFW's 10J proposal will require an average annual increase in required flows above the accord flow requirements of 134,000 acre feet per year about 200,000 acre feet during schedule one years. That's a 60% increase. And that's a requirement that's only over about two months. Uh, yet the 10J proposal produces an average only about 13,000 acre feet of increased Uber River outflow in the targeted January to uh, June period. So that's a, quite a, quite a, um, a ratio there with, with uh, essentially uh, less than 10% uh, effect. So let me just explain the figure for a second. So the blue bars in this, this is the years that were simulated. And the blue bars are the uh, CDFW 10J flow requirement while uh, in this, um, as it's applied uh, as a higher flow requirement. Then the orange bars are the resulting in that year change in January to June Uber River outflow. And as you can see, there is um, there are years with quite a bit negative as well as positives. And that's because essentially what's going on here is that we have a shifting around of water with not a lot of uh, increase uh, to, uh, to uh, absolute outflow in the January to June period. So what happens is- I just wanted is, to flag that the 20 minutes is up. So if you could wrap up your slides and okay. so move on to the next group. Yeah, uh, so let me just uh, move on. Um, to the next slide. And um, so real, uh, real quickly in summary, the uh, 10 j flows are intended to provide increased floodplain inundation and rearing habitat, but instead reduce floodplain inundation and don't significantly increase habitat. Um, they are significantly less effective at providing higher Uber outflow when the delta is low and uh, result in many periods when Uber River outflow is reduced. And then, of course, the combined CFW 10J flows for Lowe River and 55% only pair flow for the Delta would have large impacts on Yuba County and reduce YCWA's ability to support disadvantaged communities. Next slide, please. And uh, Terry Daly um, would present the last slide here. Uh, so you can see the uh, impacts to Yuba water operations, 300 million in reduced water transfers, 140 million in the loss of power generation and revenue. And I just wanna take 30 seconds to really emphasize the on the ground real life impact of this loss of revenue to the people of Yuba County. You know, Yuba is one of the poorest counties in the state. Our per capita income is less than 20,000 a year. 50% of our residents live in disadvantaged communities. And Yuba Water is the only local source of revenues with substantial enough money to deal, to start dealing with issues like safe drinking water for those disadvantaged communities. 
In the last three fiscal years, Yuba Water has contributed more than 19.3 million in grant funding and 39.1 million in low or no interest loans that directly support public safety, flood risk reduction, science education, and economic development in the county. Just one quick example, we contributed over 3.6 million uh, just this past year for the design and engineering to bring water and wastewater infrastructure to the south of the county. This project will protect our groundwater and secure a reliable source of safe drinking water for existing and new housing, including affordable housing. And on groundwater, we, we have reviewed the state board and DWR's uh, draft groundwater management principles and, and agree. We suggest the, that the water board needs to consider the effects that the water quality certification would likely cause on groundwater-based drinking water supplies in Yuba County. We've also invested almost a million dollars working with our schools on water-based science curriculum that meets the next generation science standards. We're, we also promote the state goals. We've committed more than 8.4 million to forest health in our watershed. And we were a key partner in forming the North Yuba Forest Partnership, which has been widely recognized as a model for the state. So as these examples show the loss of revenue cited in this presentation presents serious social economic and even environmental consequences to the county and its disadvantaged communities and even to the state as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much. Courtney, can you pull up the CDFW presentation? And I'll just flag for people over on the side. If you look at the speaker list, you'll see something that says timer. That's the timer that's running. And if you want to look at it, that's how you can see it at the same time as the presentation in case it's not showing up on your screen when you're just looking at it. That's where you can see it. And Beth, it looks like you're going first. Can you, can we do a mic check, Beth? I think, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Okay, great. Hi, uh, my name is Beth Lawson. I'm a senior hydraulic engineer for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, I just wanna thank you for the opportunity to be here and to present and to engage in conversation and discussion today. I, I think this is really valuable and I look forward to having a robust discussion. I hope there's some good question and answer later. Um, CDFW in this part focused on um, the questions that were asked of us in the recent questions from the State Water Board. And so I'll focus my slides here on those. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so the first question that was asked of us is in general, CDFW's proposal flow, um, proposed flows result in less carryover storage in New Bullard's Bar. How does CDFW's flow proposal consider climate change and the need to manage water supply for multiple water years given extended dry periods? And our response is that CDFW's flow proposal only releases the additional flow for fish and wildlife benefit in the wetter of the water year schedules, uh, because those are the years when water is more available. In the drier water year types, CDFW's flow recommendations and YCWA's flow recommendations are almost identical. In a few years where the drier year follows, in particular drier spring follows a wetter year, the storage in New Bullard's Bar is impacted compared to YCWA's proposed operations. Um, we feel that as climate change compromises all of the fisheries in California, it's very important that we use those wetter years to improve species management when water is generally available. And although there's no perfect forecasting mechanism to prevent us from some impacts to storage, the reason that we did the modeling and the releases the way that we included in our proposal is to take advantage of the time zone water is generally um, available in the Yuba River. Um, in terms of Looking at the water year record, um, within the record, we consider a 41 year period of record during the relicensing, and there are multiple drought cycles on that um, during 76, 77, 1984 to 88, 2007 to 2008, there were drought cycles. So we were able to consider what happens to project operations when we go back and forth between drought cycles and periods of wetter um, and more water availability. And so within that period of record, we were able to look at how the reservoir impact is impacted throughout time in different water year types. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so this is just a chart um, that was included in our 10J recommendations. And I just wanted to highlight a few things in this chart. Um, this is over that 41 year period of hydrologic record. Uh, what we often consider is a look at the end of September storage, uh, because that determines how much water is going into that winter and how much water is being carried into the next year. That's the metric that's used in the North Yuba Index for calculation of the indices um, of what the water year type is for the next year. And so if you um, click the forward arrow, you should see that um, there should be a circle coming here. Not used to not controlling my own slides. Um, in, point, in the amended final license application, which was submitted by YWA to FERC, you see that there is a 0.4% decrease in storage um, because of the um, changes that have been made in their recommendations, particularly some of the upstream changes. If you click the next arrow, you'll see highlighted below that CDFW's Lower Yuba River 10Js um, do include a 4.1% decrease in that end of September storage. Um, next slide, please. Oh, okay. So um, we do feel though that the Lower Yuba change in storage um, of that 4.1% versus the 0.4% um, is an adequate um, balance. We're looking for balance in how to move additional water during the times that we need it um, for the benefit of the species in the Lower Yuba River. Um, the next questions we believe focused on the North Yuba River, and so that's how we're going to answer them. Although in the question to answer later, um, please let me know if we hit the wrong target here. Next slide, please. Um, so some of the other questions about um, question one in indicated for CDFW were question 1B. CDFW says that flow increases from May to June could scour reds. Are the ramping rates associated with this flow in, um, increase insufficient to protect reds? And again, we're assuming this is in the North Yuba River below New Bullard Bar. We're assuming that this question um, applies to just that reach only. So there's no agreed upon ramping rates between the minimum in-stream flows in this reach. The established ramping rates were only applied to spill recession, which pertains to dewatering of reds, not scour. In the water quality certification, the minimum in-stream flows increased from 5 to 60 CFS in May to June without any ramping rates. CDFW's recommended minimum in-stream flows held at 60 CFS during that time period. Absent those ramping rates, CDFW's flow proposal ensures minimum in-stream flows do not require dramatic flow increase during that time across the months where reds would be scoured. And of note, um, there are no foothill yellow frogs in this reach, so the minimum in-stream flows and ramping rates here were only designed to protect the species that were observed in this reach. In other reaches, um, such as the Middle Yuba River and Oregon Creek, we specified and negotiated much more detailed and much slower ramping rates, and that was um, for the protection of foothill yellow frogs. Next slide, please. The next question that was asked of us was, which minimum in-stream flows, e.g. which tables in condition one, is CDFW referring to in its comments related to severely limited spawning habitat? Please describe how those water quality certifications with flows limit habitat. Our response is that we're assuming this question again applies to the North Uber River, um, spawning of rainbow trout at the elevations in the North Yuba River occurs in April through May. Habitat weighted usable area in the model results for the water quality certification recommended 5 CFS in April and May for this condition yield only 44% of the maximum weighted usable area in this reach for all water year types. And our flow recommendations uh, modeled 85% of the maximum weighted usable area for the spawning life stage during these months. Next slide, please. Okay, and this is just taking a look at the study results. Um, you can see from these lines, this is what we generally have for a weighted usable area plot. Um, if you're not familiar looking at this, um, the spawning, which is what we're talking about here, is shown in the blue line below. And then the table on the right indicates what percentage of maximum weighted usable area. And so that is a um, metric that is taken off of the highest maximum weighted usable area. So we're seeing what at what flows we can maximize the habitat in that reach given the existing conditions. And so for the spawning, you see that at five CFS, um, we see a red circle to the right of five CFS, where 44% of spawning habitat is available at five CFS. And for the recommended CDFW flows, we see that 85% is available. You can also see in this plot that the blue line is sufficiently below the red and orange lines um, indicating that spawning is limited in this habitat. Um, there's a limitation of gravel in this reach, and that can contribute to the limitation of spawning 
um, habitat available. Next slide, please. Um, the water quality certification um, patterns also diverge from the natural hydrograph. And that's the other thing that we wanted to highlight about that 5 CFS, not just the limitation on spawning, but um, the pattern for New Bullard's Bar Reach uh, reflects nearly the inverse of a natural hydrograph where the lowest flows of the year are during the months of the highest unimpaired natural flow. During the months of April and May, 5 CFS provides only 0.4% of the natural unimpaired flow when compared to critically dry years and historic flows. The recommended 10J flows restore just 2.5% of the unimpaired hydrograph in this reach. These recommended flows would improve habitat conditions throughout the year for native fish and other aquatic species by improving water avail availability and lowering water temperatures, both critical to the current and long-term health of aquatic species. The recommended 10J flows additionally keep summer flows higher and improve temperatures in the north slash middle Yuba reach confluence. And that reach is the, there's a, the immediate reach that we're talking about where the prescribed flows are is the two point, I think 2.3 mile reach immediately below New Bullard's Bar. And then there's an additional 5.2 ish mile reach um, where the middle Yuba and north Yuba come together before the top of Englebite Reservoir. Next slide, please. If we just take a look at these unimpaired flows compared to what's in the water quality certification, the unimpaired flows are in the top reach. And if you um, key your interest on any one particular water year type, for example, critically dry water year types, the average unimpaired flow in April in this reach would be about 1400 CFS, even in a critically dry water year type. Or in the table below, which is the water quality certification, we see that there's only five CFS in those months, in both the months of April and May which is the highest months of unimpaired runoff. And then the next slide, um, you see that the CDFW table has been replaced. Um, this is what we're recommending today. The CDFW table also has pretty low flows in this reach, um, but we thought that this was a good balance in order to improve the habitat for the fish in the North Yuba River reach, as well as in that North slash Middle Yuba River reach um, below. Um, we're also trying to improve temperature in that reach. Um, so that salmonids will have good temperature throughout the summer in that reach. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is just a quick look at that hydrograph graphed up. Um, in this slide, I have the scales from the top to the bottom on an equivalent scale. And if you tab to the next one, I've increased the y-axis. Um, next slide, please. Okay, and I increased the y-axis. You'll now see that they're not equivalent, but I just wanted to highlight that the um, flows in the water quality certification are lowest during that April-May time period where the highest ones are shown um, in the graph above it. Next slide, please. Um, so just taking a look at uh, the equivalent reaches that are nearby in the proximate middle Yuba watershed where the US Forest Service had mandatory conditions on this project, minimum instream flows were agreed upon by all relicensing participants. For the middle Yuba watershed, which has just 29% of the watershed area of the New Bullard's Bar Reach, the agreed upon minimum in-stream flows range from 40 to 120 CFS, depending on the water your type and month. It's counterintuitive for this small, smaller watershed to receive significantly greater minimum in-stream flows than the New Bullard's Bar Reach, which is fed by about 70% more, more watershed area. Next slide, please. So our recommendation is that water quality certification Table one be replaced with CDFW's petition for reconsideration table C, which restores just 2.5% of the unimpaired hydrograph in this reach. Um, we also recommend that the um, condition for consultation with the agencies after 10 years be removed from all of the reaches upstream of Inglebright. I think that condition was intended just to apply to uh, the downstream Delta flows and downstream uh, voluntary settlement agreements. Um, and in the condition, it's unclear whether those um, that condition, condition for additional consultation going 10 years forward additionally applies to the reaches upstream of Englebright. So we recommend that that be removed from this condition. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you for your time. We look forward to discussing these um, issues later. Thanks. I think now we will move on to Chris Schutz presenting for the NGOs. So Courtney, if you could get Chris's presentation up, that'd be great.
And Chris, can we um, check to see if you're unmuted? And sure, I'm that? ready to go. I'm waiting for the presentation. Perfect, thank you. Very good. Good morning again. I'm Chris Schutz with California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance or CSPA. I'm going to talk today about how Yuba, Water, Yuba County Water Agency, YCWA on the one hand, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, CDFW, and CSPA on the other hand, have used the operations model for the YRDP. I will discuss modeling both for license, relicensing and for the water quality certification. As I go, I will explain much of the rationale for the joint flow proposal developed by CDFW, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and the Foothills Water Network Coalition of NGOs, also known as FWN. This um, flow recommendation was a jointly developed project product. In his letter to Mr. Lofer on September 3rd, YCWA's attorney, Mr. Bezerra, suggested that the NGOs, quote, have simply agreed with CDFW's stream flow proposals and not submitted any technical analysis. That is untrue, unwarranted, and frankly insulting. The YRDP operations model is an Excel-based spreadsheet model. It is excellent and highly versatile. I have no objection to the model itself and no question about the technical competence of YCWA and, and its consultants in using the model. What I dispute is the way that YCWA has used technical tools to advocate for its regulatory positions. When I speak of modeling today, I mean the use of the YRDP operations model. Next slide, please. Water Quality Certification 1 adopts the flow recommendations of YCWA as a starting point for the water quality certification and creates an open-ended 10-year review process, which does not include NGOs to, uh, and, and which will occur within 10 years of license issuance. Next slide, please. <clears throat> YCWA has adopted the position of using the operations modeling to analyze worst case or close to worst case scenarios of the potential impacts of condition one's open-ended review requirement. CSPA et al. has objected to the lack of adequate flow of lack of adequate flow requirement on the front end. Next slide, please. YCWA has chosen variables to input into the model that show close to worst case and embed those variables in its modeling. YCWA has then call, conducted what I call a derivative analysis. Assuming its chosen variables as fact, it has voluminously described the consequences to such factor as generation revenues, water sales, water temperature, groundwater impacts, et cetera. Another step removed, YCWA has described impacts of reduced revenues to the Yuba County community more broadly, layering on unstated assumptions about how YCWA would allocate revenues that it is assumed would be reduced. In my opinion, the overall purpose of YCWA's analysis is to show that the water quality certification is unreasonable. Next slide, please. Slide five shows what I will discuss today. Uh, it shows how lack of decisions in the water quality certification create analytical variables. It identifies those variables. It describes how YCWA and other FERC licensees model those variables both for the water quality, particularly for the water quality certification and what conclusions they drew. It describes how CDFW and CSPA modeled variables and relicensing and what conclusions we drew. It, re it recommends analysis to reach reasonable water quality certification flow conditions. And it discusses the importance of the pro approach for the Bay Delta plan. Next slide, please. Slide six identifies six major variables that one must confront in operations modeling of the water quality certification. These variables exist because the conditions in the water quality certification um, uh, did not address them specifically and don't provide direction or clarity on how the board plans to address them. The structure of this pleasant presentation begins on slide seven. Next slide, please. And it's generally to review each variable. I will discuss how YCWA briefly addressed each variable in modeling the water quality certification and contrast that with how CDFW and CSPA et al. addressed the same variable in modeling during relicensing. For lack of time, I have to speed through this. I will discuss and summarize the bullets 
not read them. I suggest the board and board staff listen now and review again later. The left side of slide seven describes my analysis of YCWA's approach to modeling the water quality certification. The right side shows how CDFW, Fish and Wildlife Service, and Foothills Water Network developed our joint flow recommendation. That there is much more extensive discussion of the development of the recommendation in CSPA et al's exhibit one, pages 10 to 28. Next slide, please. Slide eight provides the percent of unimpaired flow over the entire month that the CDFW, Fish and Wildlife Service, Woodhills Water Network flow recommendation would provide. On a monthly basis, this flow recommendation achieves many of the target percent of unimpaired flows in the board's 2018 framework for the Bay Delta plan update. Next slide, please. Slide nine summarizes the months in which the percent of unimpaired flow was applied and when it would make a difference. Remembering slide eight, in most cases, the difference between applying in February through June and applying year round is small. It is likely that the biggest effect of a year-round requirement would be during storms in refill months like December and January. There are also specific measures for red protection in the Yuba Accord that would be lost by applying a percent of unimpaired flow in October through January. In addition, this could add to YCWA's water cost. Next slide, please. How much upstream diverters would have to bypass to meet a percent of unimpaired flow is a major variable. YCWA has not released modeling of this yet, but PG&E and Nevada Irrigation District upstream have filed modeling with FERC, purportedly, as I understand it, in consultation with YCWA, that was performed by a consultant that is also one of YCWA's consultants. PG&E and NID assumed 55 or 65% bypass at their upstream control points. That is only one way of looking at it. Uh, the, the requirement in the, in the board's uh, 2018 framework is for a percent of unimpaired at the downstream control point. Next slide, please. Slide 11 asks fundamental questions that the board must answer for technical analysis to be meaningful. A couple of the questions are legal or policy questions. The point today is that the answers have profound technical consequences. Next slide, please. Slide 12 is a map of the total Yuba watershed area. To the right is an area breakdown by sub-watershed. Next slide, please. Slide 13 is another more targeted map that shows how much water on averages passes or is diverted at major features in the Yuba watershed. What is clear from the maps on slides 12 and 13 is that YCWA as the downstream diverter has the opportunity to divert far more water than senior diverters PG&E and NID upstream. The board will have to consider how to divide responsibility. Applying the same percent of bypass at upstream and downstream compliance points seems inherently inequitable. Since at least May, March 19, 2014, at a state water board workshop, I've been asking this board to provide clarity on how much, if at all, the Bay Delta plan will require diverters upstream of Central Valley rim dams to contribute to Delta inflow and outflow. I have heard no answer. Here is another example of how deferral of basic decisions leads to technical confusion. Next slide, please. Slide 14 reflects that YCWA's modeling of dry year sequences applies at a percent of unimpaired flow in the same way as it does in other years. This has storage and water temperature requirements, uh, impacts, excuse me, that YCWA says are unreasonable. YCWA then argues, like almost every other water purveyor in the valley, that since impacts are unreasonable in dry year sequences, the board should scrap the entire percent of unimpaired framework. The CDFW Foothills Water Network U.S. Fish and Wildlife Flow Recommendation doesn't have these impacts since in the driest years, the flows are very close to the Yuba Accord. The biggest impact YCWA sites in the, in the uh, joint flow recommendation uh, is when YCWA would miss out on a $40 million windfall in 2014 by selling carryover storage to Westlands Water District, one of the most junior diverters in the valley. That was also the year when many water agencies were shorting customers and when this board weakened water quality, uh, water quality 
standards in the Delta and saw Delta smelt become virtually undetectable in a year of surveys. The board needs to decide if that $40 million windfall to YCWA in 2014 is reasonable. Next slide, please. Slide 15 reports that YCWA's modeling completely um, sidesteps water quality condition 16. The board made it easy to ignore this because the water quality certification sets no clear rules for droughts. It proposes that YCWA and the board collaborate to make those rules. That's a fallacy and a fantasy. YCWA, like every other major purveyor in the Valley, <clears throat> is not going to help this board develop reasonable drought rules. YCWA uses droughts to make the water quality certification in the Dead Delta Plan appear unreasonable. The board needs to make the rules. Next slide, please. On July 22nd, YCWA's GM wrote to the board proposing to discuss rules for variances that would occur under condition 16. That's wrong. The, water, the board doesn't need rules for variances. The board needs rules for droughts and dry year sequences that make variances unnecessary. CSPA and allied groups have been asking this board for such rules and FERC processes across the valley and, and water, associated water quality certifications. These include were said in Tuolumne in, and, and also in comments in the Delta, Bay Delta plan for close to a decade. Next slide, please. Here are the necessary elements of drought plans and alternatives for how to address rules. The board should hold a technical conference open to petitioners to discuss this, discuss this, not just a closed door discussion as suggested between YCWA and FERC. Next slide, please. YCWA claims an impact to local irrigation de deliveries from the CDFW, FWS, FWN flow recommendation. It is a model, modeling artifact unlikely to occur in practice. Next slide, please. The combined outlet capacity of Narrows 1 and 2 powerhouses or bypasses is about 4,130 CFS. In reviewing modeling, CDFW and CSPA noticed there were times when a percent of unimpaired flow requirement would require YCWA to induce or augment spill from Engelbright to meet the requirement. In response, we adjusted the flow recommendation to allow YCWA to use the existing outlet works. We also allow compliance when late April flood up strains the limits of those outset outlet works so that YCWA can meet both irrigation and Marysville flow requirements. YCWA in its modeling for the, of the water quality certification assumes it will have to induce spill to comply and argues that that is unreasonable. Next slide, please. In summary, CDFW, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and the Foothills Water Network did extensive research and analysis on the particular characteristics of the Yuba watershed and facilities and built their flow recommendations around this analysis. CSPA started from the Delta and looked upstream. CDFW and U.S. Fish and Wildlife used a more traditional approach that started from the lower Yuba River. Next slide, please. The State Water Board must also conduct site-specific analysis of the Yuba watershed and every other major valley watershed. The board's biggest mistake is to rely on YCWA to help. YCWA will not help improve the water quality certification and the Bay Delta plan. Next slide, please. The State Water Board should conduct modeling and analysis that address the variables shown here and reject YCWA's prefix menu of bad choices. It should address variables with a matrix of potential choices stated as in clear and enforceable conditions and then iteratively modify them based on modeling. It should focus on outputs for flow, storage, and deliveries. It should limit derivative analysis until it's honed in on the appropriate um, uh, flow requirements. It should use well-grounded decisions on UBA as a partial template for the Bay Delta plan update. The key to adequate technical analysis is clear enforceable conditions to analyze. Last slide, please. The State Water Board should set flow conditions for the lower Yuba River now, based on the record consistent with the CDFW, Foothill, Fish and Wildlife Service, Foothill Water Network flow recommendation. The board should not kick down the can down the road for review 
after 10 years, a review, which in fact would not include in non-governmental organizations. Thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss these issues. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Um, I think what we're gonna do next is to take a, a 15 minute break, um, to catch our breath and everything, and then we can move into discussing everything that we just heard. So if you all wanna make sure you're back in 15 minutes, we'll start promptly in 15 minutes. I'm not sure exactly that is. Thanks everyone. And just so everybody knows, we're gonna start off with YCWA's uh, first up to ask questions of the petitioners, followed by CDFW and then the NGOs and then state water board staff will go at the conclusion of that. So why don't we meet back at 1045.
Okay, looks like it's 1045 or 1046 and we can go ahead and get started with the discussion portion of condition one. Um, whoever wants to ask, lead off the questions from YCWA, could you raise your hand, please? And as a reminder, please state your name for the court reporter and who you're directing the question to. Does YCWA have any questions for any of the petitioners? Hi, Ryan, I see your hand is raised, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, we, we do not have any questions. Um, we've submitted all of our materials and in light of the short amount of time, um, we think it's more efficient just to proceed to see if anybody else has questions. Thank you so much. So I'm going to go to CDFW. Is there anyone from CDFW that wants to ask a question? If you could raise your hand. Hi, Bree. Hi. I think we're in the same boat as YWA for now in the interest of time. We will wait for um, board questions for us. Okay. Then I'll move on to the NGOs. Do the NGOs have any questions for any of the petitioners based upon the presentation? Hi, uh, Chris Schutz, same. Uh, same response here. We don't have any questions at this time. Um, if there are questions from board or staff later on, we'd be happy to answer them. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, then I'm gonna turn it over to uh, board staff. Hey, Aaron, this is Eric Oppenheimer. Um, can I start with a question? That'd be great, Eric, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. This, this question is um, for Yuba County Water Agency. Um, and, and so just start off by saying condition, well, start off by saying thank you to everyone for the, for the presentations. Um, they've been really informative and I appreciate obviously the clear level of effort that went into preparing for today. And I think it's, we're getting a lot of really great and useful information. So thanks to everybody. Um, with respect to condition 1D, uh, on its face, it's fundamentally a condition that requires consultation. And that consultation may lead to uh, Yuba County Water Agency submitting a updated um, or modified set of minimum in-stream flows for consideration by the deputy director for water rights. And so in trying to tease out what that means, you know, my understanding from the presentation, other information submitted by Yuba County Water Agency is that um, basically part of what you did was taking 10J flows and a 55% unimpaired flow requirement and it appeared in some ways stack them together. And then in some ways, um, maybe just look at 10J in isolation in some of the flows, if I understood correctly, it was pretty, um, some of the information was really good. I'll have to go back and look at it. It was, but it was somewhat dense, um, just meaning technically dense, a lot of information packed into those slides. Um, and so I'm not sure that that, you know, outcome of those two flow requirements stacked together. And then looking at the economic impacts of that through things like changes in power operations is the most likely outcome from this 1D consultation process. And so my question to, to the water agency is, did you look and analyze different flow scenarios and what the outcomes might be from those 
and especially including your voluntary agreement flow schedule since the um, condition itself specifically calls out that um, voluntary solutions acceptable to the board um, would essentially satisfy the condition. So whoever it, wants to it looks like, from it look, YCWA, if you it looks like Steve's hand. got oh, his Steve. hand up, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Mayor. Um, so, uh, yeah, to, to answer your question, yeah, we have looked at the individual pieces as, um, and we've you know, you know, talked to you about some of those into the voluntary agreement process. Uh, in FERC relicensing, we looked at solely and specifically just the uh, 10J flow requirements, and then separately in the Bay Delta process previously, we looked at, you know, just solely a percent of paired flow um, outcome, um, requirements. So we have, you know, separated out each one of those. And um, as you would imagine, as, as we've said many, many times, we're obviously um, very much focused on a voluntary agreement approach um, and operation uh, going forward for the Bay Delta uh, process. And, 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 you know, I mean, uh, the summary of the 10J flows uh, you know, if, you, if, if it didn't come through in the presentation is, you know, those flows are for supposedly for, you know, habitat on the Yuba and some in, you know, inflow to the Bay Delta and, and it doesn't do either. So I, we're not sure what the purpose of those are um, exactly. They don't meet their stated objectives. And that's the purpose of our separating that out and modeling it. We did most of that in the, in the relicensing process. Yeah, I just I, I get the impression through the presentation that it's almost like a foregone conclusion that the result of condition 1D will be imposition of a 55% unimpaired flow regime or 10J flows or those two prescriptions independent or some combination of them. And I just I, I think that's um you know, a fairly big assumption. And again, you know, maybe not the most likely outcome from that process. And so are you, is it, is it Yuba's position that that is what that, what will, what is the most likely outcome from the one, one D um, term condition? And so the, the purpose, you know, there were, there were other purposes because of the way the construct of the water quality should. Um, I think that you know Yuba has been pretty clear that the delegated delegation of authority of such large um, effects to the project to the executive director are um, are problematic, uh, and so that process is um, is of concern. And then the other element is um, it's to demonstrate that through a, that delegated authority process, uh, these things that have been pointed to um, could occur and that they would be very large if they did. Um, so I don't know about probability of will they occur, but uh, the fact uh, in, you know, the, it's kind of taking the, the mechanics of what is being discussed in the water quality cert as a, uh, as a possibility and maybe even likely if when, when it's listing inadequate, potential inadequacies, but then also linking that up with a very uncertain future and a very uncertain process that's a delegated one and appears to not be before the full board. And so that together as a totality is, is um, in all of those elements are one of the major concerns of, of Yuba, an uncertain future, um, which, you know, FERC relicensing is supposed to provide some reasonable certainty. Th 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 thanks, Steve, that, that's helpful. Um, I guess one just response is that while the condition um, leaves certain things up to the executive director and the um, deputy director. Any actual change to the Bay Delta flow requirements or acceptance of a voluntary agreement would be through the full board process. So just just a point of clarification. But thank but thanks, thank you for that. Any other questions, Eric? No, that was um, my main question. Um, well, then Mike Parker has a question. 
Yes, um, so I have a few questions um, and I thought I would start with Yuba Water Agency and then move to CDFW. And most of all of my questions are directed at an entity such as you know an agency, but my first one is I think more for Willie. Um, and it's be it's based on the introduction statements that were made. I just wanted to clarify or or seek clarification um, because in in that intro statement there was um, discussion that implementation of the CERT would cause severe impacts um, to just name a few to irrigation, um, hydropower generation as well as flow releases. And I wanted to clarify if those concerns are mainly focused on Yuba Water Agency's assumptions from 1D versus um, the flow requirements and sort of in conditions of the CERT. Yeah, um, Parker, thanks. So the certification leaves open a lot of discretion for the water board. I think that's our biggest concern. And like um, Eric's previous question, Steve's response, um, we went under the assumptions of what, what likely would happen and because of measures that have been proposed throughout this process. Um, so, so yes, we're, you know, the water quality cert doesn't specifically state what flow regime may occur. So we just applied what likely would occur and the impacts related to that. So um, without specificity, it's more difficult to, to get any more accurate than that. Okay, thank you. Um, and I've asked if some of the slides could be up while I'm asking some questions, because I think some visuals would be helpful here. Um, and kind of a more technical question on slide two. Um, you know, thank, first off, thank you guys for sharing this and, and putting the time into today. I, I do appreciate it. And, you know, from this slide, as well as your petition, I can understand that what, you, what you're presenting here is a FERC base, which is, you know, essentially what the FEIS was looking at with those changes that you're listing, um, as well as a Yuba's assumptions of what 1D could require. Um, but one minor note in how these are looked at, it's, I feel like it might've been a little more accurate to have the water year types be consistent across both. Um, in the projected 1D, you're using condition threes water year types. And then in the FEIS base, I believe you're using Yuba's proposed water year types. And there's there's only a slight change between them, but having them line up on the same water year type may have allowed for more of a complete comparison between the two. Um, and I would just make the note that the water year types in the CERT are consistent with what's in decision 1644. And so the FEIS base would require additional actions to, to implement those new water year types. All right, um, well then I'll keep going. Um, can we go to slide six for a minute? So I think this question might be for Steve or Paul or anyone at Yuba Water Agency, but you know, based upon what's being presented, there's the FEIS base as well as Yuba's assumptions of what condition 1D could require, um, but neither of, or, or the part I wanted to ask is, or, or seek clarity on, is that the FEIS base requires minimum and stream flows that are consistent with condition 1A of the CERT. Um, so I wanted to just make sure that that same understanding is there. And if not, could Yuba please let us know what minimum and stream flow requirements in condition 1A vary from the FEIS base? Uh, this is Steve Grinnell. Um, uh, as far as, uh, let's see, so um, condition one of A uh, versus uh, the FEIS base, <clears throat> the primary one are uh, releases below New Bulls Bar, in the, in the reach below New Bulls Bar. Uh, so 1A um, has some uh, uh, different flows there, I believe. Um, and uh, as you as you pointed out, there the um, the water the um, water year type determination, uh, which is a minor, uh, relatively minor change, which is the evaluation in February, uh, which is um, uh, 
uh, which in schedule five, six and uh, conference years are slightly different. Um, other than that, I, I do not believe that they are, there are any differences in the 1A requirements. Thank you, Steve. I, I don't actually believe there are any differences from the CERTs 1A New Bullard's Bar flow requirements um, from yeah. what the FEIS is requiring. Yeah, I'm sorry, I misspoke. It, they, they, you were at the CDFW um, 10J recommendations um, are different, but the, I believe you're correct that the 1As are, are um, uh, the same as the FEIS base. Thank you. Um, can we actually back up to slide five for a second? So when- Hey, Parker. Hey, yes. Parker. Ryan had his hand raised, and I don't oh. know if it was related to the last question or not. It, Apologies. I don't see it anymore, so maybe it's not there no, anymore. I, but. I, just a request that if we're going to discuss specific parts of the certification, if at all possible, could we pull them up on the screen so people can see them while they're discussing them? Thank you. Okay, I think that may be possible. Is there a need to pull up the new bullets bar given Steve's response? Okay, I don't see any, um, but we'll continue. So on slide five, you're showing the the YC, YWA assumptions of what Wendy could require in relation to the FEIS base. And we've kind of established that the FEIS base is very similar to the requirements of the certification um, with some changes to water year types, but the minimum in stream flows line up. And I know there's also some changes to the um, tunnel closures. And so what I, what I kind of take away from these graphs is it's showing that the FEIS base or the minimum in stream flows of the CERT provide better water temperatures than what you was projecting under condition 1D. Yeah, hi, this is Parker, this is Paul Bradovich. Um, yes, the FEIS base modeling results indicate there are much better water conditions than the projected 1D scenario. And those are consistent with the requirements in, for minimum in stream flows in the CERT. Sorry, I'm just skimming Ryan, through. Let, yeah, th thank Ryan. you. I just, we, we need to have a little more clarity. Um, Parker, when you say the in-stream flows in the CERT, there's a wide variety of them. In the condition, condition 1D, 1A flows in the certification. Yeah, we, We're yes, we need to have some. Condition 1A flows. Yes, we need to have clarity on that with those questions. Thank you. Okay. And I, yes, and to clarify, Aaron is right. I'm referring to the minimum in stream flow requirements of the CERT condition 1A. Um, and I was just noting that um, in comparison to the projected or UBIS assumptions of 1D, it appears that the FERC base which is fairly consistent with the search requirements, provides better temperatures. Um, but I think I have a few other questions. Um, and I'm just skimming through my notes very quickly. Um, so if we could please go to slide nine. Um, so on this slide, there's a discussion about um, the recession rates for riparian seedling recruitment. Um, and a note that in 2018, the Water Board supported the collaborative effort that was developing targets for riparian seedling recruitment rates. Um, I just, and there's a table provided on the side of that um, discussion. And I wanted to just, I guess, note or clarify that those are the same requirements that are in the certification. Um, so I think it's consistent with the State Water Board's previous support for those um, recession rates in 2018. So to clarify, Parker, what your question is, is it's clarifying that what is proposed here or discussed here is consistent with what is required in the certification. Yes, and so I guess that the question I would have is, is the concern here again um, focused on 
Yuba's assumptions for 1D or with the actual um, riparian recession rates in the certification. Um, and I can provide this cert condition um, if needed. Um, this part of the, 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 the purpose here was, um, and, and we, um, that is our understanding as well, that, that um, um, what is in the CERD is consistent. But uh, the, the point being made here was that the CERD is um, highlighting potentially inadequate spill reductions, but we've all agreed to use, you know, and then what is in the CERD and the FEIS um, and what everybody has proposed are these numbers. So um, we question whether there really will be inadequate spill reductions with this, this construct. Given the assumptions for 1D? Um, no, well, um, it's really, this is uh, separate from 1D. Remember, this was a rationale for condition 1D that there were inadequate, or there, there were inadequate spill reduction, but we believe that that's essentially been addressed by everyone agreeing to these um, uh, flow reduction, spill cessation rates. Okay, thank you. So this is more of a comment on that portion of the rationale. Correct. Thank you. Um, so my next question is, you know, from my memory of the YRDP operations model, it had built-in carryover storage targets that are at times, you know, well above the amount necessary for, you know, inundation of the intakes. And so when Yuba developed their assumptions for what they thought condition 1D could require, um, did they look at adjusting these carryover targets to reduce impacts to irrigators, or did it maintain the same carryover storage targets, even if it met reduction in irrigation deliveries? Uh, well, there's two sets of um, carryover storage targets. There's a targeted <clears throat> flow requirement um, for the uh, properties in the Accord, 650,000 acre feet, if there's sufficient water. So that's a desired target. And then there are carryover targets in the modeling specifically for absolute, um, essentially absolute, if there's enough water uh, and irrigation deliveries are shorted um, if we do not meet those targets. So that's how shortages are applied. If um, there's a um, carryover target and if the reservoir is gonna be falling below that, then irrigation is shorted until we meet that, that target, that carryover. That's, uh, we use consistent modeling for that across all of our scenarios in order to understand the relative differences of those. That's helpful, thank you. Um, and then I had previously asked in um, our write-up that Yuba very kindly provided written response to, responses to um, a little bit about how they integrated the 10 Js and 55% unimpaired and Yuba responded, as well as in this presentation, that they took the highest of the two um, at given points. Um, and the point of clarity I'm looking for is at periods of time in that project, Yuba's assumptions of 1D, um, as per their petition, they're mentioning that 15% of the time there's less Chinook spawning habitat. And so I was just trying to seek some clarity that if the highest of the two flows were always taken, how did it result in less Chinook spawning habitat 15% of the time? Now, Paul, you want to go at that one first, and uh, I can address that from a flow standpoint. But Would you... Yeah, oops. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, um, the, when you take the flows and you turn it into uh, habitat discharge relationships, you model the amounts of habitat, again, using an exceedance probability distribution. Um, the results show that the similar amounts of spring run spawning habitat over 85% of the distribution but lower amounts of spawning habitat during that 15% of the distribution. My understanding, I'll have Steve correct this, but my understanding 
is that uh, during the spawning period, which is September 1 to October 15th, that the condition 1D scenario resulted in lower flows during that 15% of the time, which resulted in lower habitat probabilities. Um, but I defer to Steve to, to clarify that connection. Um, yes, yeah, so condition 1D uh, results in changes to the Accord uh, in-stream flow schedules. And so it shifts those flows for the fall time period, even though generally, uh, well, the, the CFW of 10J flows are not active at that time. And the percent on a pair flow is generally not operated to that time. At that time, it's the Accord flows that are usually or almost always in force. But when there's a shift in uh, because of storage reduction resulting from condition 1D, uh, drawing on storage quite a bit more than uh, the FEIS base, we have a lower storage. So the, the following year will we'll, and can shift to a lower flow, in-stream flow requirement under the Accord, and that shifts the flows in the fall. OK. So I'll repeat what I think I understand, and please let me know. <laughs> it's, it's in that period of time where you get that 15% less. It's the Yuba Accord flows that are kind of running that area, but the reduction is a result of the water years being shifted by the other periods of time in which higher flow releases were triggered by the 55% in 10 Js. That was outstanding. <laughs> That's good. Um, good. Do you think the water year types and that how they were built into the two assumptions differently may have influenced that? Well, remember that the water year types, uh, the process for developing the accord was matching up the water year types, the thresholds between them and the flows that the biologists collaboratively developed. So it was all, it's a matching set. And so once you significantly change the probability of storage, end of September storage, which is a part of the calculation of the index and therefore water year type, it starts to shift everything. We, we see a, a doubling of uh, the occurrence of conference years. We see a doubling of occurrence of schedule six years. So we, everything shifts to drier flow schedules because storage in those dry years is such an important element of uh, the operation to the accord. We're basically boosting the natural flow in those very driest years with significant amounts of storage release. And is that storage target the Yuba Accord 650,000 acre foot target or the absolute deliveries target or a combination of both? That well, the target, that? well, remember that the index is just whatever the resulting end of September storage is that just goes into the, into the um, calculation of the index. So it's, it's the, it's, it's the absolute value minus the, the, um, you know, the um, FERC minimum pool is the, what we call active storage amount. And that's one component of the index. So anything that changes, you know, on relative scenarios changes the, you know, the occurrence of that storage is going to start to affect uh, the accord flow schedules for the following year. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, so my only other question is for CDFW. And it was based upon some of the information provided in the slides. Um, I'm trying to find which slide it is right now. But essentially, um, YCWA's pres presentation, um, I believe slide eight, that took a look at floodplain inundation, um, was comparing the um, CDFW 10Js to the uh, amended FLA flows and was finding you know, relatively the same amount of floodplain habitat inundation. And um, based upon the materials from CDFW, there's discussion that the CDFW 10J flows, um, one of their goals is to increase floodplain habitat, but given the information provided by Yuba, it seems to be relatively similar. And so I didn't know if there's any explanation for that. That'll probably go to Beth Lawson. So if we could un unmute Beth, I think that's where we should unmute. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. 
Okay, great. I think that we're going to get to this metric in our next um, set of presentations when we talk about condition 12, because as Steve was just saying, you know, um, their metric or, you know, their Yuba cord water schedules as well as their water type were really paired up. Um, our flow schedule was really paired with a um, restoration proposal as well that included cutting and grading um, within the lower Yuba River. And so um, the, I think that slide that you're referring to, Parker, um, I do see that there's a, a bit of an increase in the flow um, or in the floodplain inundation. And I think we have to be careful what's being called floodplain. I haven't had any time with that slide to really digest, um, you know, where the numbers are coming from in there. But I think that we have to be careful about what's called floodplain because uh, I think I heard YWA define that as 5,000 CFS. However, the control of the project um, at the two narrows power plants is at 3430, I think. And so, um, you know, there's a bit of a definition around where you're starting to call something an inundated floodplain. Um, we, in our proposal, were careful to call out that when we were trying to um, put more water in the lower Yuba River, you'll see that we keyed that off of the capacity of the narrows power plants because we wanted to be able to do something that was within the scope of YWA's ability to control the two narrows power plants. And so that's why our restoration proposals focused on that area, which is also below the control of the project. Anything above um, the combined capacity of the narrows one and two power plant just has to be uncontrolled spill at Inglebright. And the only way that that's controlled is by um, bringing Inglebright's elevation down before storms, which is some um, sort of operational uh, work that YWA does in order to absorb some of the storm flow that's coming in. And so, you know, I think when you're looking at a floodplain, you really need to consider what that is and what is within the control of the project. So as um, Stephanie in particular will get into in our next set of presentations, in our proposal, we looked at what was controllable by this project and what we could influence within the control of YWA's FERC projects. Thank you. Um, then I'll just hold the any other thoughts on that until after the next segment. Um, it's Stephanie, did you want to add to that? I didn't want to speak. I'm an engineer, not a biologist, so I'd like to let the biologist speak if there was any other response to that question. That's Stephanie Millsap that she's referring to, if we can unmute Stephanie Millsap. <laughs> Hi, thanks. So I agree that this question is better answered after the presentation that I'll be given and are giving and that I do address some of these questions. Uh, that you're posing, Parker, during that. And I think some of the figures that I show may also be helpful for this discussion. Well, thank you. I want to thank, you know, YWA and CDFW and U.S. Fish and Wildlife for addressing some of these questions. I appreciate it. Are there any other questions okay. regarding the flow or should we move on to condition 12? It sounds like we're ready for that. Okay, let's move on to condition 12, um, habitat restoration in the lower Yuba River. Uh, we'll start with a presentation from YCWA. So if we can get that pulled up, we can get that going. And whoever's going to be the first speaker, if you could raise your hand so we can get you unmuted and make sure your mic's working. It looks like it's Tom Johnson. You know, sorry about that. I'm struggling a bit with the little hand raise icon on this version of uh, um, Zoom or Teams or whatever it is that we're using here. Sorry about that. 
Are we good to go? Oh, we're good to go. We can hear you. So go ahead. And then when you need the slide advanced, just say next slide. Very good. So my name is Tom Johnson. I'm a consultant with Yuba Water and have been working on uh, Yuba River issues for just over 20 years. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to move pretty quickly through these first few slides because I think the, the meat of our technical analysis is, is a little further along. So the water quality condition calls for a plan of restoration for the Lower Yuba River. Next slide, please. The rationale for this condition attributes a number of impacts to the river of impacts to the river corridor to the project. However, we believe that that attribution is at least somewhat in error. There were some very substantial physical impacts to the Yuba River, which started shortly after the arrival of the first gold miners in the mid 1800s. And any attribution of impacts that doesn't accept and account for those rather substantial impacts uh, does not correctly attribute causal factors. Next slide, please. The impact of hydraulic mining is really hard to overstate. It, there was just a staggering amount of sediment that was injected into the Yuba River. We're gonna to get to that in a moment. But in addition to the mining debris itself, there were substantial modifications in the form of dredging and channelization, dams and so forth. Those impacts are largely documented. I admit that it's very heavy reading and um, there are probably a couple thousand pages of that sort of material in the FERC record for the project. Next slide, please. Sorry, I gotta advance my own here. I'm running in parallel. Um, unfortunately, the record of conditions on the lower Yuba River prior to 1880 is very sparse and we really do not have much in the way of photographic evidence, but there are some uh, hand-drawn maps. And what we can see is that the uh, prior to the mining sediment, it was a very different river. It was described as being uh, very heavily vegetated and probably one of the most dramatic uh, differences is the floodplain was estimated to be four or five kilometers wide. And that's compared to the 200 to 500 meters, 0.2 to 0.5 kilometers that we see today between either the levees or the training walls. Next slide, please. This is a brief summary of the amount of hydraulic mining debris that was uh, came from the west slope of the Sierras during the heyday and the photograph is of Malakoff diggings, and this shows just a very small piece of what that works looked like. And that was in turn a very small piece of what occurred all over the watershed. It was estimated in a fairly comprehensive survey that was conducted in 1917, oh, that at that time, that roughly that half of the right total here. amount of sediment in the Yuba remained in the lower Yuba River downstream of what the location of Englebright Dam now. So that is on the order of 350 million cubic yards of material in the lower Yuba River. It's really hard to fathom what that looks like. So I ran a little bit of math this morning. The distance from Englebright Dam to the Feather River confluence is 24 miles. If you could imagine a block of sediment, 24 miles long, eight stories tall, and three football fields, roughly a thousand feet wide, that's what 300 and just below 350 million cubic yards look like. And so if you take that block of sediment and distribute it all over the lower Yuba River, that is approximately what is out there today. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Should be looking for seven, thank you. Um, there has been some clearing of sediment um, and these photographs that show 1908 to 2006, roughly a hundred years apart, you can see that while a lot of sediment is gone, there's still a tremendous amount remaining. We don't have comparable photos for further down in the river, 
uh, we didn't have flight or drones in the early 1900s, and so we don't have anything from a high enough perspective, and, and we didn't have the same sort of uh, riverbanks. Next slide, please. Just want to touch on some of the other engineering works, like most of the rivers in California, the Yuba River was very substantially channelized. The levee systems started in the late 1800s. They grew in size and complexity and ultimate, ultimately got narrower as the land was more valuable outside of those levees and taller. Next slide, please. One of the things to also consider about this massive block of sediment, which we described a little bit ago, is that it didn't just go out onto the floodplain, uh, fall to the bottom, and then start its process of whatever healing that natural processes would allow. Instead, this sediment was dredged and dredged and redredged and redredged. Floating dredges, and there's a picture of one in the lower right hand corner, grew in size and sophistication. The largest ones were almost 100 meters long and would move several thousand. Um, cubic yards of material per day. They ran seven days a week. Um, next slide, please. And I believe Paul, Bra uh, Paul Bradovich is going to pick up for a couple slides here. If you could unmute Paul. Yes, thank you, Tom. Uh, I think the point of your presentation was clear that it was the incredible anthropogenic perturbation of the river. The river was um, a wasteland of slickens and sediment deposition. So what we have faced with here is again, not unlike in condition one, was looking at the rationale uh, associated with the water quality certification for condition 12. I'm gonna start, you know, Steve, talked about inundation. I'm going to talk about connectivity. A recent, relatively recent study by Gervasi and Pasternak, 2019, which is a uh, peer-reviewed article in the Journal of the British Society for Geomorphology, establishes two very important premises. And that was done through comparison of digital elevation models that were constructed in 2008, 14, and 17. The emphasis was comparing DEM or topographic change between 2014 and 2017. Uh, the analyses concluded that the bank full channel, the river defined by the banks, which uh, as, as Beth mentioned, uh, has been defined by Pasternak, Professor Pasternak at UC Davis, as generally being, uh, for characterization purposes, up to 5,000 CFS. But that is not incising. It's not cutting down. It's not disconnecting from the floodplains at all. The conclusion was that it actually is well connected to the floodplains. And in fact, in contrast, the active river valley is found to be down cutting uh, due to the various processes that preferentially scour and down cut the river floodplain instead of the active channel itself. Well, now it is true and the FDIS concludes that the project does moderate flows. But it, available information and recent studies, um, as the one I just described, um, do not support the water quality certification rationale that project flows have reduced connectivity to the floodplain. Next slide, please. Regarding uh, riparian habitat, the uh, available information, which was presented in the technical memorandum for the relicensing process, is that uh, contrary to the water quality certification um, concern, that uh, project flows have suppressed the establishment of the riparian community is not supported by empirical information. Uh, this is a revisualization of the data presented in TM62, 
and it for the index sites that uh, had consistent aerial photography over all of these time periods, 47, 70, 87, and 2010, uh, it demonstrates the change in riparian vegetation coverage over time. Uh, it's important to note in this figure that YRDP was constructed and began operating in 1970. And for these index sites that have consistent aerial photographic representation, you can see that rather than suppressing, the riparian vegetation community is, is recovering from the disturbances Tom pointed out. And in fact, for these sites, the riparian coverage has actually doubled since establishment and operation of the YRDP. So it's hard based on looking at the aerial photographs to come to the same conclusion that project flows have suppressed the riparian uh, community. Um, next slide, please. This slide uh, it demonstrates that um, the YRDP has not uh, adversely affected uh, habitat in, in all respects, certainly not in the respect of water temperature. I know we've been emphasizing the importance of water temperature and I think we'll continue to do so, but implementation of the YRDP turned an inhospitable, terribly disturbed, thermally challenged system into one supporting various populations of anadromous salmonids. These figures represent with and without uh, YRDP. Uh, over the um, analyses that were conducted for the June through August period, and in, at the top figure showing Smartsville, the bottom figure showing Daguerre Point Dam. As you'll remember from our previous discussion, June through August is, represents the um, over summer holding period of pre spawning adult spring run Chinook salmon, but it also represents the over summer rearing period for juvenile spring run as well as steelhead in the lower Yuba River. These figures clearly demonstrate that relative uh, to water temperatures, um, the available information doesn't support the uh, concern expressed in the water quality certification for condition 12 that YRDPs contributes to the low quality and quantity of rearing habitat, which clearly not for water temperature. In fact, if it weren't for the effects of releases of cold hypolimnetic water from New Birds Bar Reservoir, the lower Yuba River would be inhospitable for various life stages of anadromous salmonids. Thank you. Next slide, please. In addition to uh, water temperature, there are physical habitat considerations that we did examine for condition 12. And we've come to the conclusion based on these, again, these exceedance analyses that the project implementation provides substantially more spawning habitat than prior to the YRDP. And it also provides more uh, spring run salmon juvenile rearing habitat to prior to YRDP. Again, I want to emphasize that this is not a FEIS base relative to um, you know condition 1B as we talked about in, in the condition 1B, but this is with and without project. The point of these uh, slides and these presentations is addressing the concern expressed in the water quality certification that the project flows have um, resulted in adverse impacts to the habitat suitability and availability in the lower Yuba River. And uh, that is not supported by these with and without YRDP comparisons. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, I'll turn it back to Tom. Thanks, Paul. In conclusion, we believe the certification does not correctly characterize the attribute the the current habitat conditions and attributes in the Yuba River and it ignores that the mine the mining dredging and levee construction that fundamentally altered the character of the lower Yuba instead we believe that the FERC and Army Corps final environmental impact statement did correctly assess this 
in saying that the, while the project moderates flows, we find that the project has minimal influence over floodplain topography, floodplain connectivity and off-channel habitat availability in the lower Yuba River is largely a result of historical activities unrelated to YRDP operations. We believe that the analysis of data shows that the project has not suppressed riparian community and the project operations have improved habitat and particularly thermal conditions in the lower Yuba River. And so, uh, yeah, I'm gonna stop there and uh, it, be happy to answer any questions uh, when they're posed. Thank you. I think we'll hold questions for the discussion period at the end. So we'll go now to Circle's presentation, and that would be Aaron Settlerman from South Yuba River Citizen League. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me, can everybody hear me? Yep. Excellent. All right, thank you very much. My name is Aaron Zettler-Mann. I'm from the South Yuba River Citizens League. I'm the Watershed Science Director there. I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity to talk to you about Condition 12, Habitat Restoration. Next slide, please. In this presentation, I'll be providing a, some brief context for why restoration is needed due to historical and ongoing impacts. I'll spend some time providing a broad overview of river form, function, and restoration. Then I will address the Water Board's specific questions. I will finish by addressing some of the points made by YCWA and offering some thoughts on restoration in the broader climate change context. Next slide, please. The con hydraulic mining washed millions of cubic yards of sediment into the watershed. These mine tailings ended up in channel and were subsequently washed into the lower Yuba River. This material was subsequently reworked by dredge mining and then pushed into large training walls. What was likely once an anastomosing multi-thread channel prior to the gold rush is now virtually devoid of vegetation, single channel, and confined by large training walls and elevated gravel bars. Next slide. YRDP operations inhibit the natural processes by which the Yuba could restore itself. Rivers are inherently connected. Silts, sands, wood, nutrients, and other material move from the upper portions of the watershed downstream. The dams YRDP rely on prevent this connectivity. Also, flow modification alters the frequency, timing, and duration of floodplain inundation, and alters ramping rates crucial to the Chinook life cycle, as well as other natural processes. In addition, the dams YRDP relies on physically block upstream migration of salmonids from accessing nearly 90% of historical spawning and rearing habitat. Next slide. The lanes balance gives us a framework for understanding how ongoing YRDP operations continue to impact habitat degradation and prevent natural processes, which would have, in the absence of the project, allowed the river to move back towards a healthy ecosystem. During the gold rush, slope and water availability in the lower Yuba remained relatively natural, but there was far more material and coarser material being delivered to the channel, more material than the energy could move. As Tom pointed out, this triggered a lot of channel aggradation. With YRDP operations, the slope and this excess sediment remained the same as post gold rush, but the amount of water and timing is altered. This modified hydrology and disconnectivity in the system mean the river isn't able to rework and transport the material available as frequently, restoring natural processes. Dams mean that during high flows, when gravels are mobile, the woods, sands, and other sediment are blocked. So the channel further erodes bars and training walls and becomes more disconnected from the elevated floodplain surfaces, which are characterized by homogeneity and denuded ecosystem function. Next slide, please. To help with some of these definitions, when we talk about bankful, we're referring to the discharge at which the channel is full, but prior to spilling out onto the floodplain. The floodplain then is the wide, generally flat area adjacent to the main channel, 
which begins to inundate at flows above bankful. In the lower Yuba River, when talking about important habitat features, we are referring to side channels, backwater areas, and lowered floodplains. The goal is to increase the area of high primary productivity and low velocity refugia during the rear end portion of the Chinook life cycle and create additional perennially wet, wetted areas. The ecotone then refers to the transition area between the terrestrial and river systems. We can think of the myriad side channels, backwater areas, and lowered floodplain services as comprising the ecotone of the river. It is likely that pre-Europeans, the Lower Yuba River was an anastomosing channel, meaning a single main dominant channel with multiple side channels and backwater areas, which were perennially wet and were broken up by heavily vegetated, largely stable islands. Next slide, please. Broadly speaking, the goal of restoration in the Lower Yuba River is to recreate the function of an anastomosing channel form within the constraints of connectivity loss due to YRDP structures and operations and lateral confinement from training walls in the legacy of gold mining. Restore, restoration in the Lower Yuba River is largely focused on rearing habitat for spring and fall run Chinook. In the absence of flow modification, the objective is to construct habitat which inundates more frequently, offering an increase in food availability. Flow management can significantly increase the benefits of this habitat through the timing, duration, and ramping rates to benefit juvenile rearing as well as spawning salmon. Remember, the longer a surface is inundated, the more benefit it offers to the rearing salmonids and steelhead when it comes to food availability and decreased competition. Next slide, please. When we think about restoration in the Lower Yuba River, we tend to talk about lowering floodplains and increasing the frequency of inundation. It is important to remember that simply because an area of river is lower in elevation than it used to be does not necessarily mean it meets the habitat needs of salmonids at various life stages. In these photos, we see constructed side channels, channels with willow plantings. Lowering the floodplain increases the frequency with which it is flooded, but vegetation is also required to provide additional high water refugia and increase food availability. These ecosystem benefits are directly related to the frequency, timing, and duration of this inundation, all under the control of YRDP. Next slide, please. As an example of, next slide, please. Thank you. As an example of restoration's ability to jumpstart natural processes, we can look at Hammond Bar project from 2012. Here, we see the growth of planted riparian willow species and the recruitment of some fine sediment and vet natural vegetation recruitment downstream. Next slide, please. We also see that this project is durable to high water. Here, seeing the complete inundation of the bar area in 2017 with little to no impact on vegetation. During this flood event and this above bank flood, blend, flood event, juveniles hid in low velocity pockets behind the planted willows and enjoyed increased food availability offered by the additional vegetation. The point here is that restoration projects help jumpstart the natural processes within the channel and are resilient to high water. Next slide, please. The board had two questions for the NGOs. The first asked about how recommended flows related to habitat restoration in terms of benefit. The second asked how the number of ac acres recommended came to be. Next slide. Without the CDF and W flow recommendations, the full benefits of restoration will not be realized. However, some marginal benefits would be realized without the flow recommendations, albeit less frequently, and with less benefit to the full ecosystem. Channel restoration benefits are tied to timing and duration of inundation, as well as ramping rates. In the simple schematic here, in A, we can see a no flow, no restoration state. This is most of the Lower Yuba River today. There is not much habitat available at flows at and below bank full, which means there is limited rearing habitat and high competition for space and food. In B, we see restoration, but no flows. The new side channel and backwater areas are available, but flow availability, timing, and duration are not optimized to match the life cycle needs of spring and fall run Chinook, nor the ecosystem more generally. This is the restoration actions, but no flow modification scenario. And in C, we see restoration and flows. 
Here, we have the same amount of new habitat area, but the flows are managed to maximize the benefits of juveniles through the timing, duration, and volume of water released. It is not simply the total acres of available habitat which is important. When, how, and at what rates water is released through YRDP operations are also crucial to the Chinook life cycle. Next slide, please. The restoration recommendations for 340 acres of restored off-channel, side-channel, backwater, and floodplain habitat with the goal of increasing the availability area of ooh, availability of area for juvenile rearing salmon and increasing food availability. Modeling efforts assumed a Schedule II water year and that YRDP operations alter flow within the Lower Yuma River. Two models were used. The acre days analysis, which you'll hear about more from Stephanie Millsap shortly, and the HEC EFM model, which was run by Gary Reedy, formerly of Circle. Next slide, please. The HEC EFM model is designed to help teams determine the ecosystem responses to changes in the flow regime of a river or connected wetland. This table looks at some of the results of this model. The columns are the duration of inundation of available habitat and flood frequency return interval, the number or the area of inundation under a Schedule II water year, and the area of inundation using the CDF and W flow recommendations. Note that the acres in this table are in addition to the 514 acres during base flow, as referenced in the bottom uh, row. Utilizing the CDF and W flow recommendations and based on channel form in 2012, the two major takeaways here are one, that under all scenarios, there is an increase in habitat availability. And two, that under the most beneficial inundation duration, that is 60 days, and most frequent return interval, we see a more than 300% increase in available habitat. It is important to remember that these benefits do not include the th recommended 340 additional acres of habitat necessary to mitigate for the unavailable habitat due to YRDP operations as determined through the acre days analysis. Next slide, please. Habitat restoration is necessary to mitigate for YRDP impacts on habitat in the lower Yuba River. And the recommendations here represent a minimum when we think about how the climate is likely to change moving forward. These graphs from a 2010 paper by Null, Veers, and Mount illustrate future conditions across the Sierra Nevada under two, four, and six degrees of warming. The Yuba watershed is highlighted in red. These graphs on the left show on top that the central timing of runoff in the Yuba could shift between two and four weeks earlier in the year. And on the bottom, that a decrease in millions of acre feet of runoff between 12,000 and 70,000 could occur, depending on warming scenarios. The series of graphs on the right express vulnerability of the watershed as a function of available water storage to water availability. Note that the Yuba tends to be more vulnerable to climate change under all climate scenarios than similar watersheds in the Sierra Nevada. Considering the likely impact that climate change will have on availability and timing of flows in the Yuba watershed, and the time it takes for restoration projects to occur and riparian vegetation to mature, it is crucial that the proposed restoration and flow suggestions be implemented immediately. Because natural ecotone habitat features are limited in the Lower Yuba River, and it is not practical to manage flows such that they engage the existing features, it is crucial that we construct additional areas of high quality habitat and make the necessary adjustments to flow we can to maximize those benefits. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. In a number of places in YCWA's reconsideration document, and notably in section 4.2, YCWA claims that they are being held solely responsible for habitat restoration. It is important for the board to know that this is factually untrue. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service through the AFRP, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, and Wildlife Conservation Board are all actively funding restoration in the Lower Yuba River today. Throughout their document, and notably in section three, and in the previous presentation, YCWA claims that conditions were worse in the Lower Yuba River prior to the construction of the YRDP. This was true at the time and well documented. CDF and W, among others, recognized that degraded habitat as early as the beginning of the 1950s, and at that time, 
it was thought that the YRDP may help. However, if we look at salmon numbers over the last 50 years, we see a steady decline. Clearly, the YRDP operations and the necessary infrastructure creates an impediment to fish recovery. Next slide, please. To summarize, the recommended habitat restoration should serve as a minimum in the lower Yuba River. As drier years and a more rain-dominated hydrograph become more common, it is crucial to construct habitat which offers benefits across a wide range of flow scenarios and manage water to maximize the benefits of that habitat across the Samonid life cycle. Contrary to what YCWA would like you to believe, Chinook presence in the Yuba River has been on the decline since the 1950s. We are getting further and further away from the AFRP's doubling goal every year and when drought occurs, and we expect drought conditions to occur more frequently in the future, numbers are even worse. Thus, the restoration and flow recommendations are a minimum if we want any hope of survival for Chinook. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next up, we have the presentation from CDFW, and that will be Stephanie and Millsap that will be presenting their Condition 12 presentation. Stephanie, can you raise your hand so it's easy to unmute you? Good morning, everyone. I hope that you can hear me now. Yep. Yes, we can. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Stephanie Millsap. I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I conducted the cumulative acre day analysis that was used as the foundation for the 10J condition regarding restoring juvenile rearing habitat in the lower Yuba River that was filed with FERC. Next slide, please. Today's presentation is meant to address the State Water Board's questions regarding the underlying rationale and methods used for the analysis and how that analysis was used to develop the restoration proposal as outlined in the 10J. Next slide, please. The timing, duration, and magnitude of water flowing through a river is known to directly impact a wide variety of biological and ecological processes. When identifying the various ways in which the project affects fish and wildlife resources, we spend a lot of time looking at how the project impacts flows through the lower Yupa River. This figure is based on relicensing efforts and shows modeled average flow by month for over 30 years. The top green line is a model of what flows would have been in the lower Yuba if it were unregulated, meaning that there were no facilities at all within the watershed. The middle line shows what flows would have been in the lower Yuba River if every other facility in the Yuba watershed were operational, except for YRDP. Therefore, this is called the without project hydrology. Finally, the lowest line on the figure shows what flows would be like on the lower Yuba with the other projects and the YRDP project. And so it's called the with project hydrology. It is this overall decrease in flows in the lower Yuba River from the without project hydrology to with project hydrology that we analyzed. Next slide, please. There's a wide body of scientific literature detailing how regulation of a of a river's flow impacts the aquatic and riparian habitats, including reducing overall connectivity. It's these types of broad ecosystem impacts that we were especially interested in trying to address when developing our 10J. Next slide, please. We chose to use a cumulative acre day analysis in order to quantify how different flow proposals would impact inundation on the lower Yuba River. The acre day analysis incorporates inundation along different reaches of the river and varying inundation durations. This analysis also has the benefit of being able to be used to quantify how many acres of restoration are warranted. Next slide, please. 
The data sets generated for relicensing were robust and were used as the basis for how inundation was quantified. I used the stage discharge model to compute total wetted area in combination with flow data output from the operations model <clears throat> in order to identify how much area was inundated each day for the without project, with project, which is the AFLA um, flow proposal, as well as the agency and geo flow proposals. In order to conduct the acre day analysis, the service identified at what flows inundation of ecologically important areas, such as the bank ecotone and side channel <clears throat> habitats begin. We also narrowed the timing to when juvenile Chinook salmon were most likely to be present in the lower Yupa River. Next slide, please. This figure is meant to help visually show how the acre day analysis is conducted. I applied the relationship between flow and acres that are inundated for each day and then sum them across all the reaches. Then the acres that were inundated each day from February 1st to June 15th are added to get the cumulative acre days inundated for each year. So if you take a look at the slide, uh, you'll see that in parts of February, flows were above a little bit over 4,000 CFS, which corresponded to each day uh, just over 200 acres being inundated. And so each one of those days are then summed across that entire time period for in 1972 to equal 16,066 cumulative acre days for that year. And as you can see, both shorter inundation periods as well as longer periods are incorporated into the cumulative acre day total. Next slide, please. When comparing the cumulative acre days from hydrology resulting from the project flow proposal to the without project hydrology, it's clear that not only does the AFLA flows reduce inundation overall, but also across all what <clears throat> The AFLA flows reduces inundation across all water year types, but it has a progressively greater impact on inundation during the drier water year types. So you can see that in Schedule 1 water years, the project reduces inundation by, by 9%. In Schedule 2, the project reduces inundation by 39% compared to without, without project. And during Schedule 3 to 7 water years, the project reduces inundation by 80%. Next slide, please. These figures show the comparison of cumulative acre days by month of the project proposal compared to the agency and geoflow proposal for a Schedule 1 and a Schedule 2 water year. The agency flow proposal increases inundation for rearing juvenile salmonids in March to a much greater extent in April compared to the AFLA or the YRDP project hydrology. Next slide, please. Now that I've provided some background into how the acre day analysis was conducted and some of the results, I wanna focus on how that analysis was used in developing the rearing habitat 10J recommendation. And also that the restoration action <clears throat> that the restoration recommendations are based on known actions that improve rearing conditions. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. The agency NGO flow proposal does result in more cumulative acre days than the AFLA flow proposal. However, the agency flow proposal doesn't result in as much inundation as there would have been under without the as under the without project hydrology. Therefore, there's still a need for mitigation. We chose to mitigate based on the Schedule II water year water year type because of how much the project is able to exert control over flows in the lower Yuba River compared to Schedule I water year types. In the way that we chose to mitigate was by lowering surfaces adjacent to the main stem channel for better connectivity 
that would also increase off-channel rearing habitat for fry and juvenile salmonids. Therefore, rather than solely increasing flows to bring fish up to the habitat, we've proposed lowering those surfaces to bring habitat down to where the river is expected to be under the agency NGO flow proposal. And mitigation would be achieved when the median number of cumulative acre days of the agency flow proposal in conjunction with surface lowering is equal to the median number of cumulative acre days of the without project hydrology. <clears throat> Next slide, please. While there, are, uh, while there were other components of the 10J restoration measure, the State Water Board's questions dealt primarily with the 340 acres of surface lowering. Next slide, please. As part of that method, I modified the, start, the stage discharge model results to change in what reaches along the lower Yuba River would inundate and how that lowering occurs. Most of the lowering occurs so that the lowered surfaces start becoming inundated at flows corresponding to the higher spring flows provided by the agency NGO flow proposal that occurs during schedule one and schedule two water year types. So using this proposal, an additional 119 acres in the Hallwood reach would become inundated. And of these 109, and of these 119 acres, 35% of them would become would begin inundated at approximately two, at 2,000 CFS. Another 30% would become would begin inundated at 2,500 CFS, and the final 25% would begin inundated at 3,000 CFS. Next slide, please. This figure highlights results from the Schedule II water year types. It shows the cumulative acre days by year for the without project, the project or the AFLA flow proposal, as the agency flow proposal, and the agency NGO flow proposal in conjunction with surface lowering. Although you can see there's variation among the years, the agency NGO flow proposal in conjunction with the 340 acres of surface lowering does mitigate for the project's changes in inundation during schedule two water year types. I haven't done an analysis to identify how many acres would need to be lowered to mitigate using the AFLA's flow proposal. However, looking at the number of cumulative acre days for the YRDP flow proposal, in the agency NGO flow proposal, I would expect that there would be more than 340 acres that would need to be lowered to fully mitigate for the project's impacts to inundation. Next slide, please. Numerous efforts have been undertaken throughout the years to identify restoration actions to benefit salmonids in the lower Yuba River. And these efforts can serve as a foundation to develop a plan to implement the 10J recommendations. Next slide, please. In order to answer your questions regarding costs, I thought that it would be helpful to see a summary of some of the other restoration projects that the service has helped fund and implement, both in the Yuba River and other rivers in California's Central Valley. These restoration projects are similar in that their goal was to better connect a regulated river to the adjacent floodplain habitat while also increasing and improving juvenile rearing habitat. Next slide, please. The 10J filed with FERC included a recommended timeline. We assumed that, the, that FERC would issue a license for 40 years. Our desire in having the restoration projects completed by year 20 was for there to be high quality functional habitat in place and providing benefits to some for salmonids for at least half of the new license term. Next slide, please. 
So this presentation has only scratched the surface of how the acre day analysis was conducted. Therefore, in this slide, I've also included some other references for you that go into greater detail regarding that analysis. Thank you so much for your time today and allowing me to present some of the information about this analysis. And I'm happy to try and answer your any questions that you might have. Thank you. So I think we'll go now similar like we did before um, when we were in the discussion period. So, um, YCWA, we have about five minutes if you have any questions you'd like to ask any of the other petitioners. Just raise your hand, please, and let us know. Looks like Ryan would like to say something if we could unmute Ryan. I, I don't believe we have questions. Uh, we've submitted substantial technical materials in writing, unless okay. any of the presenters um, disagree with me. I'm not seeing any other hands from YCWA. So let's go to the NGOs. Um, do the NGOs have any questions for the other petitioners based on what we saw today? Not seeing any hands. Okay, then we'll ask CDFW or Stephanie Millsap if they have any questions they'd like to direct to any of the other petitioners. I think you're unmuted, Stephanie, but I could be wrong. I am unmuted, sorry. I wasn't expecting to speak on behalf of CDFW. Uh, no, CDFW does not have other questions. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we'll turn it over to State Water Board staff and other representatives if they have any questions. Um, I guess I can go first. Um, <laughs> thank you guys again for continuing to share um, and clarify your petition items in today's presentations. Um, I think I'll flip the order and the questions this time, and I'll start with um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so in your presentation, um, you walked through your model results for the different scheduled years in which and how, how much the project would reduce um, floodplain connectivity based upon the modeling that you did. Um, and your, your slide showed a division of a schedule one, a schedule three, but you lumped, or sorry, a schedule one and a schedule two, but you lumped the results of schedules three through seven. Um, and then you provided a separate metric of a percent across all years. And so I'm curious why you did that lumping for schedules three through seven. So I did that lumping of schedules three through seven because of how so few water year types there are of those type across the record. So I believe that the, and I'm sure that others will correct me that uh, schedule one water years typically make up um, approximately half of uh, the water year types within the total number of years that there's hydrology for. Schedule two is about 25% of those years. And then schedules three through seven make up the remainder 25%. And so just having a couple years of a schedule three, a schedule four, five, six, or those conference years um, didn't seem to be a very good way to present that data. And so we wanted to look at what, uh, how, what the decrease in inundation was not only across all water year types, but then also specifically at the, as you get progressively drier. Did That's that help. answer your question? It does, it's helpful. Um, and I'll 
make my own uh, statement based upon my understanding of the water year types. And if anyone has a better understanding, please correct me because I, I believe we haven't we haven't actually seen a Schedule Six or worse in the Yuba system. I think the worst we've seen is a Schedule what like five during the last drought, or that might have even been a four. So it's just that was part of my curiosity for the lumping. So. Oh, Steve has his hand up. Hopefully, it's a. Uh, to set this straight. <laughs> yeah, uh, <clears throat> uh, 2015 was a schedule six year. Oh, it was, sorry, thank you. Um, so my other question for US Fish and Wildlife is um, floodplain inundation is one tool for restoration. Um, and I think that's a general understanding and there could be other tools that are done in substitution for or in conjunction with. Um, and so, I was just curious if there has been any exploration in looking at different restoration tools outside of floodplain inundation to achieve the targets and goals that the model that you've ran is looking for. Yeah, so the uh, proposal that we have is not only uh, those increasing flows in the springtime to increase inundation, but it's in conjunction with the restoration proposal which is to lower surfaces down so that they can become inundated at lower flows. And it takes into account the reality of the situation that we're not living in a system of without projects, but that we need to bring habitat down to where fish are. And so they work in conjunction with one another. And also as Aaron stated, it's not just the traditional floodplain habitat of the above bank fault bankful areas. We're also looking at those ecotone areas of those off-channel rearing habitat side channels and so forth. And also when you look at the restoration proposal, it's not just lowering surfaces and that's it. It's also making sure that we're planting those surfaces as well and jumpstarting that uh, vegetation processes as well to be able to provide cover and additional food for juvenile salmonids as well. Thank you. Um, and to try and summarize CDFW's concerns um, in their petition with condition 12, um, is it that, because what condition 12 does is it, as currently written, is it re requires Yuba to develop a restoration plan in consultation with different entities that looks at various options for restoration in the river. Um, but it does not prescribe metric, like a solid metric for floodplain inundation or other items. And is that kind of the core to CDFW's concern with condition 12? Um, can we unmute either Beth Lawson or actually, can you unmute? Bree has her hand up. Okay, thank Bree you. That was... <laughs> And if, if we could unmute Beth Lawson too, she can speak to it um, with more experience. But Parker, yes, my my um, our perspective is putting quantifiable attainable metrics in there will help um, help kind of make it real, make the restoration implementable um, with concrete targets that were justified based on mitigating per project impacts, impacts that were directly associated with the project and, and not peripheral other, other like previous historical um, impacts. But Beth, uh, would you like to elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, I think I would just say that it's our experience that going to a post licensing monitoring plan that has to be established later, um, it's difficult to come to consensus. And so having a metric um, right now written in your, um, your certification would make it so that we can try to write a plan later, but that we have metrics to try to achieve. Thank you. Um, so then my other questions are for Yuba Water Agency. Um, and I understand the concerns that were raised um, in relation to the rationale of the CERT, but I, I would like to seek some clarification on Yuba Water Agency's um, concern or opinion or thoughts on condition 12 um, and restoration in general. Is Yuba Water Agency's view that Condition 12 or restoration in association with the YRDP isn't appropriate, or is there a more specific issue with Condition 12 itself, such as you know an undefined metric? Hmm. 
I wonder if we should unmute Tom because I think he was the presenter previously or maybe Willie because Willie turned his camera on. I would note when people raise their hands for our view, it jumps you to the front so we can quickly see and unmute. Go ahead, Willie, I think you're unmuted. Okay, thank you. So you can hear me? Yes. Okay, excellent. So, yeah, I mean, our concern is is the nexus. I mean, Tom talked about it in his um, in his presentation, and the the major impacts to the Lower Yuba River are were caused by hydraulic mining. Um, we see the Lower Yuba River as an absolute opportunity for salmon, and that's why we provide flows. And we're cons we're concerned about uh, the fish species always. I mean, if you Chris Chris touched on it early on, um, he showed. One of his slides, all the diversions in the Yuba watershed, um, well, he showed most of the diversions in the Yuba watershed. Um, the Yuba Water Agency is the only entity that actually provides flow in the Lower, Lower Yuba River for specifically for salmon habitat. And um, you know, we're, we, we would like to see the salmon species uh, survive and be successful, but we don't see the nexus to our project. We already provide the lifeblood we already provide that through our existing um, our existing flows so um, we don't see a, a need to prescribe that in a water quality search. Thank you. Um, my next question is, you know, when it comes to habitat, such as how we're discussing it for the Lower Yuba River, I think a lot of factors go into what is habitat, you know, and it's a combination of a lot of things like sediment large woody material, flow, floodplain connectivity, vegetation. Um, and the Yuba River project does control flows in that section of the river and does have an impact on large woody material. And so I was curious if, if there was any, I guess you're, you're clarifying that the Yuba's concern is there isn't a nexus and I'm trying to raise that given that the project has interactions with large woody material and sediment out of new, the North Yuba River, as well as flow, wouldn't those be components of a restoration project? Or, or wouldn't those be components that you could look at in restoration actions? Um, and it doesn't have to be a target on floodplain inundation, but it could be other items that occur in the lower Yuba River. Looks like Willie's trying Let to talk. Let us unmute Willie you, Willie. Un unmuted. You should be unmuted now, Willie. Okay, thanks. So, Parker, I think you're asking about uh, sediment and woody debris, and you know, are those components of a restoration action? And yes, we believe they are. Thank you. I mean, uh, another piece of the FEIS, because Tom was reading a piece of it in relation to uh, FERC and Army Corps' determination on restoration. Um, and I was reading through that myself, and there is a statement that aquatic and riparian habitat in the Lower Yuba River has been slowly recovering from a variety of historic disturbances tied to hydraulic mining, dam building by the federal government for sediment and flood control, as well as channelization. And while the majority of these existing habitat conditions are unrelated to project YRDP operations, project operations does affect the quantity and quality of available salmon and steelhead rearing habitat by altering the natural flow and water temperature regime. The project also blocks the downstream movement of large woody material and coarse sediment, both of which are key components of complex spawning and rearing habitat. And so I, I just, I was just trying to think back to that condition 12 as currently written is requiring consultation to look at a variety of actions, floodplain, inundation, as well as large woody material, plantings, other habitat improvement options. Um, and as Yuba was pointing back to the FEIS, um, there is materials in there that is drawing some links that the project may have a contribution. Yeah, Parker. Um... So I think you also need to look at the benefits the project provides. Um, you know, you can, you can look at inundation in the springtime and then you can look at temperatures in the summertime. And 
what, what do we provide? I mean, in a year like this, we're providing three times the, the amount of flow today that would be naturally in the river. So there's a benefit to the Yuba River Development Project, even as it exists today. Some of the slides that Aaron showed, those are under existing conditions. You know, you saw inundation under existing flow regimes today. I'll remind everyone that the, U, the New Bullards Bar Reservoir is not on the main stem of the Yuba River. You know, we aren't the only ones that control flow through the, through the lower Yuba River. And I'll say again, we're the only ones that provide flow specifically designed for salmon habitat or that species. So, um, and then Aaron made a point, and Aaron, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth here, but that, um, you know, we feel that we're being, um, you know, we're being caused to be in charge of, a, you know, an entire restoration plan in the lower Yuba. And that's how we feel. There's no, if this water quality cert, this condition went through, we would be the only ones that are regulatorily required to develop a plan in the lower Yuba River for restoration. While I'll agree, and we partner with many of you on this meeting with habitat enhancement, we would be the only ones that are regulatorily required to. And there are many other users in the Yuba watershed. And I think a, a holistic analysis needs to be done. And, and truly, don't just pin this on the Yuba Water Agency. We, we are providing the flows and we do do habitat restoration and we do partner with others. And we think it's unreasonable to, to pin an entire restoration plan on us. But we're happy to collaborate and develop something. And we are doing that today. Thank you. And I would just give some clarity from the CERT's perspective. You know, the, when, we, when we consider a project's impacts, it's not a consideration of what, went, what occurred in the past, but it's the current impact that's occurring as related to, you know, water quality standards. And so I don't think it's our intent to make any one entity responsible for anything outside of their project's impact. Um, and so I guess the last question I would ask is given the North Yuba River has New Bullard's Bar on it and New Bullard's Bar doesn't train a decent amount of wood and sediment that would have otherwise gone downstream through the lower Yuba River, isn't isn't there any thought that the project may have some need or impact on habitat in the Lower Yuba River as a result of that operation? Well, actually, Englebright Reservoir, the Army Corps dam, would, would, in, would stop the, the sediment and woody debris. Unless wood were to fill in or were to top the dam. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Hi, um, Aaron Ragazzi. I have a broader question um, that I'm interested in feedback from, I think, all three petitioners on. Um, we heard about pre-1970 and post-1970 operations um, and how they impacted how different folks think they impacted the, the watershed as a whole. Um, YCWA indicated that there's been an increase in riparian vegetation post-1970 with the operation of the Yuba River Development Project. Um, I think the other presentations indicated that there's an ongoing need for vegetation. Um, I'm curious how we're defining riparian vegetation in terms of the increase relative to what the different parties are talking about. Um, it seems like there's riparian vegetation that occurs, you know, higher up in the watershed that provides, or not on the banks that provide shade versus habitat within um, bars and within the stream system. So I'm curious when um, YCWA is talking about an increase in riparian vegetation which metric is being used to measure that riparian vegetation, um, or maybe it's both. Um, and then when the other parties spoke about the needs for vegetation, how that relates to it. So I see Paul wanting to respond to that question. And if um, any of the NGO or um, other parties want to, please raise your hand. Thank you. Go. And Stephanie, I'll, we'll come to you after Paul. Thank you. 
Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Have I been unmuted? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I can at least start and provide a partial answer to your question. Um, what is the definition or what was the consideration regarding riparian vegetation? Where is it in, in relative to the, to the channel and such? And the information that I presented was based upon index sites for uh, reaches longitudinally distributed along the lower Yuba River. Um, each uh, index site was uh, selected to represent a range of channel and habitat types in the entire study area, which was the segment level, which is the entire lower Yuba River. And perhaps answering more clearly your question, each site was 20 times the average bank full width, as I recall from uh, the technical memorandum. So it extended out away from the actual wetted perimeter um, and incorporated that uh, larger area. Uh, and again, I can check that in TM6-2, but that's my recollection. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie, did you still want to talk? Otherwise, yeah. Okay, and then Aaron will go to you next. Yep, and so, you know, similar to what Paul said, I think that the areas that they were looking at at increased veg riparian vegetation included areas that were become inundated at flows of over 100,000 CFS. And so when we're looking at being able to get that riparian corridor closer, we want it closer to where the river actually is so that you can start to have more of those natural processes of both shading as well as as that would as those trees get older and they fall over you're starting to get natural recruitment of large wood back into the river and restoring some of those natural processes that would occur um, and so it's in part a difference of where that where though the vegetation is occurring and um, I think Aaron can also speak to the amount of vegetation that is kind of closer to the riverside, um, the main stem channel, and at flows in which the lower Yuba uh, normally experiences, especially during schedule two water years, and even some of the drier schedule one water year types and lower. And so not just having access to those high floodplain areas during the wettest of the wet water years, but also making sure that there's habitat available for juvenile salmonid rearing in the drier water year types as well, so that each salmon cohort has food and cover available to it. And so I will, looks like Aaron's got his hand up next. So I'll let him go. Yeah, thank you. Um, so one of the things that I want to lead with is that simply because vegetation is growing doesn't mean that it is because of YRDP operations. Vegetation and some natural recruitment of native and invasive species ha began to happen, you know, once we started dumping uh, mine tailings on the floodplain. So, uh, you know, there's a, a correlation versus causation uh, discussion there. And to kind of emphasize and reiterate some of what Stephanie has, it's not just floodplain and riparian vegetation at these above bankful flows that is above roughly 5,000 CFS that we're interested in. We also need vegetation close to the channel um, using some of the imagery that I, in one of my slides, that shows that newly constructed channel, we want vegetation all the way up to that water at low water so that the benefits of mature um, woody riparian vegetation, so willows and cottonwoods can provide shade and the sort of trophic levels for um, plenty ample food for juvenile salmonids kind of throughout the life cycle and year round. And then that wood also falls into the channel creating mid-channel bars and islands and ultimately that more anastomosing channel type that we believe the lower Yuba was prior to uh, the gold rush and European involvement. Does that offer clarity? Are there anything, anything else I can explain or anybody no, else? No, I, I appreciate the input from all parties on this topic. Um, is there anything else anyone wanted to add based on the discussion we've had just now? 
or is there any more state water board questions at this time? If not, we get to go to lunch, so. Looks like we have a vote for lunch. So Kristen, when are we supposed to be back from lunch? Double check the agenda, 120. Okay, everyone, I hope you have a great lunch and we'll see you back here at 120. Thank you. Thanks everyone.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, I think we're gonna jump right into our presentation from YCWA on condition six. And if we could unmute, it looks like Jim Lynch, we can get started. All right, Jim. Okay, thank you. We can hear you, go ahead. Great, thank you very much. I could have the first slide. Thank you. My name is Jim Lynch. I am a fisheries biologist with HDR supporting YSWA. I've been involved in the Uber River uh, upstream and downstream of YRDP for the last 25 years. Next slide, please. Uh, today, we're really focusing not on whether Loman uh, Ridge Tunnel should be closed or not, but how often. Uh, the state board has a condition, uh, condition six, which requires additional closures as compared to the closure that YSWA proposed and that FERC, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the uh, Forest Service all proposed. And that's really the difference we'll be focusing on today. And to give you a highlight of some of those differences between them, if you uh, slide two shows you the main differences. So with they both close the tunnels uh, between April and September in the spring and October and December in the fall, typically called spring and fall tunnel closures. But you can see that when they close them is slightly different, the triggers, which we spent a lot of time on during uh, with stakeholders during the relicensing. So the tunnel closures uh, under the uh, I'll call it the FEIS condition, basically is when the flows are at a certain, le uh, flows are a certain level, we're at wet water year, and New Bulls Bar storage is at a certain level. And the reason we did that is because the goal initially and moving forward on this was try not to divert water from the middle Yuba River to the North Yuba River and then just spill it there, leave it in the middle Yuba River and let it uh, do benefits there. Condition six would have closed it in both wet water years and above normal water years. The forecast is also slightly different. Uh, the DWR, I'm sorry, the uh, YCWA forecast would be start in April, start the tunnel closures that would trigger it, where the uh, condition six, the water quality cert, is actually in March. Also, there's some other differences as we go through in the spring. Uh, but one thing is that the water quality condition six allows the tunnel to be reopened if the forecasts are different uh, for below normal drier years. And in terms of the fall closures, the main difference is that the uh, FERC, the FEIS closure was below normal or wetter water years with again an end of September storage to preserve uh, water storage in drier years where the condition six requires a tunnel closure in all water years. Next slide, please. Uh, so to take a look at this more closely, uh, and this is a model run that we made very early in the relicensing, uh, but we looked at the 41-year uh, model during the relicensing, and we triggered uh, when both conditions would occur, and at least the tunnel closures in spring we found under the FEIS would occur in uh, 12 year, uh, would occur in 12 years with condition six, as compared to eight years with the FEIS condition, and obviously with the uh, uh, condition six, the tunnel would be closed in all 41 years we looked at as compared to 24 years with the FEIS condition. Now, why, why is this being proposed? Uh, the water quality cert didn't really go into details, but uh, pointed towards the uh, CDFW's condition. And CDFW's condition at page 150 basically says they uh, want to avoid, um, it's because it makes a little sense for the licensee to divert water just to spill it at New Bullards. Also, they thought that these were peak periods for protection of, of entrainment. And also they said this would add very little economic impact to the overall uh, cost of the measure. Next slide. In terms of the spring tunnel closures, if above normal water years were uh, included, as you can see, I, I mentioned earlier, there were four, four years, and these are the four years. And what you see here is the amount of water that would be diverted in the spring. 
uh, how much water is spilling from uh, New Village Bar Dam during that period. And then on the last column to the right is how much water would actually remain in uh, New Village Bar Reservoir for power generation. And as you can see, there's a considerable amount of water that remains. And every year, except one, 2000, uh, a good portion of the water remains in storage. In fact, the uh, majority of the water in some, in some years remains in storage. So this water wouldn't just be uh, wouldn't just be spilled at New Bullets Bar, but it would add to generation at New Bullets Bar Reservoir. Go to the next slide. Thank you. In terms of the fall tunnel closures, uh, one concern that uh, YCWA had is that the fall tunnel closures are somewhat indiscriminate and they close the tunnel in critically dry and dry water years. So they don't allow storage. Uh, and if you look to the left, you'll see the years where the fall tunnel closures would occur. We've organized them by water year type, uh, critically dry to wet. And the end of the September New Bullets Bar storage, which would have triggered it under YWA's condition for not closing the tunnel uh, and what the elevation was. And then lastly, how much water would be lost from storage in New Bullets Bar Reservoir. Next slide. Uh, so uh, I also want to address the question asked by the state board. They asked one question regarding this, and it dealt with how did YWA estimate the cost for the impact of this? Well, what we did was run five models, uh, five runs of the same model, I should say. One was at a baseline, which is basically uh, existing conditions uh, at the, in 2007. That's the environmental baseline for the relicensing as for other environmental procedures as we're moving forward this relicensing process and associated processes. So we had the baseline which said this is the this is what's going on today. And then we ran the baseline with all the conditions exactly the same except we added YWA's spring tunnel closures. Then we ran it again a third time with baseline exactly the same but we used the CDFW tunnel closures which are the same as condition 6. We ran it a fourth time with YCWA fall, a fifth time with uh, CDFW's fall. And we looked at each one of those to see what the differences were compared to the baseline. Baseline the zero out. And what we found basically was under the spring tunnel closures with YCWA's and uh, FEIS conditions, the overall annual cost, and I should point out the way we did that, we ran the model for the 41 years, came up with a generation cost, compared it to baseline, subtracted out the baseline, which gave us the cost of the condition. And then we divided that by 41, the number of years in the model run to come up with an average annual cost, which is basically how uh, FERC does a lot of its costing information. So we came up with the FEIS flow at about $418,000 average annual cost for springtime. The condition six, Remember, four additional years was 763. The difference between the two was 345, 480. So it almost, it doesn't double the cost of the springtime for those of four additional years, but it's uh, probably 70%, 80% of it. The fall tunnel closures weren't quite as impactful. Uh, the FEIS by itself was 255 and the condition six was 393. So the difference was around 138,000. So to come up with an overall cost, we combined the two. So for the overall YWA uh, uh, FEIS cost, the total cost over 50 years, taking the average annual cost, some spring and fall, multiplying it by 50, gave you around $33.5 million. That's what we assume to be the cost for the measure as uh, YWA has and is in the FEIS. Excuse me. <clears throat> the condition six, had a cost of around $58 million for the two. So about $25 million more. Uh, and what we looked at was that's $25 million more and it's focusing primarily on four additional years of closure and closing all the, all the time in the fall. Uh, one thing I wanna point out here is that these costs are all in 2017 dollars. Uh, if you escalated these costs to current dollars or dollars out in the future, it would obviously be much higher. Also, we ran these against the baseline. So uh, we did not run them against all the other conditions 
as baseline in the FEIS or the water quality cert. These are all ran against the environmental baseline to isolate just these costs. Uh, so with that said, uh, we think the tunnel closure should be uh, moved back to uh, what was proposed in the FEIS. Uh, the cost is very, very high, $33.5 million just for what's in the FEIS. And when you add in the additional cost of the closures, almost $25 million for the additional benefits, uh, perceived benefits, that adds up to an awful, awful lot of cost for somewhat of undefined impact. And just to get into that, just a little bit more in closing, uh, keep in mind that what we're protecting here, and I'm not trying to diminish the resource in any way whatsoever, but there are no ESA listed species in the area of the tunnel closure. Uh, there are no anadromous fish in the area of the tunnel closure. There are no fish that migrate in the area of the tunnel closure. Um, uh, contrary to what some people say, migro, my, uh, rainbow trout are not a migratory species. They can complete their entire life cycle without migrating. They do move around as all fish do. Uh, secondly, any entrained fish would not be injured or suffer mortality uh, that, that, and that they wouldn't be going through a powerhouse, a cone valve or anything like that. They'd be displaced from the middle Yuba River to Oregon Creek or potentially to New, Bull New Bullets Bar Reservoir. Third, there's not a unique fishery there. There's, it's a rainbow trout transitional fishery, which means there's trout, suckers, other, other fish species in that area. So it's not a cold water, classic cold water habitat. The temperatures in the summer uh, routinely get up above 20 degrees in July and August. Uh, hey, Jim, I'm going to ask yes. you to wrap up because it's yep. quite over time. So if you have okay. your last remaining statement. I do. I just have a couple. and I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so I just wrap up uh, and I just want to point out that there was an estimate from uh, uh, CDFW on the cost of the water per acre foot. And when you run that with the model, you still find that the cost of the uh, just using their dollars, which we don't agree with how that was developed, still the cost is eight to ten million dollars just for that spring closure. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. So we'll move on to CDFW's presentation. And I believe that is Beth Lawson and Sean Hubler. And I think it starts with Beth, if I remember correctly. It starts with Sean. OK, it starts with Sean. Sorry. It's OK. Sean, can we make sure your mic's working? Sean, can you raise your hand? Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. OK, perfect. Whenever you're ready. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, so thank you guys and good afternoon. Um, let me turn on my camera for you guys as well. Um, so. My name is Sean Hubler. I'm with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. I'll be uh, talking to you guys today about the uh, condition six tunnel closures at uh, Wilmer's Diversion Tunnel for the beginning part. And then I'll be turning it over to uh, my colleague, Beth Lawson. Um, next slide, please. So, you know, just to give you a little bit of a background and, you know, where the thinking came from the department, you know, we, we worked with YWA and did an entrainment study um, for uh, the Middle Yuba River, specific to Low Marines Diversion Tunnel, that went for a little over a year, from October 2012 through um, November 2013. And rainbow trout were pit tagged and detections were made uh, with an antenna array that they installed in Low Marines Diversion Tunnel. And so similar to um, how Mr. Lynch described entrainment, the department, the department also defines entrainment as fish being transported along with the flow of the water and out of their their normal streams, creeks, or rivers. And fish uh, entrained by water diversions are often transported out of their basin watershed and to locations that may, may not be ideal for survival or spawning. And additionally, entrainment can cause loss of genetic integrity. Next slide, please. And, and so uh, during the study, 
um, we, the Yuba County Water Agency tagged 161 rainbow trout and 49 of those were uh, detected as being entrained through the tunnel, resulting in a 30% entrainment rate of tagged rainbow trout. Um, you know, the resource agencies expect that this entrainment rate actually underestimates the overall rate of entrainment. Next slide, please. And, you know, part of the reason for that is, is when you look at how uh, the study interpretation was done. And, and so, you know, this, uh, the study results and our ability to fully understand entrainment um, effects from the, the project itself and develop proper PMEs were limited by the size of the fish that were actually tagged. Um, the pit tags themselves were limited to being utilized in fish 60 millimeters or greater. In this case, for this middle Yuba River, the smallest fish we tagged was 72 millimeters. And, and therefore, we really don't have uh, entrainment rates available for smaller fish, especially those young of year and mobile life stages um, that tend to live on the margins and could be at higher risk of entrainment. Um, the study was conducted in a dry, dry year um, and wetter water years with higher, more diversion rates could be in, uh, include entrainment rates maybe higher. Um, uh, Yuba you, you County Water Agency estimated uh, entrainment that did not include rainbow trout that were entrained when antenna efficiencies was less than 80%. And lastly, Yuba County Water Agency did not model the population level effects of entrainment on the fish of year after year removals of fish from the population and the impacts to genetic diversity of those fish. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a graphic um, that, that shows unique detections. Those are the red dots. Um, that you see at the bottom of the axis, uh, overlaid with the discharge through the tunnel. And, you know, entrainment detections were highest in the fall and correlated with higher diversion rates. And those are the clump of red dots you see on the left of that graph. Um, you know, however, late spring detections, uh, which you see on the right of your graph, may actually be the result of an attraction flow uh, for spawning rainbow trout that may be lured into uh, the tunnels. Next slide, please. And, and so, you know, it's similar to the same graphic, but the, it shows you the two main seasons where entrainment detections were highest. Uh, the fall and the spring time period stand out as the greatest risk of entrainment. And these time periods were what the department looked at along with other factors in informing our 10-J recommendations and to be able to provide some sort of pro protection for that. Next slide, please. And then before I turn it over to my colleague, Beth, I just want to talk briefly about the project uh, effects of entrainment. And so uh, project effects of entrainment, uh, fish entrainment are often seen downstream of the point of entrainment. In this case, uh, the middle Yuba River directly downstream from the R House Diversion Dam. And the graphic shows the relicensing fish population survey results from 2012 and 2013. And, you know, the one thing that really stands out from that, and it's marked in a big yellow box with a blue line, is that there's a near complete loss of the young of year um, age class fish. Those are those ones that were not pit tagged um, and ones that have a very low uh, mobility and are more vulnerable to detection. So fish population data below our house indicates that there's less than 1% that the young of year fish comprise less than 1% of the population. And just to kind of give you an idea of what this graph should look like in a healthy, robust fish population, um, that where that blue mark is, uh, the arrow, that should be your highest bar on a normal healthy population. It should slowly descend to the right as older fish die or there's predation and they're moved out, removed out of the population. And so with that, I'll, I'd like to turn this over to Beth. And next slide. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. Okay, great. Um, so with that, um, after the entrainment study um, results came in, we started talking about what we can do about entrainment here. And of course, the first thing that we started talking about was fish screens. And um, there were some cost estimates that had been done for the fish screens and uh, fish screen at this location um, with a tunnel um, at Loman Ridge um, that could take up to 860 CFS and would be a very large and costly fish screen. And so we started looking at, you know, some other alternatives. Are there ways that we can operate the project differently so that we can entrain less fish? Is there something else we can do? And so uh, we turned to the hydrology as we were talking about this. And I wanted to highlight in this graph the differences in water year type. Um, so in the solid sort of dark or 
green line here, we have the hydrology upstream of the tunnel in 2011, which is a wet year. And then in the dotted green line, which is around the 800 CFS uh, mark, we see the water that's going into the tunnel. And then similarly in the solid line in blue below, we see 2013 uh, middle Yuba flow above the Loman Ridge tunnel. And then in the dotted line below that, we see the flow that is diverted into the tunnel. And one of the things that we noticed here um, and that we often notice at tunnels like this is that the entire spring uh, snowmelt hydrograph essentially goes into the tunnel. So as, um, as you get into the spring time period, um, the, the river is essentially only seeing just spills, anything above the 860 CFS, or it's seeing just the minimum in-stream flow. So it sees very, very flashy flows, and then none of the um, tailing uh, descending limb of the hydrograph down to um, just the minimum in-stream flow. So it's a very quick drop-off. And that spring recession um, provides a lot of things. It's not just about entrainment. It provides those natural ramping rates that uh, yellow-eyed frogs are cued um, off of in their um, life cycle um, in order to not dewater their eggs. Um, that for geomorphological purposes, it creates natural bar formations. Um, the form the natural hydrograph um, creates a stable bar formation um, that is lacking in the middle Yuba below. Um, the Arhos Dam and for fish and other aquatic species, it does mean entrainment. And so as we were looking at this um, hydrograph, we thought it was important to understand what Jim was talking about before that a lot of this is spilled at New Bullard's Bar. Um, next slide, please. And so because we had a um, post-processing tool here, um, we had the ability, um, the licensee had generated a post-processing um, tool that allowed us to look at power generation. And so what we're able to do is we're able to look at how much power generation and in value we got out of all of that water diverted. So on the excess axis, you can see that over to the right are wetter years and over to the left are drier years. And as um, is kind of not expected, after you think about the results, the wetter years, the energy value is lower than the water that's diverted at the tunnel in the drier years. And so the reason for that is because in the wetter years, um, New Bullets Bar is very full. And so to follow their rule curve, um, the licensee uh, YWA is just pushing water out of Colgate Powerhouse. Colgate Powerhouse during these spring months is essentially running 24 hours a day, which means they're not following peak load. They're pushing water out all the time and not just capturing the very high value dollar hours. And so on the left side, we see that in the drier years, those um, in the drier years, the energy is worth a lot more or the water that is diverted at the tunnels is worth a lot more. So if you go to the next slide, I've now I, uh, highlighted in the squares, the times when New Bullard's, the years when New Bullard's bar is spilling. And if you go to the next graph, um, you will see the years when CDFW is proposing a tunnel closure. And in the next graph, you see the years when the fish, uh, fish, uh, US Forest Service 4E required a tunnel closure. So you can see the difference in these. Um, there, there's sort of a break point around $20 um, for, all of, for each acre foot um, diverted. And um, CDFW feels that this break point of when we have decided to, um, to have tunnel closures is a fair balance because we really are looking at the times when energy is really not that valuable on the market. By doing these tunnel closures, we're able to provide um, the additional snow melt runoff hydrograph in, as we've seen four years on the record, um, an additional amount of time in order to protect not just entrainment, but natural bar formation and natural ramping rates for foothill yellow-legged frogs. Next slide, please. Okay, and so what this looks like, um, I think Jim talked about these numbers too. Um, in the fall tunnel closures, CDFW has recommended 41 years, which is every year because those are the months that we saw the most amount of entrainment. And as Jim talked about, that is really not the high value um, part of this condition. And in the spring tunnel closure, um, we have recommended more tunnel closures um, and the difference in number of years modeled on a 41 year period of record is just 10 years of tunnel closure versus seven. And we feel that the break point um, still shows that the energy value is pretty low for those diverted because we're not getting into the wetter or into the drier water years. Um, and that's why we've continued to recommend um, the additional years of tunnel closure. Next slide, please. 
and Beth, you're going to want to wrap it up because you're close to, well, yep. you're over time. This is it. So YSWA seeks to change this condition and the final water quality certification does include the tunnel closures in addition to those agreed to by the U.S. Forest Service to protect native rainbow trout from entrainment and provide those additional geomorphic pulses to the Middle Yuba River and Oregon Creek. And CDFW supports keeping the measure as written in the final water quality certification. Thank you. Thank you. So now we have about 15 minutes that we can discuss and so I'll do the same thing and go around the circle. YCWA, do you have any questions for, for Beth or Sean? I don't see any hands, so I'm gonna take that as a no. And ask CDFW the quite same question. Do you have any questions for YCWA? I'm not seeing any hands. So I think then I can turn it over to State Water Board um, to ask questions. So feel free to chime in if you have questions, State Water Board. Hey, it's Parker, I'll start. I think I just have one um, for Jim Lynch. Um, and thank you for walking through that presentation, everybody. Um, but thank you, Jim, for walking through and really trying to touch on the comments that we had provided in advance. It's, it's very helpful. Um, I did want to ask a follow up about the annual cost and just see if you could catch me up on maybe where, where I'm missing something. Um, I went back and I looked at that 20, the, I believe October 9, 2017 document that um, Yuba issued in response to REA comments. Yes. Um, and what it looks like there is you're right, it ran a 41 year model, but the cost that came out of the 40, over the 41 years was $14,512,027. And then it looks like Yuba applied that cost to the, at the time, 30 year proposed licensing period. And so I didn't see the annual adjustment in that previous report. And then the part that led me to kind of ask that previous question is when you take the $14 million figure and you divide that by 30, you get the annual cost that Yuba is presenting in their petition um, of the $485,734. Sure. And so I've, I'm not seeing the piece where that 14 million, which is the cost of the 41 year model or the 41 years modeled was broken down to an annual and then brought up to either 30 or 50 years. Sure. I'll try to explain that, but if Steve Grinnell can also be on to back me up anywhere, I'd appreciate it. And the answer to uh, Parker is you were so close. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, basically we ran the model uh, for the 41 years, and that comes up with a total generation loss uh, com compared to the baseline. And then we take that total that we come out of the model with, and we divide by 41 to come up with an average annual cost. So uh, under the FERC likes to express all of its costs in 30-year terms, it comes out of their Meads decision, and they just like to do that in current costs current dollars, 30 years with no escalation on it. So we that's why we always do an average annual cost. So we took the average annual cost, 41 year total divided by 41 to give us an average annual cost over the model period. And we multiplied that value times 30. That's why your numbers are jiving to come up with a 30 year cost. Uh, YCWA believes and has requested from FERC that it would like a 50 year term of a new license, which is the cap. So we took the same average annual cost and multiplied it by 50 to come up with that $24 million cost. You are almost there. <laughs> the, the step where it breaks it down to the annual and then brings it up to the 30 is the piece I'm not seeing in that report. So I think that's where uh, my question- I could see where it would and I apologize yeah. for the confusion there. Yeah. All right. well, Steve, thank you. If I could just ask Steve Grinnell just to chime in. Steve, did I get all that right? Uh, you did most of that costing and the, you did all the modeling. So was that oh, correct yeah. with that? Well done, Jim. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So anyway, sorry for the confusion there, Parker. But all right. Well, thank that's you. Why your num that's why your numbers were jiving later in the process. So. Yeah. Okay. And I'll just um, have a 
quick question as well um, related to the cost. Jim, when you were giving your presentation, I think in passing you mentioned other costs that were estimated. Um, I think you said eight million. I could have misheard um, yep. and something else. Um, you said you thought those were not um, accurate. So I was wondering if you could just go over what those costs were and why you think they they aren't um, good representations of what the costs are. Uh, sure, be happy to. I apologize, I was getting close to the end and I jumped over that. But it goes back to CDFW's proposal, which I think uh, Beth did a very nice job presenting. Uh, uh, what we're referring to was CDFW had said in their petition and in their response to the comments that having the spring closure with the additional years uh, would have very little, uh, would have minimal uh, uh, lost power costs. Uh, and they estimated, uh, I think on average, they said for an above normal year, which is what they're recommending, having the tunnel closed in spring in above normal years, by WA just wet years with a trigger and storage. Uh, they estimated $33 per acre foot. It's called the water duty of the water that would go through a uh, new Colgate uh, tunnel uh, and into the powerhouse. So what we did was say, okay, we'll look at that and we'll just take the amount of water that would have remained in storage and multiply it by 33. It comes out to eight and $9 million in that range. We don't consider that to be a, a minimal uh, cost for lost generation for those additional years. That was my point, uh, but I will add, uh, we didn't get any backup material or any other material from CDF, CDFW. Uh, uh, they presented some information, but we never dug into their analysis. Uh, it, frankly, I consider YWA a better crystal ball <laughs> of costs uh, for generation than CDFW. It's what they do for a living every single day, every minute of every single day. So that's why we think our numbers are probably more reliable than CDFW's. Uh, and, and that's where the 8 million came from. I was just pointing out that we don't think of that as a minimal lost generation cost, especially in California where the push now is carbon free energy sources, which exactly is what we would be losing here. Thanks, Jim. And Beth, I see you raised your hand. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think I just want to respond to that a little bit. I mean, obviously I showed the years that New Bullard's bar spills and we would have always, and I think Jim mentioned this, we didn't have a lot of time to go into it. We would have all liked to only write a measure where the tunnels could be closed just during the time when New Bullard's bar spills, but that doesn't work because the timing of New Bullard's bar spilling is later than the um, the timing of diversion at these tunnels. And so you would have been turning on and off the tunnels. And, and we actually tried to go down that road and see if there was a way that we could do that and it doesn't work. And so um, what we're trying to do in our measure is come up with a point, and you saw in our analysis that we were looking at the times when energy value is not as large and so in those wet and above normal years, um, the reservoir is, and because we're using reservoir targets, we're targeting years when the reservoir is very full. And so I think the difference between YWS is, is, you know, it's either a full or very full reservoir. And so although they're able to push additional water through Colgate Powerhouse, we don't deny that they're able to generate additional revenue off of that. But, you know, it may be a matter of them running the powerhouse for 24 versus 20 hours a day or something. And so when you look at when YWA is pushing water through Colgate powerhouse, um, they're, they're pushing it through in the most valuable hours of the day. And so as you get more and more water in the reservoir, you're, you're pushing it, uh, the generation into the less and less valuable hours. And that's what we're showing in our analysis is we feel that the break point of when you make that decision is different. We're leaning towards the resource. We're leaning towards um, putting that benefit back into the river when available. Um, and so I think that's the, the trade-off that we're making here. And we really were focused on those years. Um, there was initially a target of trying to get to like 33% of the years for geomorphological reasons for the natural bar formation. And so um, we're, we're really pushing our numbers as close as possible to try to restore some natural function to the river downstream um, that comes from only from that spring snowmelt hydrograph. Okay, thank you both. And um, I've been told that we were supposed to end this section at 155 and it's 155 now. So unless there's any other questions from staff, I think we'll move on to the next topic. Can I ask one question really quick? 
This is Kristen. Of course. With State Water Board. Um, Beth, at the very end of your presentation, and I know you might have been a little bit short on time, you had mentioned geomorphic pulses. Can you just take like a minute and talk about that a little bit more? Because I'm not really sure what you were getting at there. Yeah, um, again, I'm an engineer, I'm not a geomorphologist. Um, and because the Forest Service did not have a petition for reconsideration, they're not able to um, speak to that today. And so I think the Forest Service um, geomorphologists were the ones that were really um, working through the, um, the need to have those geomorpho geomorphological pulses in the larger number of years. And what I understand is that um, the spring snowmelt hydrograph, um, and I've seen this in many papers, is that that um, forms natural bars and that forms bars um, in, within the river where the gradation of, um, of substrate is um, stable and forms a more natural shape of a bar rather than um, just dropping off very quickly and dropping material out of suspension very quickly. And so with these more natural formed bars, you're able to um, restore, you're, you're able to hold on to riparian um, vegetation and you're able to have a bar that is easier for species like foothill yellowgate frogs to have more habitat on. Again, this is my interpretation. So if there's someone else that wants to jump in, um, maybe Erin to talk about that natural bar formation. Um, I think that that was a really high priority um, when we were negotiating this term and trying to restore that component that we felt was all going into the tunnel um, in as many years as we, as we possibly could to restore that natural um, river function. Thanks, that's helpful. And then I do have a quick question too for Jim Lynch. And if you don't know the answer, that's fine. Um, Yuba's petition mentioned that I think 21 fish were entrained. Do you know offhand what percentage of the population that 21 fish is? Depends upon how you define population. Uh, we did an analysis where we looked at how many fish were entrained in time. And we we found at least that the most of the fish that were entrained, we, we had tagged fish upstream for quite a distance. Most of the fish that were entrained were right near the intake. In fact, with many of them were in the impoundment and they were entrained uh, relatively quick. So we, we found that. So if you define your population as say within one or two miles of the population of the uh, of the tunnel, it'd be one number. If you did it further upstream, it'd be a different. We actually tried to use all the fish data we had from the Yuba River uh, from the uh, middle Yuba River and we came up with a population estimate that we thought the total rainbow trout population uh, of the size class we were looking at, the entrainment would be about three tenths of a percent. But that was, an, that was a gross estimate as Sean accurately said, we didn't do a population model, nor did anybody else. If I could just add one thing, just, just as a clarification, uh, Beth was absolutely right. The geomorphological processes were an issue and the Forest Service and YWA and other parties uh, designed a condition to provide those morphological processes in the middle Yuba River on Forest Service land that the Forest Service included as a 4E. So that will be in the new license. So, but I hope that answers your question, Kristen. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. That's all I have. So I think, sure. thanks everyone for letting me go a minute or two over. Um, but with that, we can move on to our, it will be YCWA's presentation on condition seven. So the speakers will be, looks like Steve Grinnell and Paul Bradovich. If you can get them on mute, uh, that's great. Yes, well, hello again. And uh, exactly, uh, Paul Bradovich and I will be presenting uh, condition seven for YCWA. Uh, next slide, please. So condition seven requires rejuvenation of the upper intake of New, New Colgate Powerhouse on um, the, uh, the intake on New Bulls Bar Dam. Uh, and to use the upper intake in the spring and the upper or the lower intake the remainder of the year for temperature management. Uh, the lower intake has been used exclusively since 1993 at the, at the direction of CDFW. Uh, next slide, please. So the water quality certain rationale for use of the upper intake includes statements that using the lower intake depletes the cold water pool and that by using the upper intake, there would be temperature benefits to fish in the middle Yuba River and the lower Yuba River. Uh, next slide, please. 
So what did FERC say about this? Um, FERC rejected this uh, proposal um, um, that CDFW made in its recommendations by saying that modeling indicated the cold water pool would not normally depleted, be depleted, although FERC did suggest in its FEIS that the cold water pool may have been depleted in 2014 and 2015. I'll address that in a second. And they inferred that this, uh, by looking uh, well downstream of new Colgate poppers releases, the releases from New Bulls Bar, i.e. They, they were looking at uh, flows on the lower Yuba River below Anglebright Dam. Uh, but FERC, FERC also stated that warmer water was uh, not yet present in New Bulls Bar in the springtime for use, using the um, upper intake and that the reservoir does not strongly stratify at this time. And FERC noted that the upper intake is not available in drier years due to low storage levels in the spring. Uh, next slide, please. So let's kind of look at this issue of depletion of the cold water pool, specifically what we went through in 2014 and 2015. So we have um, recorded temperature profiles of New Bulls Bar. They're done roughly every two weeks. Um, and they, that's been done for years. Uh, and so we have those for uh, plotted here for 2014 and 2015. And we see that the cold water pool was not depleted even into September. And, and the, the blue, I mean, the black dashed line is the, uh, the elevation of the lower intake. The figure is a little tough to read, but the temperature at the lower intake in both 2014 and 2015 in late September is in the 48 to, uh, to 49 degree F range. That's exceptionally cold water. And there was a substantial volume of cold water above that elevation that would still be available for release well into the fall when temperatures are no longer an issue. And so therefore, you know, contrary to um, uh, what has been put forth, even suggested by FERC, the cold water pool in, in New Bulls Bar was not depleted. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, depleting the, uh, the cold water pool, what we did, we took a look at the average uh, temperatures, uh, release temperatures from Colgate Powerhouse uh, for the last several years. Um, in the September to mid-October spring run spawning period, the most critical time for temperatures needing colder temperatures. Uh, 2014 and 2015 are not substantially different from any other years, if you, as you can see. Um, you know, they kind of range from anywhere from around 49, high 48 uh, to 51. Um, uh, even in uh, mid-September 2015, when storage was drawn down, uh, uh, substantially uh, down to about 398,000 acre feet by the end of September, Colgate release temperatures were still hovering around 51 degrees. Um, that's actually going on today. The, temp the elevation of New Bulls Bar today as we speak is almost identical to the elevation in 2015 at this time. And I just checked uh, this morning and the release temperatures out of Colgate Powerhouse about 51 degrees. Next slide, please. So a major um, impediment to a multi-intake strategy for the reservoir is that in the driest years, the upper intake is not submerged to allow its use. Uh, this partially occurred in 2014, where there's only a limited amount of time in the springtime where the upper intake could have been used and was not available at all in 2015. And this year, once again, the upper intake could not have been used. In fact, uh, surface water elevation didn't even get close to being able to um, utilize the upper intake. So it would not have been able to be used this year as well. Obviously a very dry year. Uh, this figure um, is for elevation, uh, surface water elevation that was recorded um, in the 2012 to 2017 timeframe. The red line is the, is the upper intake elevation, as you can see in 2014 just kind of touches that line for a little bit of the of the springtime and of course in 2015 did, did not um, get to the point where the upper intake could could have been used the next slide please <clears throat> yep. and uh, i think paul bradovich is uh take over here for a minute and next slide please Oh no. I, just... I think you're on mute, Paul. I can't hear you. 
Am I still on mute? No, nope, you're, you're, you're. I can you're hear good. you now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I got disconnected for a moment there, but just re reconnected. So I'm sorry for the inconvenience. But um, yeah, we looked at the water temperature benefits associated with using the dual intake structure rather than just the lower intake structure alone uh, in the REA responses to comments. And that's the 41 year uh, model simulation period. As you can see, here's yet another exceedance probability analysis. As you can see, yeah, the water temperatures from using the dual intake of, do reduce water temperatures during the fall, as indicated as part of the objectives of, of this strategy, um, defined as September to mid-October for spring run Chinook salmon spawning. Um, but they're minimal. I mean, they're really generally less than half a degree difference across the entire distribution, but very little difference. Like I, as the slide indicates, only about a three and a half percent probability of exceeding upper optimal and no difference in exceeding upper tolerable using that 41 year period of simulated water temperatures. So uh, very minimal uh, and probably not biologically meaningful difference in water temperatures associated with, with uh, our assessment of the dual intake strategy versus the lower intake only. That was very brief. Uh, Steve, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Uh, so the next uh, slide, please. Just to summarize, um, so contrary to the statements in the CDFW um, presented information in the water quality search statements, uh, you know, the available informa information demonstrates that um, uh, uh, during uh, critically dry years, such as this year, 2015, the use of low or intake does not deplete the cold water pool. And in these types of years, the upper intake is not available in the springtime. Um, so, uh, the other element, I think we skipped over one slide, but basically what that slide said is that uh, the implementation of water, the uh, water quality search condition seven using the multi-level intake uh, would not improve water temperatures in the middle Uber River. In fact, it wouldn't have any effect on the middle Uber River. These releases don't, um, don't um, flow through the middle Uber River and don't affect it. And that the, in summary, the um, implementation of the condition would provide only minimally cool water temperatures for spawning during the fall, but only when, in years when the upper intake could be used, which are generally the, um, not the driest years. And that's, uh, I think, all we have. Thank you. Uh, next up, it will be CDFW's presentation for condition seven. And that will be, I believe, Beth Lawson and John McMillan. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Great. Okay. Um... My name is Beth Lawson again. I'll introduce John Mellon, McMillan when we get to his part. Um, so, hey, from Beth, yeah. Can we just make sure that John's unmuted too, so we don't have any? Yeah. John, are you? Can you hear John, me now? Can you raise your this hand? Is John McMillan. Yes, we can. Great. Yeah, great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Next slide, please. Okay, um, we were asked some specific questions about the about this measure, so I want to make sure to answer this. Um, the question here um, is essentially asking us um, what is the status of the 1993 agreement um, and explain why the upper intake at Colgate is recommended and the status of that agreement. Our response is that the 1993 agreement with CDFW was based on the best available science at that time and 28 years of additional monitoring and climate change predictions for more potential back-to-back -back and wet dry cycles have caused CDFW staff to reconsider this agreement and now recommend that the upper intake be preferentially used in the spring months. Additionally, CDFW believes that this project um, that fixing this infrastructure and allowing this to be able to be used will be uh, will allow for more flexibility in temperature operations in the future under climate change conditions. Next slide, please. 
Um, as a little bit of background in water rights decision 1644, YWA was um, told in, 20, in 2003 by the Water Board to diligently pursue development of a Narrows 2 powerhouse intake extension at Inglebright Dam in coordination with Fish and Wildlife Service, CDFW, CFG at the time, and NIMPS. Um, YCWA did not pursue funding or construction of the Inglebright intake and, and instead deferred um, that issue until relicensing in 2007. And then during relicensing, YWA concluded in technical memorandum 7-2 that water temperature related operational um, or infrastructure modif modifications were not needed at that time. State Water Board filed extensive comments about this operations issue in their draft environmental statement comments on July 30th, 2018, and directed YCWA to include additional analysis considering recent drought operations in addition to the historic record um, that had been included at the time, which included monitoring through 2012. Um, next slide, please. Okay, um, in a second here, I'm gonna turn it over to John McMillan, but what I wanted to talk about at this moment is it's not just about fall temperatures, it's really about having the maximum flexibility within the infrastructure capabilities of this project to operate the Yuba River to what would be the best temperatures for the river. And as our understanding of the river and our understanding of the species in the river is evolving, potentially over the next 50 years, CDFW believes that it's important to have working infrastructure and to be able to operate that to what we think is the best for the species in the river at the time. And so with that, um, I'd like to turn over for a few minutes to John McMillan to talk about one of the potential benefits of releasing a little bit warmer water during the spring months in the Lower Yuba River. Thank you, Beth. Um, hello, everyone. Let me see if I can get my camera on here. There we go. Hello, everyone. My name is John McMillan, and uh, I'd like, just like to talk briefly about steelhead and rainbow trout. So steelhead and rainbow trout are, are essentially the same species. And while there are genetic differences uh, that do promote an individual going to the ocean, becoming an adramus or a steelhead, or remaining in fresh water and becoming a rainbow trout, each of those life histories can give rise to one another. And very strong environmental, in environmental influences can override those genetic tendencies and shift the balance of life histories. For example, stream flow and water temperature regimes can and often do exert a strong influence on the expression of anadromine residency in rainbow trout. For example, streams with cooler summer temperatures and more stable stream flow regimes and large amounts of food tend to be correlated with higher levels of residency. And that is one reason that dam influenced rivers may experience a shift in life history because dams can reduce the variation in stream flow and provide much cooler water temperatures. In the case of the Yuba, it appears that juvenile micus are growing really rapidly, and that could be related to the relatively stable stream flows in cold spring and summer temperatures in the river. The rapid growth and the modified stream flow and temperature regimes could also be one factor that is resulting in more resonant rainbow than steelhead. And this is because cold water temperatures are known to induce greater fat or lipid storage in micus. And the more fat a fish gets early in life, the more likely that fish is to become a rainbow trout. Hence, operational modifications to the dam, including using different water temperature releases and regimes, could potentially shift the population more towards anadromy and steelhead and a bit more away from residency and rainbow trout. And to date, I'm really not aware of any efforts to modify thermal regimes to produce more steelhead than rainbow trout. However, I do think such, such experiments could be very useful because they may provide insights into how we manage our rivers uh, to restore a more, a more normal balance of life histories. I think that's really important because as climate effects continue to unfold, it, be, it may be necessary to modify dam operations in ways that we can improve the diversity of life histories in a population, which in turn could increase the population's resilience to uh, climate change. Thank you, John. Next slide. And so I like that Steve Grinnell and I are using largely the same slides. So you've already seen this. Um, this uh, We didn't see each other's slides in advance. So um, you're now looking at a cross section of New Bullard's Bar Dam. You can see that the upper intake um, is at about elevation 1808 in this diagram. Although in the next slide, you'll see that it's listed as 1880. It's my understanding that um, if the elevation comes below that point, they will potentially start seeing some cap, or they had historically potentially started seeing some cavitation at that intake. And so they did not want to operate above 
um, the 80 feet that tells me that that upper intake is potentially pulling from a much higher zone in the reservoir. Uh, but this is the difference. There is not quite 200 feet, but there is about 200 feet difference um, between the two um, intakes to Colgate Powerhouse. Next slide, please. And we already saw Steve present this slide um, that was in response to um, the State Water Board's comments. And then I wanted to go to the next slide. And this one went up through 2017. So in the next slide, um, you'll see that I just added to that record. I went from 2017 all the way through today. And so um, I think what I wanted to show in these two plots together is that when we go from uh, using 2012 through 2021 hydrology, um, we have an additional nine years of record. And although um, the difference, uh, the red line, again, if you remember from Steve's presentation, was the top point where that um, intake would, where the bottom intake, sorry, the top intake would not be able to be used anymore. And so in two of those years, um, the temperature, the alternate modification of the intake and the alternate use of the intakes would not be available because the reservoir doesn't get high enough to use that. Um, the water is still available. Potentially, if there was a fix, um, you may be able to fix it so that you could use that reservoir or that intake a little bit more. Um, and, and so what I'm saying is this is not a silver bullet. It is not the answer to temperature management in every year. But um, we don't want to continue to think about all or nothing solutions. I think that our response to climate change needs to be able to use existing infrastructure in order to be modified to be modified and to modify operations within the capabilities of the project as to give as much flexibility to respond to climate change situations as possible and to give as much flexibility to river operators as possible to operate the temperatures in the lower Yuba River for the best benefit of the fish. Um, going to the next slide. Um, CDFW believes that any project infrastructure that may be used to adaptively manage temperatures is important for species management under future climate change conditions and should be maintained in good operable condition to enable flexible operations in a dynamic and unknowable climate future. I think that's the last slide. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. And John. So I'll ask uh, YCWA, do you have any questions, questions about what we just heard? I don't see any raised hands. So same question to CDFW. Do you have any questions for YCWA about what we just heard? Nope. Okay, I'll turn it over to any state water board representatives that have questions. Actually, you know what? I have one for Steve. Um, do you know offhand the current elevation of the reservoir? Like, is the upper intake currently inundated right now? There we go. <laughs> Thanks. Um, no, no, the uh, the upper intake is not. It, it actually wasn't even uh, inundated in the springtime. Um, we're down below four hundred thousand acre feet right now, so we're well below. Actually, the plot that shows twenty fifteen, the profile for elevation this year is almost identical to the uh, plot that showed twenty fifteen, and um, and so we're way way down. Yeah. You had said earlier uh, 2015 was Schedule 6, correct? Yes. It, and this year, for, I forget offhand, is a Schedule 5? Five, five yes. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I see Parker's hand up, so go ahead, Parker. Yeah, just one quick clarification, maybe. Um, I believe it was you, Steve, who was mentioning that this does nothing for the middle Yuba River. And I think there might just be a semantics on this. When we mentioned Middle Yuba, we were we were referencing to the stretch of the Yuba that's between New Colgate Powerhouse and Inglebright. And so I think in some forms it's called Middle Yuba, but it may be more widely known as just Yuba at that point. But I, I hope that helps clarify. Yeah, 
Oh yeah, yeah. So, right, there is a small stretch between Colgate and, and um, the upper ends of Engelbright. Uh, we, you know, everything I've been used to is where the Middle Yuba and North Yuba come together, and that becomes the Yuba River um, down through Engelbright, and then the Lower Yuba below Engelbright. But yeah, that's as you say nomenclature. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. I had a um, question that maybe I could get clarification from YCWA and CDFW on. Beth, you mentioned cavitation potential and um, how that might affect operation. I just wanted to better understand what that might look like and when that might be an issue with operation of the tunnel and whether both parties could speak to that. Beth, you want to go first? You want me to hit it? I mean, sure. It was my understanding that when they did operate that upper intake, that there was some vibrations of it. I don't know if it was about powerhouse cavitation. I mean, I think cavitation of a turbine is different, but um, it, I, everything I've read says YWA doesn't want to use that below 1880. But I do understand that there was some vibration and YWA had to continuously manufacture new bolts for it. So it, it's always been my interpretation that if there was a fix of this, that there would be some refurbishment of the intake structure, that it wouldn't simply just be opening it back up, which is, I think, included in YWA's cost estimates. Yeah, there's actually two. That's, uh, thank you, Beth. That's definitely part of the equation, but there are really two elements to this. Uh, one is the uh, for you know the, the Colgate powerhouse pulls about 3,400 CFS. That's a lot of flow, so you do need submergence and, and a fairly amount. So what we did was we looked at uh, what Beth was talking about, and then we also went back and did the Corps of Engineers um, submergence calculation requirements for um, for that type of flow and this type of configuration. And so those two things kind of came together. To, um, to identify the elevation at which the intake would not be, um, uh, you know, the elevation in that intake um, uh, would need to have at least that amount of submergence. So we kind of got it from two, two sources. And so, uh, Aaron, that brings me to a good point, though. I think in Paul's um, presentation, you saw that um, he said that 0.4 degrees was the difference between those two intakes. And that is one of the reasons that I be believe that that intake is pulling from higher elevations. So I think that, you know, the temperature difference at the spot on the profile where the two um, intakes are is on average about three degrees Fahrenheit, but it can be a lot more than that. At, just on the profiles that I've seen, it can be as much as 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then really a lot of not understanding about what happens in the hydraulics of where that upper intake would be pulling from um, because we don't have the data from the last few years to point to there. But we do know that the upper intake would be pulling warmer water, um, especially in spring once the reservoir starts to stratify. Steve, do you have information about what Beth was referring to in terms of temperature yeah. and- Sure, for the model, um that we use for, for new bulls was uh, C equal to, there's a distribution profile you use as to how the intake draws water. So it's across the, across the intake, it's, um, uh, it's, it's kind of parabolic distribution. And um, so you do get, you know, I mean, you're not just taking water right at the intake, it's, you know, you're taking, pulling water for below the intake and actually, you know, uh, for quite a bit above. And that's actually why there's the problem with having to have submergence as well, because you do pull for, from a fairly wide, at that type of flow uh, rate, which is, you know, quite high, you're, you're pulling from a fairly wide range above and below the intake elevation. And then can I ask sort of a broader question, which is, just thinking about why people construct things with two outlets instead of one, you know, just for operational flexibility in terms of maintenance, as well as, you know, like if you need to fix something or something goes out. Um, I was just wondering with the lower intake, what is the maintenance like? And is there the potential for there to be an instance where that would become non-operable and use of the upper one would sort of be necessary in order to ensure there wasn't a issue at that point from an infrastructure standpoint. Yeah, so a couple and If of, I'm not clearly stating that, let me know. No, no, that's not, that's very clear. Um, actually, there's kind of two things going on there. One is um, that the alternative release mechanism that has been used actually in recent past 
uh, when tunnel when, when there's a tunnel shut down or you know penstock shut down is to use a, there is a low level outlet in the dam that can release about 1200 it, its current configuration about 1200 cfs which would support um, flows for the lower yuba river for uh, temporarily that was actually used in 2008 when there was some tunnel work going on and when they do the tunnel maintenance so it's actually a completely separate uh, release facility the you know the problem with the dual intake as far as redundancy goes yeah if there's a problem with the lower intake really the only thing that's going to happen there is something with the slide gate there's a slide the gate that goes over it uh, but they both as, as the that figure that both beth and i showed they both come together inside the dam and then there's just one outlet um and those are just you know just kind of encased in the dam so all the mechanical elements are, i think are are um, for you know are the, the same ones used by both facilities, um, and then the last thing is you asked about the cost. That low level in, uh, um, intake again is just a is is just a um, a grill and a um, you know a trash grill and a slide gate to, to close it off, um, and so there's not very much maintenance. There is an inspection that's done. Uh, I think it's every five years as far as the, the FERC inspection and they have to send divers, you know, that's deep diving. They send divers down to inspect it, but that's that's about it. And you're on mute. Thank you. I just said thank you very much. <laughs> I don't have any additional questions, but does any, do any of the other water board staff have questions? Sounds like we're good to go, Kristen. Yep, I'm not seeing any. So let's move on. Our next topic will be conditions eight and nine. And we will hand it over to YCWA to start with their presentation on those conditions. And those presenters will be, it looks like Jim Lynch. I think it's just yes, Jim. It is. Great. Although that sounds very lonely. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> if let's you could put your, the first uh, presentation pulled up, Jim. Thank you. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, conditions eight and nine, and I've broken that into both eight and nine since they're two different conditions. Uh, one is with regarding to sediment, Jim, and the other one is. Whoops. Jim, give us one minute to get your presentation. Oh, closed, okay. All right. Okay. I think we're good to go now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so I was just mentioning that these are two conditions and I combined this into uh, one presentation, but I treat them differently. Uh, nine is uh, sediment, eight is large woody material. And these are conditions uh, that uh, the CDFW has asked to be modified and uh, YWA uh, is opposed to that. And I'll talk about that as we move forward. Next slide. Also, there were no questions uh, to YSWA on either one of these, so there aren't any specific questions we had to answer. Uh, as we did before, the sediment management uh, that CDFW proposes is basically the same as in their 10J recommendation. Uh, and for sediment, it would uh, require that YSWA place roughly 5,000 ton pile of gravel in the river below New Bullets Bar Dam, uh, do a bunch of monitoring, and replenish that tile, that pile uh, periodically over the course of the license. And the reason the uh, modification is needed, according to CDFW, is because New Bullets Bar Reach is nearly devoid of both super gravel habitat for rainbow trout, and uh, because all the sediments trapped behind the dam. Next slide, please. Uh, the reach isn't a devoid of spawning gravel, but I absolutely agree that there's not much there. Uh, we found that there was uh, gravel perched behind boulders in different locations. And certainly that's uh, supported by the fact that we do find rainbow trout. So obviously they're finding gravel to spawn, but not in great numbers. Uh, the study, uh, this really, in my mind, hinges on the fact that we believe that the, any sediment that would be in that reach gets flushed out relatively quickly. And under relicensing for our geomorphology study, uh, we were strongly encouraged to develop a transport model in this reach and in other reaches. We did that, and that's reported in our ge uh, geology technical, uh, geomorphology tech memo. 
And we found that basically the sediment uh, uh, input uh, into the uh, reach was around 52,000 tons per year. And this is using models. And again, this, this uh, tech memo was reviewed and commented on. And that's with or without the project in place. And then without the project in place, the transport capability of that reach is 500,000 tons of sediment, which is 10 times more than the input. With the project in place, because the project captures, doesn't capture all the flow, obviously, the sediment and transport is around 400,000 to 450,000. So the ability of sediment to get flushed out of that reach based on the sediment model is, is very, very high. And then also when you look at, look at the uh, mobilization of sediment, uh, again, from our, our geomorphology studies, you find that rainbow trout size spawning gravel, which is roughly two and a half to three inches, uh, we found was mobilized between 65 and 700 CFS, the broad ranges because we're looking at two and a half, quarter inch to three inches. And they have a uh, reoccurrence interval uh, with the project in place of two years, roughly. Uh, and also we have a five-year reoccurrence interval of over 8,000, almost 9,000 CFS. So basically from our perspective, any sediment replaced in that reach, we get flushed out very, very quickly. Next slide, please. Uh, with that said, we would suggest uh, that set placing sediment here is be very costly. We did a very detailed cost looking at placing sediment both, both by uh, helicopter, and we looked at truckloads of sediment, but we didn't uh, go to the truckload option, primarily because given the size of the road that we'd have to improve, the concern with the road for safety, uh, just to do 5,000 tons would be over almost 280,000 truckloads of sediment that you'd have to bring down there, 280, excuse me, that you'd have to drive down there, which doesn't seem feasible given that road. You'd also have to extend the road. And it's a high hazard dam. We're, we're trying not to encourage people to go down there. So there's a lot of reasons. Looking at it from a helicopter standpoint, and again, we put in a pretty detailed estimate, everything from how many tons a helicopter could carry to how many uh, runs they'd have to make, where they place it to permitting, all that cost. We figured, and the replenishment that again, based on the data says would be very frequently, we came up with almost $23 million over the 50 year life of the license to do this sediment transport. So we, we feel for that reason, very, very high cost sediment will be fleshed out very quickly. We didn't feel this was a reasonable thing to do. Moving on to the next slide. Large woody material is similar. CDFW proposed placing large woody material, uh, basically 129 pieces of large wood, which are 25 feet in length. Uh, and they also uh, wanted us to place other pieces uh, throughout the reach and uh, piles, secured piles. Same thing, monitor and periodically replace these uh, throughout the life of, of the license. And the reason CDFW said that is needed is that basically the large wood material is needed for suitable habitat to improve suitable habitat and other aquatic species. And that there's no natural inputs of large wood material. Go to the next slide. Uh, I, we don't believe the literature really supports uh, the position. Two citations by L, uh, CDFW basically say large wood material in steep bedrock, large bedrock boulder streams uh, with high flushing flows, larger material really isn't a form function. Uh, it gets moved, it gets perched high on rocks when the flows recede quickly. Uh, so this is, we feel there's a question there whether it would do anything. And if you look at some of the photos in this presentation and also what we had in our application, you'll see, you get a picture of what this reach looks like, which is uh, a challenging reach with very large boulders. Next slide. There's been discussion whether this reach is steep or not. Uh, having walked it, I can tell you it is steep. Uh, but with that said, it's certainly dominated by boulders, as you can see in a number of the photos we've included. Uh, also, it's very periodic high flows, as I said earlier, 8,000, 9,000 CFS every five years. And the highest flows, at least recently, were 40,000 CFS as a peak flow, which is relatively high flow given that canyon. And again, when you look at the photographs, you can see that 40,000 effect and those higher flows effect on that 
steep channel. Steep gradient, uh, there, there's been an argument made that it's really not that steep and there are shallow places. Certainly at the downstream end, you can see that on the gradient plot on the, on the right. As you get close to the bottom, it does flatten out a little bit. That is where we found large woody material. Uh, we didn't find very much large woody material anywhere else in the stream. And there are certain areas, short sections, of this 2.4 mile reach where it does get less, less steep, but overall it's a pretty steep gradient throughout, which keeps the velocity high and the material moving. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, there's also an argument that there's no large wood. Uh, we do not dispute that New Bullets Bar Dam catches large wood as it comes in. It certainly does. Uh, some large wood material gets downstream very, very little over the spillway, but there are a lot of sources of large wood. There have been some pretty extensive fires. It's a very steep canyon, again, looking at some of the photos in this presentation. And we do expect a lot of this wood to enter the stream. Again, I don't think you're going to find it staying there. You're going to see that it moves downstream. In fact, if you look at some of those photos, uh, you'll actually see some perched large wood on boulders, but they're usually pretty high on the, the stream bank. And I'm getting close to the end here. Next one. Thanks. Uh, so for the same reason with the sediment, we do not believe that the uh, uh, state board should adopt this, uh, this condition. Uh, it's, uh, it, we don't believe it's going would produce any significant environmental benefits or any, I don't believe it would produce any benefits at all myself, but any, any real benefits. Uh, and the cost is very high. We did the same analysis here, taking a look at how you would do this by, uh, by helicopter and by vehicle. Vehicle doesn't really work here because CDFW wants uh, some of the logs to be planted or to be secured throughout the reach. Can't do that with, with the vehicle, obviously. Uh, but we included a very detailed cost estimate. I'd be happy to answer questions on, again, how much, how much wood can a helicopter carry? How much is the cost of a helicopter? How long would it take to place it? How long would it take to get it from the source area to where they're going? How long it would take to secure it? All of that uh, type information, as well as the permitting and the monitoring and the reporting. And we came up with around $9 million for that. So when you look at these two conditions together uh, for the, I would say dubious benefits of the wood and the sediment in this reach, uh, you'd be spending at least 30 million, if not 33 to $35 million to do this over the course of the license. We don't think the benefits warrant that cost. And that's it. Thanks, Jim. You're welcome. And with that, I am going to turn it over to CDFW. And it looks like it will be Sean Hubler and Beth Lawson. Let's make sure you're both unmuted while the presentation comes up. Can you guys hear me? This is yeah, Sean. Yeah, we can hear you, Sean. And this is Beth. Yeah, I think so, Josh Sean is speaking to this one. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Beth. All right, Sean, we can so, hear you. Uh, perfect. Um, uh, thank you um, to the Water Board and Jim for your presentation. Um, I'm also here to talk to you guys about Condition 8-9. Uh, I'm talking to them jointly as one presentation about large wood and sediment in the North Yuba River. And, you know, I previously introduced myself as, you know, Sean with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. I've been working on the Yuba for over 10 years on this project. So um, with that, next slide, please. And so in August of 27 of uh, last month, you know, the Water Board provided us with three clarifying questions that they would like to uh, better understand. And to start with, I'll just start with the first question where the water board was seeking clarification on, you know, um, what are the quantifiable benefits to resident fish populations for doing this type of habitat enhancement? And, you know, just to kind of give you some context, you know, habitat improvement projects uh, are, are known for increasing habitat for adult fish, as well as larval and juvenile fish. Um, you know, for example, when you add and gravel placements are put in, it increases habitat availability to adults for to build nests or reds and lay their eggs in while also producing uh, nursery backwater uh, habitats for, for fish and that emerge from those gravels. You know, same could be said for large woody material as well. Next slide, please. And so there's a long list of peer reviewed and gray literature that demonstrate these quantifiable benefits of adding wood and gravel, um, 
you know, and there's a list of uh, references here that I provide. You know, not all of these are from California, but they do serve as a proxy for getting us to the point of how we understand what those quantifiable benefits are. And so uh, I'd like to just discuss with you three recent examples that demonstrate this uh, on a short term, intermediate, and long term benefit to habitat enhancements for salmonids themselves. Next slide, please. So starting with something close to home, uh, you know, Yuba County Water Agency uh, has a narrow sea large woody material mitigation monitoring report that they put out for mitigation of a 2019 project. So one year post installation, Yuba County Water Agency reported that large woody material placed um, at three locations in the lower Yuba River. So these would be root wads and crown like that are pictured. This is taken during um, the picture is taken during implementation. Um, and they reported results showed that the average overall density of juvenile salmonids were generally greater in wood treatment sites than, uh, than at non-treatment uh, reference sites. Next slide, please. Um, moving on to Crafter 2018. Um, the, he measured the response of trout biomass to habitat enhancements. Um, monitoring trout populations post Habitat enhancement was done from 2012 to 2017, and found that trout abundance and biomass tripled after the habitat enhancement measures were added. Uh, next slide, please. And lastly, for looking at the long-term benefits, uh, White et al. studied the response of trout populations two decades after habitat enhancements were completed. Uh, trout abundance and biomass, uh, biomass was measured annually from 1987 to 94 and then resampled again in 2009. And they found that the adult trout abundance increased rapidly after the initial habitat enhancements, and that trout biomass remained 53% higher in treatment sections than in the control sections uh, 21 years later. Next slide, please. So, you know, lastly, here's a couple of photos. We've seen a few that uh, Mr. Lynch provided that you know, show the 2.4 mile New Boers Bar reach. Uh, so the picture on the left is below the New Boers Bar Dam, and the picture on the right is just upstream of the confluence. And, you know, what we see is uh, a system that has lost most of its ecological function as a result of impacts due to reduced flows, no passage of wood, and loss of real sediment inputs. And so, you know, these pictures do tell us a lot, but the relicensing studies also show um, that you know, populations of fish are really kind of depressed in the New Boers Bar Reach, and that's likely due to the limitations and the quality of spawning gravels that they're able to find. Next slide, please. And so the relicensing studies uh, paint the same picture, um, you know, um, in the North Huber River, as we heard, that uh, there were 13 pieces of wood um, that were found in the, in the reach itself. Um, I mean, this is small compared to when you look at uh, the um, Oregon Creek reaches and the middle Yuba reaches, which do have similar average gradients itself. Most importantly, that those 13 pieces stuck in the, in the, in the river itself. And I uh, wish they were bigger, but they weren't. They were small pieces. Uh, but it does show that if you put wood in there, there's the potential for it to stick. And then also, you know, we talked about the sediment input. You can see from the small table uh, at the bottom of this slide that the project completely holds back any new sediment from coming in. And that's why you have this like stripped out appearance uh, when you see the pictures of the new forest bar reach. Next slide, please. So, you know, that moves us on to the water board's second clarifying question. And, you know, you really wanted to understand how these cost estimates for doing these uh, augmentations were reached in the North Yuba. And, you know, for CDFW, you know, our cost estimates um, were based on the individual measures of looking at wood and gravel separately. Um, next slide, please. Um, but the cost estimates proposed by Yuba Water, County Water Agency only looked at one method for deploying wood and gravel in the new forest bar reef, and that was by helicopter specifically. Um, and additionally, Yuba County Water Agency did not scope synergy of future projects and current management actions that could provide alternative deployment options 
as well as reduce the overall habitat enhancement costs. Um, so if you look at the, the three most commonly methods that the department scoped and looked at uh, were helicopter, which is obviously one of the highest ways of, of, of putting in these habitat enhancement to direct trucking of logs in, as well as uh, cable, cable lining, just like they do in the timber industry. And all of our cost estimates were derived from looking at how the forest services uh, looks at these costs as well. Um, next slide, please. And so just looking at large woody material mitigation, you know, here I'm just presenting the cost of log truck deployment and helicopter flights. And you'll see that the cost comes down quite a bit when you're able to truck wood in. Um, I mean, there are some costs in there that the department couldn't, think it couldn't uh, estimate because, you know, we don't have the uh, ability of scoping out the entire project. But, you know, we pri primarily uh, estimate that it's going to be between 180 and 120 to put the wood in um, with a truck. You know, conversely, helicopters, as I mentioned, is a lot more expensive. And it does depend on the number of flights and the sizes of wood, because that dictates how many pieces can be flown at any one time. And so based on rough estimates of the trips to flights, you know, the department estimated the cost at $175,000 to $250,000. Um, and you know, most importantly, this does not include the cost of sourcing the wood in any of our cost estimates. Similarly for gravel, which we'll talk about in a minute. Next slide, please. So, you know, once again, gravel augmentation, Yuba County Water Agency only considered cost estimates by placement of helicopter, which is an astronomical cost due to the number of trips you would have to take and the year and a half it would likely take if you did put gravel in through that method. Um, they did not necessarily scope out the cost of uh, placing gravel via other methods that are possible. For example, directly placing via truck uh, or even sluicing the gravel in uh, in a similar fashion that is done on the Lower Yuba River. Um, so based on doing those two methods, CDFW estimates that uh, the cost of either trucking or sluicing would be between 245,000 and 260. Um, of course, these cost estimates would require some additional refinement. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, you know, I talked about Project Synergy is available to Yuba County Water Agency. Um, so Yuba County Water Agency has many planned projects as well as are currently actively uh, managing uh, projects that could be utilized to reduce costs or provide a cost savings. So for example, Yuba County Water Agency actively manages and removes gravel deposits in two diversion dams. Um, so our house and log cabin diversion dams are identified in the top right uh, picture. And then uh, just below that picture is actually the sediment deposit behind one of those dams. And so in 2017, Yuba County Water Sea removed up to 10,000 tons of gravel at the log cabin diversion dam. And, and this year, they're estimated to remove up to 40,000 tons of gravel and sediment from the R house diversion dam on the middle Yuba River. Um, also, Yuba County Water Sea has large wood stockpiles that are collected from New Bullard Bar Reservoir, and they're stored in uh, several accessible coves, as you see in the picture on the bottom left. And then the last thing I want to point out is that, you know, uh, Yuba County Water Sea will be building an auxiliary spillway um, that potentially could require the, a new wider road uh, to be developed in support of the construction. And so in the picture of the spillway you see at the top left, you can, uh, at the bottom of the spill, you can see the tail remnants. Uh, there's a line there in the, in the forest that shows you where that road currently is. Uh, so there is a road. It just needs to be uh, enhanced or, or, or some fashion to be worked out to figure out ways of reducing those costs that they can implement uh, gravel augmentations with other strategies. Next slide, please. Hey, Sean, you've uh, used up your time. So if you can wrap it up, um, sure. that would yep. be greatly appreciated. No problem. So uh, uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. So, um, you know, the water board wanted to understand how, um, you know, if the wood and gravel would stick somewhere. Next slide, please. Um, and, and so that's a great question and one that the relicensing participants really tried to work out during relicensing. And we had similar questions about the movement of the wood and how the occurrence intervals would interact with it. And so during relicensing, uh, we worked with um, the licensee to develop a pilot study 
that would um, that would help identify, you know, the anticipated movement at gravel base. But more importantly, it would enable da data-driven adapt adaptive management of the uh, new board far reach, and um, where there's no volitional passage to sediment, you know, to and uh, to inform future management actions, including a potential off-ramp for them at the time uh, was one of the actions. Um, you know, similar um, mitigation measures have been adopted by uh, the licensee, the County Water Sea for uh, Oregon Creek and Middle Yuba River. The only difference is uh, between those and North Yuba is that there's no um, 4E authority uh, in this location that would provide for that. Um, so it's up to the water board to be able to really um, help this river reach. So uh, next slide, last, last slide. Um, and next slide, please. All right, and so, you know, you've seen this picture a lot in all of our slides. This is actually the North Yuba River above New Forest Bar Reservoir. And, and what you see is, you see there's ecological function intact. There's plenty of available spawning and rearing habitat. There's a healthy recruitment of riparian canopy. Uh, with the help of the water board, we can start to make improvements to the long neglected North Yuba River below New Forest Bar Dam. With the addition of wood and gravel, we can transform this reach. And thank you guys for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks, John. So now we'll move into our discussion timing. We have about 15 minutes to chat. Um, YCWA, do any of you have any questions for CDFW on what we just saw? I'll ask, do, do any of the petitioners have any questions? If you do, could you raise your hand? Looks like Aaron Zettlerman has a question. If we could unmute Aaron. Yeah, thank you very much. Got a question for YCWA. Um, so this is no doubt a narrow dynamic system and we wouldn't expect the same channel forms here as in the lower Yuba River, but without the dam, we're gonna get gravel moving into the system. We're gonna get wood moving into and through the system during large pulses, high flow events, you know, there's going to be a lot of movement. And then on that falling limb, some deposition during lower flow events, maybe no movement at all of gravels or wood, generally stable forms. And of course, the addition of wood to the system is going to help trap gravel in these sort of micro habitat features, which we see upstream of the dam, but not below. And I guess my question is, if you could talk a little bit about how the spatial and temporal resolution of the sediment transport model, which seems to indicate, according to your results, no benefit to the habitat, how that sediment transport model relates to the smaller sort of micro habitat unit scale, which is what we would expect to see in this ge geomorphic context. And also wondering if that sediment transport model includes the positive feedback of bar building we would expect with additional wood. Jim, are you the one to unmute or is there someone else at YCWA that we should unmute? Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for that question. Uh, in terms of the model itself, I am not a geomorphologist. I did not develop the model. I'd encourage you to take a look at the geomorphology technical memorandum. Uh, the study plan was developed in consultation with all the agencies and NGOs, as well as other interested parties. Uh, we performed the study as designed. Uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't give you the details on uh, the microhabitat approach. It's something uh, you'd have to take a look at. Uh, and I will say uh, the idea, I, I wasn't quite sure when you said the wood pass, more wood's going to be passing through. Were you referring to the, 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 the North Yuba River or the Lower Yuba River? I, I wasn't quite sure at that point. Aaron. Oh, I'm sorry, you're on mute. <laughs> Aaron, thumb up for uh, North Yuba River. <laughs> we can unmute you if you raise your hand, Aaron. It'll be easier. Perfect. We should I just Thanks, got it. Aaron. Sorry. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, um, I I was specifically thinking uh, North Yuba here. Is that sort of the, sure. the condition? Although, sure, okay. uh, you know, wood movement, yep. the stuff in the upper portion ultimately does work its way all the way to the ocean in a, you know, a, pr a truly natural system. Again, yes. Uh, in terms of the North Yuba River, uh, the upstream area is significant, diff significantly different. I think uh, uh, 
Sean did a nice job of showing that. It's also a much shallower gradient, uh, very different in a lot of forms, in a lot of ways, unimpaired entirely, um, of all sorts of conditions. Uh, but it is quite a bit of a different gradient. In our response to questions, we had a, I took that out of this one. We had a slide that showed the gradient upstream of uh, the New Bullets Bar Dam Reservoir and the slide downstream, and it kind of looked like a cliff. Uh, going off. So it's, it's quite different. And as you know, the geomorph geomorphological processes are quite different. So I apologize, I can't answer your detailed technical questions. I would refer you to that tech memo. All right. All sure. right. Yep. If I could answer that, I, I, boy, I would know a lot more than I know now, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, other questions? Yes, I see Beth. Oops, Beth, I think. Go ahead if you can unmute yourself. Yeah, and I just wanted to point out um, that as Sean and I are talking about this reach, we're not just talking about restoring this reach, um, which is the short reach below New Bullard's Bar, which is, I think, only 2.3 miles long, but that additional 5.8 miles, um, which is publicly accessible above Colgate Powerhouse, um, is a reach that we're looking to improve with the wood, the gravel, and the flow measures. That would additionally be improved by all of these habitat benefits. Thanks, Beth. Are there any other questions from the petitioners? I'm sorry, I, my screen froze. Was there a question in there from Beth? I think she was just making a comment. Is that right, okay. Beth? Okay. Yeah, okay. sorry. Nodding. In, in no response worries. to the information that folks have provided. So, no are there Thank any you. other questions? Are there any other questions from the petitioners? Any state water board questions? I have one for Sean. You had mentioned the cost of doing some of the placement of, I think it was large woody material and maybe the sediment too, of being like 175,000 to 200. Given that I wasn't really totally sure if you said this would happen you know, more than once, but do you anticipate that kind of cost every time you have to do large woody material placement? Uh, can you hear me? Yep. So, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so part of uh, the pilot study would have answered some of those questions. Um, so it's not sure particularly how long it would take some of that material to move out of the system downstream because in a normal river system, material would be continually moving down, including wood and gravel. So um, I can't answer that question directly, but the implied benefit is that it would, that there may not necessarily be a need to constantly go in there and replenish it completely. But the idea was that if the pilot study showed something where it could just be topped off, that's a different story where it's like, oh, we need to add five more pieces or another thousand tons of gravel to top off the pile. Um, so, yeah. Thanks. And just for my own curiosity, are they still anchoring large woody material? Because you keep saying stick. And I'm not sure what you mean by it sticking, besides you're referring to it staying, but is it because it's just sure. heavy or because it's anchored? So, so sticking means like lodging between the boulders uh, and, you know, becoming the gravel inundating, say like the, the root wad or the crown, you know, similar to those pictures we saw where um, if it's placed, they're likely anchoring it. But if it's being sorted by the river itself by spill, then there are opportunities for the wood to be lodged in different areas that then serves a, a geomorphic purpose of in, you know, keeping gravel and, and sorting it and everything else. And then once all the sorting of the gravel behind the wood is done, it sorts out fines, you get riparian establishment again. So I mean, it's, that's what I mean by sticking. Thanks, that's helpful. I think that's all I have in terms of questions regarding these two conditions. Are there any other questions from State Water Board? about conditions eight and nine. I'm not seeing any, so we can take a break. But before we do that, I just want to remind anyone who wants to speak at the end of the day for the public comment period, um, please, 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 you have to fill out a speaker card so we can get you the information that you need um, to be able to join us and make your comment. It's found, um, there's a link in the public notice for this workshop on the State Water Board webpage for the Uber River Development Project. So make sure you get that in 
um, if you'd like to make a comment at the end of the day. Um, so with that, I think we'll take a 15 minute break and come back at 315. Thanks everyone.
All right, looks like it is 3.15, so we should go ahead and get started. Courtney, if you could quickly show the workshop notice that we sent over to you, and I can show people where the link to the forms is in case they still need that. So this is the um, notice for the workshop today. Um, here in the middle under participants that plan to comment, it says online form. If you go to our website and find this document, you can click that. Otherwise, you can also email this email address down at the bottom. It says wr401 program at waterboards.ca.gov. And if you'll notice, waterboards is plural. Send an email there and we can help direct you to the form to fill out a speaker card so that you can speak. And to make it easy to get to this form, um, if you go to the board's calendar and you look at so it's the same calendar you would go to for any board meeting, you will see this on the board's calendar for September 17th, and it will have a link to this notice. Thanks, Erin. If you wish to, yeah, if you wish to comment during our comment period later today, please, please. So now and fill out this online form so we can get you in the queue to provide comments. So with that, I'm gonna hand it off to YCWA and their condition 20 presentation. And I believe their speaker is Tom Johnson. Thanks, Tom. Can we test your mic, Tom, make sure we can hear you. Sure, how's that? That's great. And there's your presentation. Right. So you're all set. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and um, happy Friday. I'm sure this is, uh, we're all having fun on a Friday afternoon. Um, so let's get right through this. Next slide, please. Introduced myself earlier. Hopefully, you recall from this morning. Um, this water quality condition calls for a study and proposal for fish passage and indicates the potential for requiring implementation of some sort of passage by Uber Water Agency. Next slide, please. So the rationale attributes some responsibility for passage and, and reintroduction to YCWA because its operations rely on Inglebright Dam for peaking. Let's put a pin in that and go to the next slide, please. So I think we can all agree that Inglebright Dam is the barrier to passage. It has been there since 1940. It is a uh, solid, unpassable uh, concrete barrier in the river. Inglebright Dam does have a specific purpose. It does sequester hydraulic mining sediment. Uh, given the discussion this morning about how much sediment went downstream prior to the construction of Inglebright, one could argue that perhaps it's a bit of closing the gate behind the horse, but that dam does still sequester over 30 million yards of material. And a lot of that material has uh, mercury and other toxic materials. Um, so a couple of other things. Let's be clear that a full decommissioning and removal of all Yuba Water Agency facilities would not restore passage. There would still be Englebright Dam, there would still be no passage, nothing would change. Also, it was stated this morning that a um, uh, couple of comments in one of the er earlier presentations about the dams that Yuba Water Agency relies on. Let's also be clear that the primary mission of Yuba Water Agency is water supply and flood control. If Inglebright Dam were ever removed, Yuba Water Agency would still operate New Bullard's Bar Dam. It would still do water supply and flood control. It would still produce most of the energy that it produces now, albeit admittedly not in as flexible uh, a manner. And so there would certainly be changes to operations, but the fundamental um, mission of Yuba Water Agency would continue. 
So we just want to be clear about uh, what the relationship is between Yuba Water Agency, the Corps of Engineers, and Englebright Dam. Next slide, please. So as has been documented in materials filed with the board, not just by Yuba Water Agency, but I believe with CDFW and others, there has been studies of passage into the upper Yuba watershed for quite some time. I personally have participated since sometime in late 2000. Um, I know that millions of dollars have been spent. Um, a back of the envelope calculation toted up something north of $13 million by state and local agencies that has been spent in looking at habitat, facilities, and so forth. I know of that $13 million estimate, Yuba Water has uh, contributed quite a bit in terms of funding, direct funding consultants and staff time. Yuba Water has participated in all of the initiatives. And the one thing that I would say based on the better part of 20 years of experience and participation is that there is no silver bullet for the Yuba Watershed. There is no clear single answer if we do this, we solve it. And in fact, um, in one proceeding, there was a straw poll amongst all of the stakeholders after oh, two and a half years of work and study and, and, and uh, careful effort. And among those stakeholders, there was a divided opinion as to whether the North Yuba, Middle Yuba, or Lower Yuba would be the top tier of candidates for a focused restoration and reintroduction program. And I think in fairness, um, uh, certainly CSPA's presentation and perhaps CDFW alludes to this as well. Next slide. I think one of the problems that we have encountered in looking at passage on the North Yuba is that all of the, all of the alternatives are technically very difficult and therefore hugely expensive. And there's just a couple of examples here um, we looked at, in one initiative, we looked at fish ladders past Inglebright Dam, and the technical challenges to constructing such a ladder, uh, first and foremost, in a narrow, confined canyon with flood flows over the top of the dam, means your ladder is, has to be armored uh, to withstand a nuclear strike to be able to survive. Uh, tailwater fluctuations of over 50 feet, headwater fluctuations of north of 30 feet. It's a very challenging location. We looked extensively at Trap and Hall into the North or Middle Yuba rivers. There's very major collection facilities required both in the lower Yuba and in the upper reaches. We are potentially um, getting past uh, close to a thousand vertical feet of concrete. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of dams up there, depending on where you're going to go. Um, collecting some juvenile fish either in reservoir or on stream is very difficult. Nothing that can't be solved. Don't get me wrong. We can put people on the moon. In fact, uh, Jeff Bezos can put people in space. We can certainly solve all of these problems. It's expensive. Next slide, please. There's a few other uh, challenges um, in some, in one of the modeling efforts, and I don't know if this is uh, definitive or not, but their uh, NIMS in 2012 looked at a uh, total population model for the watershed and came up with a total of 3000 REDS per year. That was on average, obviously goes up and down with hydrologic year type. But with that sort of uh, return, if that was indeed the, the limit of a successful population, uh, that would be a challenge. And then finally, all of the passage alternatives, most of the facilities that have been looked at are outside of FERC boundaries, which introduces another host of problems. Next slide, please. I'm watching, I'm not at 10 minutes yet. Um, there are three FERC licensees and the federal government, all of whom operate major impoundments or diversion facilities in the watershed. Uh, there's a number of powerhouses, conduits, tunnels, this, that, and the other. Uh, none of the, or, or very few of the passage facilities that I'm aware of that have been evaluated to date in any of the initiatives are necessarily within uh, FERC boundaries. In other words, if you 
look to build the most efficacious and efficient projects, there's a very good chance that you would be locating facilities largely on either forest service or private lands. And as you all are aware, that would introduce um, a number of challenges, many approvals or permissions, multiple entities. And when you have that many stakeholders, um, as we've certainly seen in other reintroduction efforts in the San Joaquin and, and above Shasta, you run into the potential for a single obstinate stakeholder to take down the whole program. And so the conclusion that Yuba Water Agency has reached is it really a collaborative approach that uh, doesn't necessarily seek to attribute um, a fault or, or direct obligation, but rather tries to engage stakeholders in a positive way, bring people to the table and find a solution that works for everybody and could be a successful reintroduction uh, solution is really the only way uh, forward. Next slide, please. So uh, conclusion, we've covered all these points. Uh, passage is blocked by Englebright Bright Dam, not Yuba Water Facilities. We have studied extensively um, the number of different options for reintroduction. And I think uh, given the, the challenges and the number of stakeholders that would be involved in any sort of a reintroduction, really collaboration is the only way forward. And uh, hats off to NIMS and CDFW because I think as you'll hear in a subsequent presentation, uh, they are leading in a new initiative to try and forge such a collaboration. That's all I have uh, with 20 seconds to spare. And um, thank you and we look forward to any questions. Thanks, Tom. I think next up we have CDFW Condition 20 presentation and our speakers will be Brianna CP. Hi, can you hear me okay? We sure can. So once we get the presentation up, go ahead and begin. Thanks, Kristen. I'll introduce myself in the meantime. Um, I spoke briefly earlier. My name is Brianna CP, and I'm Water Program Supervisor for the North Central Region for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. So next slide, please. Um, we chose to answer the questions fairly narrowly that the board uh, proposed. So I'll read the questions um, and, then, and then provide our feedback. So the board asked, given all the prior work related to the evaluation of potential fish passage alternatives in the Yuba River, what passage alternatives the CBSW think is most feasible and preferable and why? So currently, we feel the most practical path towards identifying a fish passage project with the best chance of success on the Yuba is to do so in a stepwise process and a collaborative process that starts with pilot studies. Um, so this, this is kind of echoing what Tom spoke about earlier. Um, we seek watershed specific information that will help inform the design of what the most feasible and preferable fish passage project would be when fully scaled up. Um, the Upper Yuba River Watershed Pilot Project and Field Studies would answer fundamental scientific questions to inform a logical progression towards the goal of an implementable full-scale passage project in the Upper Yuba River Watershed. Next slide, please. And the second question the board posed is what is the current status and the next steps for fish passage in the Yuba River? So currently we are working alongside NOAA Fisheries, YCWA and other water providers, other state and federal agencies and NGOs in what we call the Yuba Reintroduction Working Group to investigate the biological, technical and funding feasibility of reintroducing spring run shook salmon to their historical habitat in the Upper Yuba River watershed. Um, the, the development and implementation of a pilot program is our fundamental and preliminary first step towards establishing any sort of viable reintroduced population. And this working group and um, the, the charter for the working group is currently pending finalization and technical teams are beginning to meet to scope key questions and methods for designing pilot scale projects. And, and, and like Tom alluded to, there's been a long legacy of work and so we're trying to be you know, cue off the previous work, um, but but pick a path that is practical and attainable, mm -hmm. and 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 that where we could find kind of cooperation mm -hmm. and consensus among the many parties um, that have an interest in in the outcome of this process. And and that's it for us today. Thank you.
Thanks, Brianna. Um, next, we'll do the NGO presentation. And I believe that is Melinda Booth and Ashley Overhouse. Good afternoon, sound check. Yep, I can hear you, Melinda. Ashley, can we do a mic check real quick? Good afternoon, this is Ashley, can you hear me? Yes, we can, great. So your presentation is up, I'll hand it off to you all. Wonderful, thank you so much. Good afternoon, Melinda Booth. I'm the executive director for the South Yuba River Citizens League. I'm joined for this presentation by my colleague, Ashley Overhouse, Resilient Rivers Director with Friends of the River, and we'll be addressing questions on condition 20, fish passage. Next slide. So condition 20 requires YCWA to develop a report that includes a proposal regarding fisheries reintroduction to reduce project related effects to listed salmonids. Despite FERC mandated studies and efforts by other parties, including NIMPS and CDFW to inform fish passage efforts, there's still no tangible plan for fish passage at this time. Next slide. Historically, these fish had access to all three forks of the Yuba River and tributaries and were only impeded by natural barriers much higher in the watershed. Today, Daguerre Point Dam and associated diversions at River Mile 11 and a half terminally block passage for green sturgeon and function as an upstream and downstream bottleneck impeding passage for steelhead and Chinook salmon. And then Englebright Dam at River Mile 23.9 terminally blocks passage of Chinook salmon and steelhead. Englebright was built to address historical mining debris and done so without fish passage facilities. Despite later reauthorization to include hydropower and recreation, fish passage was again not considered. Englebright cuts off access to spawning grounds in the upper Yuba watershed, reducing salmon habitat by 97%. NIMS lists the lower Yuba River as designated critical habitat under the Endangered Species Act for all three species. Essential fish habitat for salmon, mandated under the Magnuson-Stevens Act, is identified above Englebright and even above New Bullard's Bar. NIMS recovery plan explicitly states that listed runs of salmon and steelhead in the Central Valley cannot be recovered without passage upstream of rim dams, and climate change is making this issue even more urgent. Additionally, the upper Yuba River is identified as having the greatest potential to increase populations of salmon and steelhead than any other Central, Central Valley watershed. Next slide. Englebright Dam impounds the Yuba River and Englebright Reservoir. Yuba Water Agency stores and re-regulates flows in Englebright Reservoir under its rights and contracts. Consequently, Englebright Dam is used and useful to the Yuba River Development Project. And as a terminal barrier to essential upstream fish habitat, this fish passage barrier must be mitigated as part of the YRDP license. Next slide. So pre-gold rush, it's estimated that 150,000 Spring Run Chinook return to the Yuba River watershed annually. Today, the numbers are grim. Recent data suggests that from 2015 to 2019, an average of only 439 Spring Run Chinook salmon ascended the fish ladders annually. And similar trends are observed for steelhead. Historic estimates range from 7,500 to 300,000 a year. Um, and during the drought years from 2012 to 2016, only 91 on average were counted annually. Next slide. The US Fish and Wildlife Service is anadromous fish restoration program identified a goal to double the natural production of Chinook in rivers across the Central Valley. And in the Lower Yuba River, this goal is 66,000 fish produced annually. So you can see that the numbers have not reached the doubling goal as indicated by the black line across the top. And in fact, there's a general negative trend suggesting that business as usual is not sufficient to recover salmon. Most importantly for the biology of the fish is how wet years create a stronger returning run three to four years later. These wet years are when Englebright spills, creating more natural connectivity to the river. And YRDP's operations reduce the spilling of Englebright, further compounding negative effects to passage that must and can be mitigated. I'd like to turn the presentation to my colleague, Ashley Overhouse. Next slide. Thanks, Melinda. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Ashley Overhouse with Friends of the River. I would like to reiterate CSPA et al's concerns with the condition, both for the formal record and for all stakeholders present. The open-ended and essentially duplicative condition 20 creates technical problems of interpretation, legal ones as well, which we will not address today. 
Condition 20 also doesn't actually achieve any mitigation for the lack of fish passage at Englebright or New Willard's Bar Dams or improve fish passage at Daguerre. It further delays action that will move the needle. Next slide. CSPA et al. believes the Water Board must identify a reasonable range of options specific to improving fish passage at Englebright, New Bullard's Bar, and define YCWA's contribution to improve fish passage based on the administrative record. Next slide. The Water Board sent CSPA et al. clarifying questions on this condition on August 27th. We will review those now. Question one, given all the prior work related to the evaluation of potential fish passage alternatives, what alternatives does CSPA et al. think are the most feasible and why? Slide 10, please, next slide. First and foremost, there is no consensus within CSPA et al. on what is the most feasible option. However, we have listed a suite of feasible options on this slide, and there's additional technical analysis of these options available in the administrative record. Additionally, CSPA et al. believes that Condition 20 should be rooted in the data and information already available on the record. And if the Water Board requires additional information or technical analysis on a particular option, we request they make that determination. Finally, we encourage the Water Board to be engaged in different conversations with all relevant stakeholders on these fish passage alternatives moving forward when considering potential amendments and decide what is most feasible rather than asking different entities. Next slide. Question two, the petition suggests YCWA be assigned a percentage of responsibility for fish passage. What percent of the fish passage effort should YCWA be assigned or how should this percentage be determined? Again, this is a policy and legal question, one that CSPA et al. does not feel this workshop should or can address effectively due to time and legal constraints. Back to you, Melinda. Thank you so much, next slide. So for question three, it was, what is the current status and the next steps for fish passage in the Yuba River? Next slide. So to understand what's happening today, I think it's helpful to review some of the efforts to date. Convened in 2010, the Yuba Salmon Forum was a multi-stakeholder effort to develop and implement a collaborative process to address anadromous fish restoration and water management issues in the Yuba watershed. The forum was effectively suspended when several Yuba Salmon Forum partners formed the Yuba Salmon Partnership Initiative to focus on a trap and haul project to reintroduce Chinook into the upper watershed. Circle and Friends of the River were not participants in YSPI and thus have little to share on any details of that here. Reintroduction efforts have resurfaced, as you've heard, with the Yuba Reintroduction Working Group, and I'll discuss that in more detail shortly. Next slide. So since 2002, there's been active litigation in the Yuba River watershed over key federal actions and in infrastructure that impede or completely block fish passage, including Englebright and Daguerre Point dams, both operated and maintained by the Army Corps of Engineers, but necessary to YRDP operations. After Friends of the River and Circle won a lengthy court battle, NIMPS issued a landmark biological opinion in 2012 finding that the Corps' dams and other actions on the Yuba River, including permits to YCWA, jeopardize the survival and recovery of the river's threatened fish species. This biop advised the Corps that to comply with the Endangered Species Act, they should implement significant fish passage measures, including potentially modifying or removing the dams. However, after intense opposition and pressure from the Corps and YWA, NIMS reversed course. And in 2014, NIMS issued a new biological opinion and concurrence finding that the Corps was not responsible for the harm caused by its Yuba River dams and removing any requirements for fish passage improvements to those dams. In 2016, Friends of the River filed a lawsuit challenging that 2014 biological opinion and concurrence. And in 2019, Friends of the River won a really important court ruling in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. The court found that that 2014 biological opinion and concurrence were arbitrary and capricious because the fishery service failed to explain why after more than a decade considering Englebright and Daguerre to be part of the Corps' project subject to the Endangered Species Act, that the fishery service abruptly reversed course. So as a result, NIMS must make a choice now whether to further explain its 2014 decisions or start over, reinitiate consultation with the Corps and issue a new biological opinion. NIMS told the court that they'll make their decision about which course to pursue by this November. If the agencies decide not to issue a new biological opinion and instead stand by that 2014 decision, the lawsuit will resume and Friends of the River's other claims challenging the biological opinion and the course take of the threatened fish will once again be before the court. 
So Friends of the River can keep the water board informed as appropriate. And additionally, specific legal filings are available online uh, on Friends of the River and Circle's websites. Next slide. So as the Yuba Salmon Partnership initiative effort did not result in any fish passage project, NIMS and CDFW joined together to try again, inviting many of the same partners and stakeholders from YSPI and the prior Yuba Salmon Forum to the table to work towards a pilot reintroduction project for fish in the Yuba River above Englebright Dam. In December 2020, NIMS moved forward designating an experimental non-essential status for Chinook salmon for said reintroduction efforts. That designation is currently pending with an unknown time frame for a decision. But in the meantime, the collaborative Yuba Reintroduction Working Group has been meeting with the goal of agreeing on a pilot reintroduction effort for getting fish above Englebright. Generally, this group meets monthly and technical subgroups meet as needed on topics such as broodstock, fundraising, communications, etc. No decision as to the what of reintroduction has yet been made. Next slide and last slide. From personal communication with Nisenan tribal spokesperson Shelley Covert, salmon were and remain an essential part of the Nisenan's culture and their historical diet. Salmon were transited by hand throughout the watershed by the Nisenan to get above waterfalls they otherwise wouldn't be able to, or at least not in every water year. Human intervention with fish passage into the upper reaches of the watershed is not a novel idea. So while the reintroduction efforts being discussed today are much more sophisticated than past methods, Precedent exists to intervene. These species are on the brink of extinction and timely intervention is needed to ensure their long-term survival, especially when climatic stochasticity is considered. We believe the ultimate goal is to restore access to historic, to historic spawning habitat through volitional means, allowing these fish their best chance at survival. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so now we're in our discussion period. We have about 15 minutes to chat. Do any of the petitioners have any questions for each other? If so, please raise your Zoom hand. Looks like Ryan has one, if we can unmute Ryan. Yeah, thank you, Ryan Bezerra for Yuba County Water Agency. I just wanna briefly object to Ms. Booth's rather extended an editorial description of the ongoing Friends of the River litigation. Um, I understood this to be a technical workshop um, that was obviously not particularly technical. So I wanna to object to that as any sort of basis. And if we wanna get into the legal issues associated with all of this at some future point in this rec reconsideration process, we certainly can do that, but today's not the day for that as I understand it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other petitioner questions or anything? I'm not seeing any hands, so I'm gonna turn it over to sit water board participants. If there's any questions there. I mean, before we go into any questions, it's Parker. I was just again, wanna thank everybody for being here throughout the day and providing their presentations on these topics and clarification on, you know, comment or questions we had um, from the petitions. And so it's been really helpful. Thank you, everybody. Any other thoughts, State Water Board representatives? Thank, thank you everybody for your presentations today. I know it took a lot of time and effort to pull the information together and it is greatly appreciated. I really think that it's been beneficial to get all of this information and to have this exchange of information. I wanted to check in with folks. Sorry, I have a cat in front of me right now. So I will 
turn on my camera. Um, but um, I did want to check in. I think the next thing we had on the agenda for today is to go to additional discussion. I wanted to check in with the petitioners to see if there's any other topics that folks thought about as we were having this conversation, um, any other items based on the conditions we spoke to earlier that folks feel like they have questions about or they have thought of something in the period of time between 9 a.m. this morning and now. If you do, if you could raise your hand, this is the time we allotted to have that additional conversation. Aaron. Sorry, this is a, a, a brief question. Can I'm having a hard time finding the tech memo on sediment transport. Um, if somebody could from YCWA could help let me know what the title is, then I can pull it off the um, FTP site. Go ahead, Willie. Hey, Aaron, no problem. Um, we'll figure that out and uh, send you an email on that. Anything else that folks want to check in on? Okay. Well, Thank you everybody for being so timely and again for preparing for today and providing all the information. Um, I think we'll move on to the comment section of our agenda right now. And Janine, I assume you have the order of speakers and we'll be calling on them, but if you need us to do that, let me know. No, I can go ahead and do it currently right now. Um, the first two speakers are not on the platform. I have a Kanetta Brown or a Michael Maher. Um, neither one are on the platform. Thomas Berliner was on, but I don't believe he is on any longer. Uh, the next one would be Danielle Blasett Hayden, and she is not on the platform as well. So the next one I have is Andrea Abergel. I'm going to go ahead, Andrea, and um, ask you to unmute. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. And um, Danielle Blasted Hayden, if she does come on, um, I'm we're presenting the the same comments. I'm just here if she wasn't able, so I'll be taking her spot. Thank um, you. For listening. Yes, thank you. Um, so my name is Andrea Abergel. I'm the senior regulatory advocate with the California Municipal Utilities Association. And we represent both publicly owned electric utilities and public water agencies, including Yuba Water Agency. CMUA appreciates the opportunity to comment on the State Water Board staff water quality certification issued in July, 2020, because we believe the certification poses substantial risk to Yuba Water's hydroelectric generating assets which are a key contributor to the stability and reliability of the state's energy grid. I have two main points I wanted to make. Uh, first, that the state's energy grid benefits from Yuba Water's reliable, flexible hydroelectric generation. The state board staff issued the certification back in July, 2020. And that same summer, we saw record breaking heat and wildfires that remind us all of what we already know. Climate change is here. And in August, during an intense heat wave, an energy shortage resulted in rolling blackouts throughout the state. During this power emergency, Yuba Water played a key role in reducing strain on the state's energy grid. In fact, additional power provided by Yuba Water this summer supplied energy for 20,000 homes and businesses and helped CAISO, which facilitates power transactions for 80% of the state and mitigates additional rolling blackouts. My second point is that Yuba Water is a key partner in ensuring the stability of the state's grid. Unfortunately, the energy shortfall of the summer of 2020 was not an isolated event. 
And in fact, just a few weeks ago on July 30th, the governor issued a pro proclamation of the state of emergency that identified a previously unforeseen shortfall of up to 5,000 megawatts that is now projected for the summer of 2022. Yuba Water has already established itself as a partner in meeting the state's energy goals, in part because power generated by Yuba Water is sold directly into the CAISO market to enhance the reliability and stability of the state's grid. In closing, the State Water Board's current certification, which would undoubtedly threaten Yuba Water's operational capabilities and negatively impact ability to help meet the state's energy and climate resilience goals. It would also compromise Yuba Water's ability to collaborate on a wide range of state, local, and federal efforts, including large-scale fish and wildlife habit re habitat restoration. So we encourage you to withdraw the certification and work collaboratively with Yuba Water to resolve concerns in a transparent manner. Thank you very much for your time and your consideration of these comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the next speaker would be Dr. Francisco Raveles. And I will go ahead and ask you to unmute. And while you're doing that, Janine, I just want to flag for people that there's a three minute timer that folks should be able to see um, that that's on the screen since we didn't mention that for the first speaker, but she was very succinct. So thank you. Okay. Are you able to unmute, sir? Is that better? Yes, it is, sir. Yeah. Very good. Thank you so much. You know, first and foremost, people who know me, I first off start by offering my respect and my appreciation for the privilege of your time for the State Water Board. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm the Yuba County Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Ravellis. I, um, there's a number of perspectives I want to share with you, but I want to underscore the fact that they're not going to be clinical. They're not going to be policy oriented. Indeed, they're going to be hum human oriented community oriented, but that's precisely the impact that the Yuba Water Agency has had on our community. As a Yuba County Superintendent of Schools, I've had the fortune and also the, the, the ability to, to look at our county kind of from a balcony, from the big perspective here. And Yuba County, I won't lie to you, ladies and gentlemen, we have a lot of challenges, certainly with the COVID, but economically, we're very diverse uh, culturally, linguistically, economically. And because of that, I mean, that, that is, that, that is that is our diversity and we embrace that. But that also brings very stark issues for us here in the county. Educationally, we have three out of five students are able to complete the A through G requirements for college, okay? We have issues to deal with career technical education. Three out of five families qualify for free lunch program. Uh, so we've got a number of challenges here. The, um, at this point, what we're looking at is, is some very, uh, stark challenges and I'm happy to say I'm, indeed I am it is a it, it is an, it is a it is indeed a pleasure to to note our relationship with the Yuba Water Agency what they've done for our community ladies and gentlemen again I'm speaking to you as a county superintendent but not in a clinical way I'm appealing to you from the corazón from the heart at this point the impact that the Yuba Water Agency with all our stakeholders and we're talking about the Yuba County Office of Education, all our partner school districts, Yuba College, the South Yuba River Citizens League, we've all come together because we all collectively recognize the need that we need to do something. And again, this is where the Yuba Water Agency has stepped up. Indeed, they've created a synergy. And I don't want to overuse that word or, 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 or uh, uh, it's just a word that really fits, ladies and gentlemen. They brought in a capital, a capital of talent from different stakeholders. They have modeled that. Certainly they've modeled it in terms of the, the, uh, the uh, next generation science standards. I myself, I'm a biology chemistry teacher and I really appreciate that the work that the Yuba Water Agency has done certainly under the leadership of, of Willie. The, in terms of the, the uh, standards curriculum, the uh, standards that we've developed here, they're working with the school districts and we're facilitating that process right now. As you know, coming out of COVID, we need this. It's a breath of fresh air in terms of the curriculum and the curriculum involves everything from creating lessons that educate our students about our watershed, atmospheric rivers, the history of hydraulic mining, flooding an area and more. 
Until this program, a next generation science standard curriculum is something that was critically lacking in our schools. And that is not a knock on our schools. The fact is we have a lot of challenges. And right now, I've always said no one is as smart as all of us. And clearly this applies to the Ubug Water Agency, the, the brain power, the intellectual, but also the commitment that they bring. If I sound that I'm, I'm very enthusiastic, but also very passionate, that reflects exactly what the Yuba Water Agency has brought to bear here. That's why my presentation is not a clinical, a policy-oriented one. It is an appeal from my heart. Right now, in terms of what we're doing here, it's, it's specifically, we're talking about only the curriculum standards, but also in terms of health and safety. Working collaboratively with the County Office of Education, they've been able to bring to bear through grants uh, the ability to provide water fountains. Now, you think, well, what's, what's with a water fountain? Well, the fact, given the COVID conditions, given the age of our structures, our facilities, we were able to, with, with the grants from the Yuba Water Agency, to provide uh, water um, fountains for the children, touchless ones. And that's a very, very specific health and safety aspect of what they do, not only educationally, but in terms of the health and welfare of our community. I think perhaps by way of closing, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to run out of minutes here. I do want to stress that I noted earlier that the leadership that the Yuba Water Agency has provided goes beyond its specific mission. Indeed, it's a commitment to the community. By doing it, they have modeled that. I've been in presentations, so many presentations where people see what they're doing. People want to be a part of that. That's the kind of spirit we need here. The Yuba Water Agency has provided that. It's great and it's an honor to be working with them. So specifically here, I want to conclude by, by sharing that at this point, my understanding is that, is that it, it, of this water quality certification is that if it is allowed to stand as is, that it would have a significant impact on the Yuba Water Agency's revenue and limit their ability to fund these critical projects. So therefore, respectfully, I ask that the State Water Board to withdraw the certification issued last year given the harmful and lasting impact it will have for our county and instead work with Yuba Water Agency to resolve our issues. The Yuba Water Agency does not work in a, in a silo, does not work in isolation. It works in collaboration with the other leaders, community leaders, and the community. That, ladies and gentlemen, is, is an unbelievable asset, an unbelievable energy source that we need here in Yuba County. So respectfully, thank you for the privilege of your time. I really appreciate it. And again, I ask the board to consider my, my, uh, my perspective. Thank you so much. Thank you. The next speaker is Brent Tasty, and I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute. All right. There you go. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon. I want to first apologize. I actually had an emergency medical. I had a doctor's appointment I had to get to, so I'm calling from my car, and I apologize for that. Good afternoon, I'm Brent Hasty. I'm a lifelong resident of Yuba County, a member of the Yuba Water Agency Board, past member of the Board of Supervisors, past president of the Association of California Water Agencies. Uh, I'm here today to ask you to please consider withdrawing the water quality certification so we can work together to find a constructive path through these issues. But first, I wanna share a little bit about the value of the Yuba Water Agency to the community that I love. Yuba County has a long and troubled history of flooding. We've struggled with devastating floods since the gold rush when hydraulic mining debris raised our riverbed by about a hundred feet, bringing them higher than the streets of Marysville. I lived through both the 1986 and 97 floods. In 1986, I moved sandbags in my dump trucks and then mucked out my grandparents and great grandmother's home. In 1997, at 810 in the evening, a levee broke on January 2nd. I was in my mid-30s at the time, four children under the age of 10, and I was homeless. I canoed through my house that year. The mission and the responsibility of the Yuba Water Agency are real for me, my family, and all of the communities that are served by the agency. I cannot tell you how proud I am of the work and the people of the Yuba Water, that the Yuba Water is doing in our community. Our communities have waited 50 years to start the full benefits of the Yuba River Project. And finally, the wait is over. We are working to transform our disadvantaged communities and help it thrive. Finally, we have hope. For decades, we've struggled with serious issues that challenge our disadvantaged communities, including a lack of funding to achieve the flood protection necessary for economic development. 
an underfunded school system and a lack of funding for sustaining protection of our drinking water. The greatest compliment an institution can receive is that it's making a difference. We are really starting to hear that a lot at Yuba County, that the Yuba water is making a difference in our community. Just a few of the examples include our work to lead Yuba County to the highest level of flood protection in Northern California. Our funding of critical forest restoration work to prevent the mega fires we're seeing ravage much of California, both to the north and south of us. And the funding and other support from Yuba Water that is benefiting every level of our school system. And I'm most proud of how we're changing the education system in Yuba County. The certificate puts this critical work at risk. The water quality certificate is a threat to the future of Yuba County. It will cost hundreds of millions of dollars to implement and potentially even more than a billion dollars. That will rob the people of Yuba County of water and power revenues that are vital to our mission and to the future of Yuba County. The certification also limits Yuba's water's ability to continue our work to advance statewide priorities, including the Yuba cord water transfers that help sustain the state's economy during droughts, just like the one we're in. The production of carbon-free energy to support the grid during heat emergencies, like much of the ones we've seen this summer, and forest restoration efforts in the headwaters of the Sierras. I want to encourage you to withdraw the certification so we can work collaboratively to resolve the concerns. I don't think there's any doubt you can see through our partnerships that we work collaboratively with many groups, and we know we can work through this. And I want to thank you for your time and consideration of these comments. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker I have is Ronald Stork, but he is not on the platform at this time. So the next one is Mr. David Guy. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Excellent. Thank you for the opportunity this afternoon. Um, late in the day, I know, uh, but I'd just like to offer two uh, thoughts. I'm David Guy with the Northern California Water Association. Um, the first is uh, kind of a focus on process. And obviously, there's been a lot of discussion about kind of the way this process has unfolded and the way that there's a final certification that just kind of showed up uh, without the opportunity for public comment, uh, engagement, or collaboration. And I think that's why we join in uh, encouraging the board to withdraw the 2020 certification. And that in our view would really allow uh, some opportunity to resolve the litigation that is currently underway. It'll allow the further opportunities for some better engagement, much like you're having today across the sphere. And also really just to get very more precise with respect to the issues that are being raised uh, with respect to the certification. And obviously it'd just be a much more transparent and a collaborative process. So in that respect, we, we encourage the withdrawal of the certification. Uh, the second uh, piece um, is really, I think, just what the impact the certification has upon a uh, Yuba Water Agency. And in our view, we think it will actually detract from the uh, agency's ability uh, to do what it does really well. And that is ridge top to river mouth water management. It's multi-benefit water management. It's providing water for the citizens, as you've heard. It's providing water for the farms. It's hydropower. It's all the uh, green energy, the zero carbon uh, hydropower, the forest health, all the things that Yuba does, I think are really exemplary. I think they're really amazing in California. And I think we ought to encourage that, um, not try to uh, stifle that um, in any way. And we think that uh, the uh, removal of the, or the withdrawal of the certification would actually empower Yuba to be even better at what it already does uh, well. Uh, Yuba has a great uh, history of collaboration that collaborates with just about everybody who wants to solve problems surrounding the Yuba River, surrounding the Sacramento Valley. They're a great partner for just about everybody who likes to solve problems. And uh, I think just thinking forward, uh, to me, that has a great feel to work together, to collaborate, much better feel than a certification that uh, kind of appeared out of nowhere. So thanks for the opportunity to comment today and uh, appreciate your opportunity to hopefully make this process better going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And the last speaker I have is Chelsea Haynes. Chelsea. 
Josie, I'm asking you to unmute your mic. There we go. So recognizing I'm holding everyone um, back from the weekend. Um, good afternoon. My name is Chelsea Haynes. I'm the Regulatory Relations Manager with the Association of California Water Agencies. Aqua represents over 460 public water agencies that deliver 90% of the water for residential, commercial, and agricultural purposes in California. And Yuba Water Agency is one of our members that um, when I think of walking the talk of water resilience, portfolio implementation, and multi-benefit projects coordination, we're so proud to have Yuba as one of our member agencies. We appreciate the opportunity to comment um, to the State Water Board today on the water quality certification. Um, and we had submitted comments last December and provided comments earlier this year. Consistent with some of the concerns raised um, most recently by David Guy, Aqua also has procedural current, uh, concerns related to the issuance of the certification. First, that the project didn't have a pending application with the board. Um, second, that the certification was issued as a final document, which didn't allow for opportunity for public comment and engagement or collaboration. Water quality certifications can result in significant cost and operational impacts to the public, uh, to public water agencies. And so in this case, it's our understanding that a draft of the cert certification uh, was not made available for public comment prior to issuing the final. Um, Yuba Water Agency has demonstrated the ability to um, advance forward thinking solutions. And so we have a lot of concern that this could compromise their ability to move forward really beneficial projects. Public water agencies have limited resources and their ability to invest in infrastructure improvements and um, integrated habitat and multi-benefit projects depends on certainty of their long-term operations. Um, we've seen Yuba demonstrate a good faith effort um, historically with the landmark Yuba Accord. And looking forward, Yuba's involved in some really great work that um, will address, help, you know, address wildfire management, uh, climate resilience, flood risk, fish habitat. And so I think it's really important that we make sure that there's not unintended consequences here to other state goals that we recognize as essential as well. So um, we urge Aqua urge the State Water Board to um, withdraw the certification engaged with Yuba Water Agency collaboratively as we advance all of the state priorities. Thank you so much for the opportunity to comment. Um, happy Friday. Thank you, Chelsea. If there are any other speakers that we haven't called on at this time, could you please raise your hand? I see you, Willie. I just wanna make sure we've caught all the people who were designated that they wanted to comment. Okay, Willie. Excellent, Aaron. Thanks uh, for letting me speak here at the end. Um, so as I said in my opening remarks, um, we don't understand the reconsideration process, and it seems as though it's being created as we go along, but we do understand that the reconsideration process exists so that, that the state board members themselves can reconsider the staff certification. And like I said earlier, we've been told we can't talk to the state board members. My question for staff is, how and when will we be able to communicate with the state board members? Thanks, Willie. I appreciate the question. And it, um, I think it's a good sort of next step item to talk about right now. I'm trying to, I don't know if you guys can see me or not, because I can't, okay, yes. Yes, we can. So um, in, in response to your question, Willie, directly, the petition for reconsideration process, you know, does put the board members in an ex parte situation. Um, and so the way that folks can engage is through the public process. So 
the reason we had this workshop today is as an opportunity for all of the parties to be able to talk in an open forum where we could exchange information without having any sort of violation of that ex parte um, communication ban. Um, and uh, I did see that some of our board members have participated in today's workshop. It's been recorded. So those that weren't able to participate today will be able to review the information as well. Um, this ultimately, um, when we get a petition for reconsideration, if it's something that is not mooted um, or dismissed, which I don't believe this one will be, it's something that comes before the board. And so the next steps that we anticipate moving forward at this point is for the board staff to take all of this information into account, um, to talk with board members and to brief board members, and then to put out a draft order um, of where we think um, the, how the petition might, how the certification might be updated in light of the petitions that were received. And then we'll get comments on that draft order uh, we will talk with the board members some more, and then we will bring something before the board for their consideration on adoption. So that's sort of where we're at with next steps and how the petition process, petition for reconsideration process is typically um, handled. If uh, anybody wants, anyone of the state water board uh, staff wants to weigh in or provide any additional feedback on that, I welcome that. Okay, I don't see any hands or anybody coming on. So I just wanna again, thank everybody for their participation today. Um, we recognize the immense amount of effort it took to prepare the presentations and to be here for the full day. And um, I think it was valuable information that was shared today. So I really, I, I do wanna thank you. And with that, I will um, close today's workshop and hope you all have a wonderful weekend and stay safe. Recording stop.